Recording in progress. Okay, you're right. one minute warning. All right. Good morning, everyone. I see we all made it up for the uh, daylight savings time situation. So, okay. Um, I'm going to turn to Executive Director uh, Burden for uh, the announcement this morning. Eric? Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman and Council Members. Uh, just looking at the, uh, the day today and uh, congratulations on making it an hour early. Um, we are uh, turning away on salmon in the background, and uh, we do have it scheduled for into the day today, but in reality, we'll look to sprinkle that in whenever they're ready so that we can uh, try to come back in a timely manner tomorrow to finalize it. Um, I understand hard work is being done. So that's how we'll manage the, the day today uh, and uh, just want to set that expectation. Um, otherwise, um, no other comments for me this morning, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Merrick. And with that, I'm going to hand the gavel off to Vice Chair Hasselberg to start us off on uh, F7. Pete? Thank you, Chair Pettinger. Good morning, all. Uh, I'll immediately look to Todd Phillips to give us the overview on this agenda item. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning, Council, and we do have quite the agenda item for you. This is F7, uh, which is the 2025-26 fisheries analysis update and adopt California quillback harvest specifications and rebuilding parameters. So under this particular item, the council is scheduled to provide guidance regarding the overwinter analyses that the ground fish management team, GMT of course, and council, did, council staff did. Um, the outcomes of the, the guidance today will be incorporated into the analytical document that will be used to support your decision making at April 2024 on your preliminary preferreds for management measures. Additionally, under this item, uh, the council is going to be looking at adopting uh, California quillback uh, rebuilding um, parameters as well as harvest specifications and uh, the council uh, should consider a range of rebuilding parameters to anal analyze. So it helps to consider this particular agenda item as almost two um, separate parts. The first part that we'll talk about will be the fisheries analysis update and that's where the GMT uh, and myself will update the council as to some of the overwinter analyses that regarding allocations and other uh, other such things and specifically what the one thing that the council should be aware of is that the GMT discovered some issues with short spine thorny head management which uh, may compel the council to consider a fishery management plan amendment. Um, the GMT of course is going to be providing a presentation for you to uh, to listen to over all their, their statements. Um, I will be briefing the council on the attachments I won't go too much into that at the moment but I do have a a couple slide presentation. So um, second part of course would be the California quillback or the California stock of quillback rockfish. Um, so under this item of course as I mentioned is that the, the council is scheduled to adopt uh, rebuilding parameters as um, well as uh, harvest specifications. Um, for reference back in November 2023 the GMT did recommend an alternative SPR target a harvest rate of F equals zero and the ABC rule to represent the range or so-called bookends for council consideration um, and they do of course make that same recommendation in their uh, their documents that are in front of the council. So looking to your action um, the first one, of course, is to consider and provide guidance for the range of management measure alternatives and draft analyses as appropriate. Consider a FMP, FMP amendment for short spine thorny head. Um, clarify council intent regarding copper rockfish ACTs and the intent regarding canary rockfish um, alternative harvest control rules. And then four and five specifically deal with quillback, the first one being adopt rebuilding strategy pairs of T target and SPR target harvest rate and preliminary preferred 2025 26 specifications. So this is your OFL ABC AC, excuse me, OFL ABC ACL for quillback. And then um, providing a range or providing, excuse me, providing guidance on management measures under the California quillback rebuilding strategies um, as appropriate. So your action, of course, is to uh, reveal specifically to review analyses and provide guidance, adopt a preliminary preferred rebuilding strategy and harvest specifications for California quillback and refine the range of alternatives as necessary. And that concludes my overview. I'm happy to answer any questions or we can move directly into a presentation. Thank you. Any questions on the overview? And not seeing any, I'll let you launch into the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay, title slide, of course. So, get this. What I'll be speaking about are three overarching um, uh, areas here, and I'll take a break in between each one to uh, have questions if necessary. So the first one would be the organization of the analysis. Um, that'll be describing the, uh, the action alternatives, no action, that sort of thing. And then I'll be looking for guidance on a couple of items. And then I do have notice of one correction um, that the council should be able to be aware of. So the first thing is that in past anal analyses, so this would be the large council analytical document that the council receives, you, the council has generally seen these three buckets of items, the first one being baseline, the second one being no action, and then your action alternatives. So under baseline, baseline is, was largely used for comparison. It was, and well, in this case, it would be 2023 data and mortality, and it was really used to 
show the difference between for stakeholders, for the council to see what was in place currently versus what could be in place in the near future. It was, you know, uh, it was kind of bizarre to have this in the sense that it confused a lot of stakeholders as if this, if this baseline was a, could be selected as a, a choice by the council. And there's also some considerations with NEPA and how we do the documentation for that particular uh, process. No action, of course, was your default harvest control rules. And then the action alternatives look specifically to alternative harvest control rules. So given that this, I guess, template was sort of confusing and the feedback we uh, received from stakeholders sort of lended more towards uh, considering the uh, analyses in a different, little bit of different light, we took a little bit of step back and decided for this, for this particular go around in specs process is that no action is really gonna be considered the 2023 mortality, and it'll show the 2023 and 24 management measures. So no action is largely what was considered baseline. The second one, of course, alternative one is your default harvest control rules, and then alternatives two and three, at least at this point, are your, excuse me, I guess I backed that up. Alternative one is default, alternatives two and three right now are alternative harvest control rules. And now I would note that this particular template allows a little bit more comparison. When we go to do our NEPA document, it puts it more in line with current and past council processes where you see a no action, you see alternatives. Um, so I know that because you don't have the document in front of you, this is a little bit esoteric at the moment. Um, however, we have let in in the document uh, with a very good description of what we did, why we did it, and how we did it. So it should be fairly clear um, when you go to read that particular document. Uh, I'll pause there. Looking around, no questions. And if there are any questions that come up, please do contact me. The second one, second set, of course, is the guidance and clarity. <clears throat> The first one is regarding canary rockfish alternative harvest control rule. So in the course of the winter, um, received a couple of questions um, on exactly what was meant by a particular motion. I believe Ms. Mattis made this motion and it's shown there on the screen, but the key here is um, the way we understood this motion to read is that um, all species for all stocks, default harvest control rules would be examined except for the three shown there. And those three shown there is where we would examine default and the alternative harvest control rule. There was some question about canary um, and whether or not that was part of the, uh, the alternatives in terms of the harvest control rules or if it was specifically um, part of the default portion. And I'll notice there is what um, draws me to the attention that during the analysis, what we consider is that canary um, only default harvest control rules would be to analyze. So I would ask the, to confirm or deny um, this, this aspect. The next one is the California Copper ACT. Um, one thing that wasn't clear, and I guess uh, in my brain dead haste, I didn't ask in November, was whether or not the motion and council, well, excuse me, whether or not this referred directly to a recreational a commercial or a both for the ACT. Um, the motion and council discussion weren't exactly clear, so just some clarity surrounding this particular uh, motion would be, uh, would be great. The next one, we have two ACL corrections, and in general, I, we don't really bring these forward, but because these two stocks are, are known to be important, we wanted to just inform the council because it uh, what you will see in April as opposed to November will have this correction. And the first one being Lincoln South 4010. So in for 25 and 26, the November document did not apply the 4010 rule. And so we have, we went back and in our review over winter and found that this was the case. And this will reduce the um, ACLs by 20 and 22 metric tons respectively for 25 and 26. The next one is Petrali Sol. So for 2026, we need to apply the 25-5 rule, which reduces that particular ACL for 26 by 17 metric tons. And then finally, one thing that um, in, in over the wintertime uh, in discussions with the National Marine Fisheries Service 
is we figured out that the FMP and federal regulations are really not consistent on these two particular stocks, and it has to do with um, the name changes. So in the FMP, we have captured the uh, updated name for Pacific Sand Lance as well as Pacific Spiny Dogfish, but however, in regulation, that isn't really noted. And so to, to really, so, excuse me, to really drive um, home that, that both documents can be consistent for stakeholders, for the public, obviously, um, fishermen, and that sort of thing. And we determined that specs was largely the best uh, vehicle for this particular administrative change. So with your, with the council's permission, I would want to add this um, into the range or into as a new management measure, essentially. And so with that, Mr. Mr. Vice Chair, I'm done with my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Todd. Are there any questions on the presentation? It's perfectly clear. Thank you. <laughs> and with that, uh, there is there are is a host of GMT reports there and. Uh, we will, and also an SSC report, we will first go to Dr. Dan Holland for the SSC report. Uh, Dan, can you hear us? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I'm Dan Holland, Chair of the SSC, and I'd like to read Agenda Item F7A, Supplemental SSC Report 1, March 2024, SSC Committee Report on the 2025-26 Fisheries Analysis, Update and Adopt California Quebec Rockfish Harvest Specifications and Rebuilding Parameters. Under agenda, agenda item F2, the SSC continues to recommend use of the 2021 stock assessment and the adoption of the 2023 rebuilding analysis for California quillback rockfish. Under this agenda item, under this agenda item, the SSC recommends 1.52 metric tons for the 2025 OFL. The 2026 OFL will depend on the rebuilding strategy adopted by the council. The SSC notes that in agenda item E7A, GMT report one, November 2023, the OFL for 2026 under the ABC control rule should be 1.77 metric tons rather than 1.81 metric tons. The SSC suggests that the council request a catch only projection for Washington Cabazon to be reviewed at the April council meeting. This is needed due to the non equilibrium data poor assessment used for this stock in 2019 and the need to account for actual removals to better define appropriate management for this stock in 2025 and beyond. That concludes the SSC report. And I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Questions for Dr. Holland on the SSC report. No questions. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Next, we'll move to our slate of uh, groundfish management team reports. And Mr. James Phillips is here to go over all of those reports, I believe, in a presentation. Good morning, James. And uh, looks like you've brought some backup. Um, <laughs> Through the vice chair, thank you. Just to clarify, we will just go through the presentation to cover all of the reports, and it will actually be the whole squad of GMT giving this presentation. We'll do a couple handoffs to cover various slides throughout. All right, perfect. Good morning, everybody. Uh, for the record, my name is James Phillips, the GMT. Um, we're here today to update you on our progress for 2025 harvest specifications and management measures. If I can get the next slide, please. So this is the rough overview of what we're going to, going to be covering, uh, specifically touching on coolback rockfish, at sea set asides, petroli sole, canary rockfish, widow rockfish. Uh, as Todd alluded to, things we discovered for short spine thorny head. Uh, rockfish species sorting requirements, descending device mortality rates, stable fish recreational discard, and continuous transit requirements. And as Whitney alluded to, we're going to give a couple uh, slides. We'll have an opportunity for you guys to ask any questions that we have about those specific things. And then we'll rotate out for another set of GMT members who will present more slides, give you another opportunity to answer any questions between that, kind of help things move more efficiently. It's a little bit of a big presentation, so chunking it up. If I can get the next slide, please. 
so the first thing we're going to talk about is harvest specifications, specifically on quillback rockfish. Next slide, please. So the GMT continues to recommend our same range of options identified in November. Uh, this report here, which is the ABC rule with a T target of 2060 and also an F equals zero of a T target of 2045. So the GMT recommends that the ABC rule as the preliminary preferred option for the rebuilding strategy. This represents the strategy that is closest to the maximum time to rebuild, but does not result in an ACL that exceeds the OFL limit. The GMT seeks guidance from the council if other rebuilding strategies should be analyzed. And as of note, um, part of this presentation is asking for council guidance. So it is the GMT's understanding that Quillback Rockfish Rebuilding Plan will take precedent over all other management measures that we discussed today. And we would ask for uh, you take that into consideration when prioritizing our other work. Next slide, please. Uh, through the vice chair, this is I'm Whitney Roberts, also with the Groundfish Management Team, of course. Um, so I'll do several of the routine management measure slides that we have, um, starting with the at sea set asides. Uh, that's just an update, um, uh, moving into petroli sole allocations, and then we'll pause for questions. Um, and we also will cover routine management measures as far as canary rockfish allocations and widow rockfish allocations. Those uh, analytical reports have been in the briefing book uh, for quite some time. And then we'll also cover um, sablefish recreational set aside south of 36 north latitude. Next slide, slide please. As far as at sea set asides, the council adopted this range in front of you, except for the yellow highlights in November. Um, the only changes the GMT identified the need to consider over during our overwinter analysis um, was potentially a lower widow rockfish set aside of 300 metric tons and a higher yellowtail rockfish north set aside of 450 metric tons. And again, that's based on our overwinter analysis where we identified um, some constraints in the IFQ fishery and substantial reductions and high value species allocations um, where the IFQ fishery could benefit from some additional widow rockfish. And then for yellowtail rockfish, um, we projected high catch in the at sea fishery and uh, note some high variability in those catches. Uh, so out of an abundance of, a ca of caution, we added the 450 metric ton option three for yellowtail north. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as you might recall in November, the council tasked us with uh, looking at petroli sole trawl non trawl allocations and whether adjustments might be needed. In November, the GMT signaled to the council the potential that the 2023 non trawl allocation may have been exceeded by some substantial amount. Um, we have uh, more updated estimates of mortality in 2023 as of this meeting that estimate 30.2 metric tons of the non trawl allocation were taken, um, which is approximately right at that non trawl allocation amount of 30 metric tons. Um, and we do note in our report that the major driver of that um, <clears throat> mortality in 2023 is coming from primarily the California recreational fishery, which is uh, unknown as to whether that amount of uh, increase in 2023 will continue in the next biennium. There's several management changes off of California that make things a little unclear and difficult to predict as far as petroli sole mortality. <laughs> Um, we also note that currently only the commercial non trawl sector has management measures that could be used in season. None of the state recreational fisheries do for petroli sole. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and I, I kind of alluded to this, but there are some proposed uh, 2024 in-season changes for California Recreational that will uh, potentially reduce petroli sole mortality. So it, it, it could possibly go in either direction, increases or decreases in the next biennium. It's difficult for us to predict at this time as a management team. Um, and then lastly, I'll note, of course, that petroli sole is an important target species in the trawl IFQ fishery, and they are going to uh, see substantial reductions in the allocation in 2025-26. Um, next slide, please. So with all of that in mind, uh, we didn't see the need to um, look at allocation changes for 2025-26 for petroli sole, uh, but we do again, point out that there are not management measures for the recreational fisheries in the three states. And so looking for council guidance on um, how the council wants us to proceed with analyzing petroli sold. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this is a point where we'll stop and ask for any questions on anything, any of the things we've covered so far. Um, questions can go to James or I, and we also have um, GMT backup behind us as well, too, that we may uh, be able to tap into if that's necessary. Um, again, the things we've covered so far for questions are Quillback Rockfish Harvest Specifications, at sea set aside range, the two options we added, and then Petrolli Sol, Trawl non trawl allocations, and uh, state recreational management measures. Thank you. I'll look around and see if there are any questions on this so far. Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair, and thank you, Whitney. Um, my question is about Petrolli Sol and um, the bullet that said there's only. Um, management measures for the commercial sector for petroli that could be adjusted. And I was thinking about this relative to Washington because uh, petroli is included in our, our aggregate bottom fish limit. Um, does that mean that I, but we haven't done a bag limit analysis for petroli. So that's the kind of the trigger of why we couldn't do an adjustment in season unless we did that bag limit analysis. Through the vice chair, thank you, Ms. Hall, for the question. Absolutely, that's correct. That is our understanding that um, because it simply has not been analyzed in a um, specifications package that uh, we could not use it in season unless that was done so. Okay, thank you. Further questions? Chair Pettinger. Thank you, Vice Chair Asmer. Um, Whitney, on the uh, Petroli Soul, uh, there's the tribal allocation of Petroli Soul was the same in 25, 26, as it was right now. Um, and I just, uh, as you were aware that I've talked to Will Jasper about looking at that because we've had a significant reduction in that quota, but the, the tribal allocation has changed. So I've talked to Will and um, we're gonna look at that and get some information for next meeting. I don't know if you're, the GMT is aware of that or not. Through the vice chair, thank you for the question. Um, we actually are, are not, I am not aware of it. I don't know if other members of the GMT are aware of it, but we certainly haven't discussed it as a team. Um, I haven't talked to Will myself about it, but um, that is really helpful to know. Thank you. Thank you. And further questions so far? Not seeing any, so. Thank you. We'll have a change of seats and move on to the next portion. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, council members. My name is Christian Heath. I'm also with the GMT. Uh, we'll start with uh, canary allocations. Uh, this is uh, following the 2023 stock assessments. There will be large reductions in canary rockfish uh, catch limits across all the sectors uh, for the next biennium. Uh, the scheme on the right shows uh, the status quo allocation of this breakdown. Uh, next slide, please. Now circled here, uh, we have uh, our different um, breakdowns and decision points. Uh, these are all different allocation, uh, either breakdowns for trawl, non-trawl or uh, set-asides. Um, and then we're also looking at commercial versus, and, uh, versus uh, the recreational side for the non-trawl. Next slide, please. And on this one we have, um, so for the trawl versus non-trawl option one is the status quo. And is that 72.3% for the trawl, 27.7% for the non-trawl. Um, and then option two is a 5% reduction for the trawl at 67.3% uh, trawl and 32.7% non-trawl. And then option three is a 12.5% decrease from the status quo, which is 59.8% uh, trawl and 40.2% non-trawl. Um, and below that, uh, the next section is the set aside. This is also within the trawl sector. Um, and the option one, which is status quo, is 36 metric tons of canary set aside. Options two and options three are both reduction down to 30 metric tons or, or pot potentially 20 metric tons. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is within the, um, the non trawl sector. So this is from the uh, the uh, commercial non-trawl to the recreational non-trawl sharing agreement. Uh, option one is status quo, and this is 36% commercial and 64% uh, uh, recreational. Um, and then option two re reduces the commercial non-trawl section to 31% and uh, increases the recreational sector to 69%. Next slide, please. 
And then finally, for the recreational um, sections, uh, the status quo right now, uh, this is a holistic, so to make it 100%, it's not quite the same percentage that you guys might be familiar with before. This is just to make the Washington, Oregon, California equal a sum of 100%. So it's 19.2% Washington currently with 28.9 Oregon and 51.9 for California. That is option one, which is status quo. And then option two um, increases both Washington and Oregon recreational a little bit and decreases the California recreational fishery down to 45.2%. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> Uh, this is uh, the impacts that we had to the trawl uh, fishery. Uh, so the um, bottom trawl is in blue on the bottom, and then the shoreside whiting is in red, and the, you have the midwater rockfish, which is in yellow above. Um, so you can see kind of the, the history of when fishing began, uh, when we opened up um, different fishing sectors for Canary and how they ramped up and how they have exceeded what we are looking at for both option one, which is the status quo, as well as um, both the options two and three, which are the lower lines, the darker blue and the black line. And then the next slide, please. This is for the non trawl um, impacts. Um, and again, uh, for status for option <coughs> One status quo that is the, the lower line. So this one goes in reverse. So the option status quo is the low line and then increases for options two and options three um, based on the uh, trawl, non trawl sharing agreement um, options. Um, and I will highlight here that it looks like attainment is a little low. Um, there hasn't been as much effort in the in commercial uh, non trawl area, but with the changes in Quebec, we anticipate a little bit more effort shifting over into that. Um, fishery, uh, whereas uh, the recreational uh, state fisheries have all gotten very close to their attainment level in the last couple of years. And next slide, please. Uh, with the low limits in the upcoming biennium, uh, both trawl and non-trawl sectors are likely to see serious impacts. Uh, no option can re fully re relieve uh, these impacts for any of the other sectors. Um, so we're asking the council if is this range sufficient? Uh, does the council want the GMT to continue analyzing canary rockfish allocations or adjustments? Um, it's kind of a take it as you will. Um, none of the different allocation options are tied to another one. You could take one of them, you could take three of them. That is open to further discussion on the floor. And next slide. Through the vice chair, thank you. Good morning, council members. My name is Thompson Benez. I'll be going over widow rockfish allocation and sable fish recreational uh, set aside. Starting with the widow, widow rockfish allocation range, in 2025-2026, trawl allocations will be lower than recent mortality in the trawl sector. Given the high likelihood of 90% attainment of the non, excuse me, of the trawl allocation, the GMT analyzed three options to transfer some non-trawl allocation to trawl. However, it should be noted that there's uncertainty in the 2025-2026 non-trawl mortality given recent management changes that concentrate effort and increase fishing area to the non-trawl midwater species like widow rockfish. <clears throat> the GMT analyzed the following options. Option one or status quo, excuse me, next slide, please. Oh, uh, back one slide, there we are. <clears throat> The GMT analyzed the following options, status option one or status quo, 400 metric tons allocated to non-trawl, the remainder to trawl, option two, 300 metric tons allocated to non-trawl, the remainder to trawl, option three, 200 metric tons allocated to non-trawl, the remainder to trawl. Um, the GMT is asking if this range is sufficient. Again, it should be noted that since the November council meeting, the GMT added the middle option of 300 metric tons as a way to transfer some allocation from the non-trawl to the trawl while leaving room for potential growth in the non-trawl, giving recent changes that concentrate effort and increase fishing area to non-trawl midwater species. Sablefish, sablefish recreational set aside south of 36 north latitude. This is just an update. Uh, the 10 metric ton sable fish recreational set aside proposed in November was placed in the non trawl sector analysis because it will come out of the non trawl allocation south 36 north latitude. The recreational set aside poses a very low risk to exceeding the harvest limits as the non trawl has averaged 30% of their allocation since 2015 south of 36 north latitude. The non trawl commercial allocation would decrease from 4,541 metric tons to 4,531 metric tons. 
with that, we'll take questions on what we've covered. Excuse me, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, questions on what's been covered so far. Uh, we'll take questions on canary rockfish allocation range, widow rockfish allocation range, or sablefish recreational set aside south of 36 north latitude. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Heath, Mr. Benez on this section of the analysis presentation. I look very carefully, I don't see any, so thank you. <clears throat> Morning council members, my name is Lynn Massey. I'm the National Marine Fisheries Service representative on the GMT. Uh, Katie and I will go over the new management measures update for specs, that's gonna include a uh, new management measure on short spine thorny head, rockfish species sorting requirements, discard mortality rates, and continuous transit re requirements for the California recreational fisheries. Next slide, please. Um, so first, we're going to talk to you about a new management measure that the GMT has been talking about for short spine thorny head. Um, we're bringing this to you now because uh, it's a March specs update agenda item, so we figured it was a good time to update you. Uh, before April when you are taking final action on part of the specifications action, including short spine thorny head specifications. Um, so over winter, when we were working on our analysis, uh, we realized that the restrictive ACLs that we anticipate as a result of the 2023 stock assessment for short spine are going to translate into very low trip limits for the limited entry fixed gear north of 3427. Um, Specifically, we think the best case scenario is going to be 350 pounds per two months, and that's reduced from what they were in 2024, which was 2,500 pounds for two months. Also, a reduction in the open access trip limits to 40 pounds per two months from down from 50 pounds per two months. Next slide, please. Uh, so this trip limit is so low uh, that we think that a targeted fishery can't be prosecuted in the north anymore, and that not only has negative implications for a short spine thorny head fishery, but it will also, uh, we anticipate that it will impact the sable fish fishery as well. Uh, the GMT also identified expected constraints in the trawl fishery north of 3427, uh, resulting from IFQ allocation reductions. Next slide, please. Uh, so the GMT scoped a couple of different options that the council could consider. Um, we also did loop in our industry partners early because this is uh, confronting an allocation change, and we wanted them to be well aware of what we were thinking about. Uh, so we've come up with three options for you to consider. Uh, pathway one is simply revising the trawl non-trawl allocations in the area north of 3427, and I do have a flow chart on the next slide that will show this visually a little bit better. Um, you could also consider revising the trawl non-trawl allocations in the south as well. Pathway two is removing that management line at 3427 and recombining the respective sector allocation. So what that means is you would essentially sum the non-trawl allocations from north and south into one pot of fish to operate from and do the same for trawl. That would allow you to more fluidly use those fish and we could solve our trip limit problem. Uh, pathway three is, you know, don't do anything in specs. Um, and consider this outside the specifications process, but the GMT notes that we would not be able to help in any way for 2025 if you select that option. Next slide, please. Um, so this is, uh, this is a diagram of how short spine thorny head management is set up currently in the FMP. As a reminder, it's an amend, you know, the allocation structure was implemented through Amendment 21 to the FMP. So it's a fixed allocation structure. It's not changed every two years or not up for changing every two years like other species are in the regulations. Um, short spine thorny head has a coastwide OFL, a coastwide ABC. And then from there, we have two area specific ACLs that are north and south of 3427. Um, from there, you have uh, separate off the top deductions to account for tribal set asides, incidental open access, et cetera, which results in two different harvest guidelines, north and south of the line. And then your allocations for trawl and non-trawl flow from that harvest guideline. So in the north, the trawl gets 95%, non-trawl gets 5%. In the south, trawl gets a fixed 50 metric tons, non-trawl gets the remainder yield. Um, again, our problem that we identified over winter is in the north, a lot of constraints in the north, short spine is recently and historically underattained in the south. Next slide, please. Uh, 
I'm going to pass it over to Katie. All right, good morning. Um, so pathway two uh, is, as Lynn mentioned, uh, it's basically the recombination. And so you have a coastwide ACL um, that kind of flows the fish. Um, so again, you have your overfishing limit, your acceptable biological catch, your annual catch limit. Then you have one fishery harvest guideline, at which point you would have a trawl allocation and a non-trawl allocation for the whole coast. Um, Next slide, please. So this would result in a 64% trawl and 36% non-trawl using the 2024 base year for the trawl recombination. The trawl recombination is a process that is outlined in the regulations. Um, so therefore we just kind of did the same thing for the non-trawl to get that 36%. Um, there are also two options for consideration under this pathway uh, for adjusting the management structure. So option one would be once you got that uh, coastwide ACL, you would set um, coastwide trip limits and option two would be to set sub area trip limits. Um, both pathways one and two would require an FMP amendment. Next slide, please. Nope. It's on lingering. All right, so now uh, we're going to talk about rockfish species sorting requirements. Um, so overwinter analysis and GMT discussion determined that this issue is complex and evaluation of impacts would benefit from additional time for state sampling programs and commercial buyer review. Uh, the harvest specifications process may not provide sufficient time to do this. Uh, preliminary findings and potential scoping will be submitted to the April advanced briefing book. Uh, the GMTC's merit in pursuing this action through a process outside of the biennial management measures process. So our question to you is, does the council want to the, the GMT to continue to analyze this new management measure for 2025-26, or would the council prefer to address this through an alternative pathway? and any guidance that you can provide us. Next slide, please. Uh, discard mortality rates. Uh, there are technical corrections to the 2018, 2020, and 2022 safe for canary rockfish, yellow eye rockfish, and cow cod. When using descending devices, uh, discard mortality rates are needed. Um, so the correction, the correct, excuse me, the correct council approved rates are found in agenda item D, 3B, Supplemental GMT Report 2 from March 2020, 2014, excuse me, on page 278. Um, so the GMT requests those corrections uh, be made by council staff. This is more of an update to you that those things will be updated. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this would be a new management measure. Uh, so over the course of our winter analysis, uh, we realized that stable fish discard mortality rates for the recreational fisheries are non-existent. Uh, so a new management to incorporate either the commercial hook in line uh, discard mortality rate of 20% or 7% discard mortality rate for recreational FMP species that lack a swim bladder for recreational fisheries when releasing stable fish at sea. Uh, currently, species that are in the recreational fishery uh, with a 7% DMR include lingcod, flatfish, cabazon, and greenling. So our question to the council is, does the council want the GMT to analyze a discard mortality rate for the recreational stable fish? Next slide, please. Okay, back to Lynn Massey. I'm gonna finish us off here. Um, so in September, 2023, the gap came to the GMT uh, with a request to actually solve something in season. We realized that when we implemented the 50 fathom offshore fishery, and as a reminder, that's a management measure that we use to have recreational fishermen in California fish shoreward of 50 fathoms. The purpose of that is to get them offshore and away from where Quebec rockfish are in shallower waters. Uh, an unforeseen issue that we found with that is because of how the regulations were written for continuous transit, uh, that disrupted their operations and that, you know, the regulations say, you know, you can go fish for rockfish shoreward of 50, but once you're, I'm sorry, seaward of 50, but once you're on your way back to port shoreward of 50, you have to be in continuous transit. Um, and so that really disrupts their operations and that they cannot stop and fish for non-ground fish species or anchor overnight. 
And that's a very common thing for recreational charter vessels to do. They stop on the way back, use traps for lobster, hoop nets for bait. Um, and so that would force them to cancel and really change their business portfolio if they can't offer multi-day ground fish trips or uh, ground fish, non-ground fish combination trips. So the GAP actually asked us to solve this in season. Uh, we could not do that because that doesn't fall within the scope of what the regulations allow us to do in season. Uh, so they added it to as a new management measure request to the specs package. Um, however, as you all know, that doesn't kick in until 2025. So we've been looking, you know, I've been looking on the federal side for ways to solve it for 2024. California solved it right away. They pushed through some emergency measures that took place in October 20, 2023 to allow that in state waters. Uh, however, the issue still remains in federal regulations. So we've been working to find a solve for 2024, and we did. Um, we do expect that by April 1, which is your the first rec opener for a portion of California, that we'll have emergency measures in place to allow this for the 2024 se season. However, those emergency measures are temporary. Uh, and so this is just to simply update you on this and let you know that NIMS did this um, and, and that the GMT will still continue to keep the new management measure request in our analysis and pushing forward for the specs package to solve it for 2025 and beyond. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, I, I said all, all my slides in one go. Uh, next slide. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so that uh, wraps up uh, the new management measures. So as a recap, Katie and I went over a potential new management measure for short spine thorny head, and we're looking for your guidance on whether or not you have a preference if we analyze one pathway, two pathways, all pathways. Um, uh, we'd also like your guidance on whether further analysis or potential action is needed on rockfish species sorting requirements or if you'd like that considered outside specs. Uh, more of an update on descending uh, device mortality rates in the safe, potential new management measure for sable fish recreational discard mortality rates, and the update that I gave you on NIMS's emergency rule for continuous transit requirements. So we'll take any questions on those things right now. All right, there's a list of questions. Anybody have a question for either Ms. Massey, Ms. Pearson on this part of the analysis? Doesn't look like there's any questions. Thank you, Lynn and Katie. Oh, sorry. There was a question, I think, Phil Anderson. Thank uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. Thanks for that presentation. I'm a little slow this morning. Um, on the point about the descending device mortality rates, um, what I, what are are there have there been some uh, new analysis that have led to updates or changes in the mortality rates? Through the vice chair, uh, Mr. Anderson, um, are you talking about the first, the update? The, the third bullet there. Yes. Yeah. Um, so no, what, ha what has happened is that the correct um, discard mortality rates have been being applied by the states, but the, there's a mismatch uh, in the actual documents. Yeah, so this is really just a, what we've been calling kind of like a technical correction. Gotcha. All right, thank you. All right, let me look around. Lynn Mattis. Thank you, Vice Chair. I wasn't sure they were completely done, but I just want to thank and acknowledge all the work that the GMT has done to put this presentation together. You've done a great job of uh, concisely describing a couple hundred pages of work um, in a format that is, I think, easily digestible for the council members. And I know it's a lot of work. Um, as well as all the work you all have done over the winter on specs. So just wanted to publicly acknowledge that and thank you all for the work you've done. Didn't actually have a question. Thank you. Look around here. I'm not seeing any more questions. So is that the entirety of your presentation? All right. Well, with that, let me just make sure. I'm not seeing any more hands, so. Thank you all for that presentation. Mr. Rice.
Phil Anderson. Uh, I, I think it's worthwhile uh, repeating uh, Lynn's compliments to the GMT for that, uh, putting the information together in this format and, and parceling out the pieces and summarizing what the questions are in this manner just is very, very helpful, at least to me, and my compliments to them. All right. Thank you. I think that's shared around the table here. Um, next, we have a ground fish advisory subpanel report. Gary Richter. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chairman, Council Members. I'll be reading from agenda item F7A, Supplemental Gap Report 1, uh, ground fish advisory subpanel report on 2025 26 fisheries analysis update and adopt California Colback rockfish harvest specifications and rebuilding parameters. And at the suggestion of uh, Director Burden, I'm just going to go through this wonderful table one that was crafted by Sarah Niani and, uh, you know, be available to field questions at the end. So starting off with uh, California quillback harvest specifications and management measures. Gap recommendation is adopt a rebuilding strategy using the ABC rule for quillback rockfish off California with the T target of 2060 with the corresponding PPA harvest specs of P star 0.45 and 2025 ACL of 1.3 metric tons and for 2026 an ACL of 1.5 metric tons. For clarification on copper rockfish, if an ACT is selected by the council for copper rockfish south of Point Conception, which is uh, 3427 North Latitude proper, do not apply a trigger for automatic action, but notify the council when approaching the attainment. For widow rockfish allocation, include all widow rockfish trawl, non-trawl allocation options for analysis, which would be the following of option one, status quo, a fixed 400 metric ton of the fishery harvest guideline is allocated to the non-trawl sector and the remainder is allocated to trawl. Or option two, fixed 300 metric ton of the fishery harvest guideline is allocated to non-trawl sector and the remainder is allocated to trawl. And the last option three, a fixed 200 metric ton of the fishery harvest guideline is allocated to the non-trawl sector and the remainder is allocated to trawl. For canary rockfish allocation, include the following canary rockfish allocation options for analysis for trawl and non-trawl allocations. Option one, which is status quo, and that's 72.3 to trawls, 27.7 to non-trawl. At sea set asides, option one, status quo, 36 metric tons, or option two is 30 metric tons, and option three is 20 metric tons. For the commercial non-trawl and recreational non-trawl sharing arrangement, option one, which is status quo, commercial non-trawl sector receives 36% of the non-trawl allocation. And state-specific recreational fish, uh, share, recreational shares, excuse me, option one is status quo. Shares are based on the status quo proportions of the collective recreational share. For short spine thorny head management measures, include the following short spine thorny head management measure pathway for analysis. And we decided on pathway two, which would be the removal of the management line at 3427 North Latitude. Option two with uh, gap modifications, remove the management line at 3427 North Latitude and set a coastwide ACL, set trawl non-trawl allocations for 2025 at 64% trawl, 36% non-trawl, using the Amendment 20 component rule for area combinations, uh, which requires the 2024 value. For 2026, update the trawl non-trawl allocations to 71% trawl, 29% non-trawl, in order to return trawl to the 2025 value. And then lastly, establish a non-trawl ACT and or trip limits to protect the non-trawl fishermen south of 3427 North Latitude Conception proper. Petroli Sol, maintain the status quo trawl and non-trawl allocations. Uh, long leader gear, include for analysis using long leader gear for the California Recreational Fishery. And then lastly, continuous transit, 
include for analysis, allowing California recreational vessels to stop and or anchor shoreward of the 50 fathom line when the offshore fishery is in place with the requirement that no hook and line gear is in the water. And, you know, if folks have questions, there's a lot of text here in the next several pages. Um, if that didn't answer your questions, I'm available. And then I've got a couple of friends to phone if I can't answer them. Thank you, Gary. Thanks for the summary. And that uh, looks like Bob Dooley has a question. Not necessarily a question, but a comment. Gary, thanks a lot for the report. I'm really happy that the gap has listened to the council and particularly some of the comments I've made in the past about coming forward with a, a report that shows all of the recommendations in one place and the, and the verbiage in the, in the explanations later. Sure makes it a lot easier. I know it's a lot more work for you, but it, it really clarifies things and makes it easier to understand. I guess the only the only um, suggestion I'd make is if you could uh, link the items so that you could click on it and go right to the ver to the explanation. That'd be kind of nice too. But it's perfect. It's pretty good the way it is. So thank you so much for your work, Mr. Rice Chair. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Sir, just does a wonderful job on this stuff, and I guarantee I can't do that thing you just said to do to click on. But Sarah can do it. Thank you. Keely Kent. Thank you. Um, also met a question and I'll keep it short. Um, I did just want to recognize um, I had the opportunity to be in the room with the gap through a lot of this discussion. There's a lot of always is a lot of challenging things going on in specs. Um, but I thought the gap discussion was incredibly thoughtful, in particular, the focus on the short spine thorny head issue. The GMT brought that issue to you early and you had a really good conversation about it. And it was really um, helpful to hear those discussions around the table. And from my perspective, that that really helps the council in the work that you've done to come forward with a consensus. I know it was hard um, and that it's not necessarily everyone's favorite um, solution, but I think, you know, having those discussions early and then being able to come to the council with that information distilled down and a path forward is really helpful. So thanks to all the GAP members that spent that time having that conversation. Mr. Vice Chair Keeley, yeah, thanks a lot. We were able to get some of the boys in here that, you know, fish in the South, and that was key, at least for me. It was key for me, and I think they went away. I won't say happy, but, you know, they understood. Um, once Katie put that stuff on the screen, the guys were there to observe it, and, you know, if they had any questions, they were available for questions. I think we got a decent result out of it, so. Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Gary, for the report. And um, you got ahead of me just a tiny bit there, Keeling, that I was going to say thank you very much for the additional conversation and time spent on short spine. I think that um, looking at what is under this pathway to, uh, it's kind of seems like it's a, a meld of what was provided in GMT reports. And so I appreciate all the critical thinking and compromises that were made to get here. I think it helps pave the way for April and, and gets us set up for a very good place. So much appreciate that. Um, I just had a question relative to the short time because there was mentions about using the amendment 20 component rule and whatnot. Was there any strong feelings about FNP amendments for short spine to make that um, a not amendment 20 or, or was that part of the discussion at all? I just, because it wasn't mentioned, I want to make sure that was okay. <laughs> so Mr. Vice Chair, Caroline, could you repeat the question for my friend? <laughs> No problem. Thanks. Um, I just, it was just a question because in the GMT report, there was, um, they were requesting some guidance on whether or not we wanted to amend FMP for short spine to make it more of a biennial um, um, allocation. So I just, it wasn't mentioned in the gap report. I just wanted to get the feel for whether or not there was any concern about that in terms of workload or considerations for any of this. Thank you. Um, yes, there were considerations on workload. And I think the gap tried to pare down some of the other options analyzed in the specs process in order to allow for this. Um, basically, just to summarize the way we were looking at it for short spine is if you leave everything status quo, there's a fishery in the north 
that will likely cease to exist under the current trip limits. And so we looked at every option we could because the ACL is split north south and that table that the GMT provided on the allocations was really helpful for us in our discussion um, that essentially everyone's going to take a huge cut under short spine and um, and and then this fishery in the north would kind of cease to exist. So we we really felt like something needs to be done here. Um, and under um, pathway one, essentially what we talked about is that everyone would take a cut and then there would be an additional cut from trawl to non-trawl in the north only to accommodate that fishery that we were trying to protect. And then if you do pathway two, you would essentially um, remove the line and then there would be more available for that fishery to occur, but it causes some other issues with the Southern fishermen needing to be protected there. So I don't know if I'm exactly answering your question, but um, we did think through all of the options and try to remove as much workload as we could from this package, but it was really difficult given the complexity of the items that the GMT flagged for us. And I'm glad they caught this one very early. Thank you. Yes, you did. You did address the, the comfort level and address the workload and the consideration of the importance to this particular species. So thank you very much. All right. Look around for any other questions. Don't see any. Thanks to both of you for the report. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. That concludes our management team advisory body reports, takes us to public comment. We do have some signups. It's on the screen before us here. We will start with Dave Kashida, followed by Merritt McRae. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, Vice Chair Hasmer, council members and staff. Thanks for having me. My name is Dave Kishida. I'm a recreational angler and the staff and board member of Coastside Fishing Club, which is a group of recreation angles from Central and Northern California based in Half Moon Bay. I'm giving public comment on, for California on F7A Supplemental GMT Report 2, Sections 1.3.4 and 1.3.5, and F.7A Supplemental Gap Report 1 regarding the Canary Rockfish allocation of state-specific recreational shares and the commercial non-trawl and recreational non-trawl sharing arrangement. <clears throat> in the GMT report, there are two options for one state-specific recreational shares, that's 1.3.5, and commercial non-trawl and recreational non-trawl sharing arrangement, 1.3.4 for canary rockfish. The first option for state-specific recreational, recreational shares is for status quo, while the second one asks for California to share some of their allocation with Washington, Oregon. The first option for the non-trawl allocations is for status quo with the commercial non-trawl sector, receiving 36% of the non-trawl allocation, while the section op second option is for the commercial non-trawl sector receiving 31% of the non-trawl allocation and the additional 5% being redistributed to the state recreational sector. After polling the 2,000 plus recreational members of Coastside Fishing Club, other recreational anglers, and CPFE operators in California, the consensus has been 100% for option one status quo for the state specific recreational sharing. And there was full support for option one for the trawl non trawl allocations. And that's from limited outreach from me to the recreational feet, fleet because of time restraints. So I didn't do a poll. I used the old fashioned way and used the phone to ask numerous stakeholders, commercial and recreational. The gap report supports option one with no other options available for both of these. There could be non-trial allocation reductions for commercial and recreational sectors coastwide, and that's from agenda item F7A supplemental GMT report to table one, such that every state will be affected with reduced allocation. So further reducing any allocation is not desired by stakeholders. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Kishida on his testimony. Don't see any. Thank you, Dave. Great, thank you. Next, we'll have Merritt McRae. Merritt will be followed by Chris Howard. Good morning, Merritt. Good morning, Vice Chair, um, Council. I'm Merritt McRae speaking for the Sport Fishing Association of California. Uh, current quillback rockfish management is costing fishing fleets, communities, and the public's access to the entire nearshore rockfish complex. 
Not only does it come at an extreme cost, but once at target, B40, the management measures that will be required to maintain that population at target will cost more in lost access to the nearshore fishery than it returns. Those fishing restrictions will cost greater than 100 tons of foregone productivity of the co-occurring species in order to maintain, to maintain less than eight tons of quillback harvest annually. Turning to the rebuilding analysis under agenda item F2, attachment one, as you look across table three among the various columns, note the level at which the probability of exceeding, of rebuilding exceeds 0.50 or 50%. It is represented by all those values clustered across the lower right third of that table. Then turn to table four, just below it, which has the same vertical column of years on the left and top row of SPR values, et cetera. Here, the table values represent the expected harvestable tons of quillback rockfish per year. Especially note the very bottom row, where in every instance, the values to the right of the SPR, the 50% column, or SPR uh, 0.50 column, represents the available harvest in tons from a fully rebuilt stock. None of those values are greater than seven metric tons per year. That is the approximate optimum yield return for having suffered through at least two decades to more than four decades of rebuilding. Each year of rebuilding represents over 100 tons of foregone landings of nearshore rockfish of other co-occurring species. Notably, Northern California is at the very southern extreme of quillback rockfish's expansive range, one which extends to the Aleutian Islands. The harvest of California quillback rockfish in 2022 was 9.2 metric tons, 2.9 metric tons north of 4011 north latitude, and 6.3 metric tons south. This catch occurred with the recreational anglers restricted from fishing near shore rockfish all but about five and, five and a half months of the year where a quillback occur. Commercial fishers were similarly restricted with two month maximums of just 75 pounds. In California, the management measures that would be required to simply hold quillback rockfish at B40 target would continue to cause a much reduced harvest of the nearshore rockfish complex as a whole on a continuing basis. This result is completely contrary to the optimum yield objective stated in National Standard 1 of the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. It does not comport with National Standard 8 communities either. This dynamic, the policies and guidance that have gotten us here must be fixed. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. McRae on his testimony. No questions. Thank you, Merritt. Thank you. Next, we have Chris Howard. Chris will be followed by Steve Huber. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. I think, uh, like Mr. Anderson, I'm a little slow this morning, too. I don't know what it is about these time changes, but they always catch you off guard. But I couldn't agree more with uh, Ms. Kent's conversation this morning about challenges. We all face challenges in whatever we do in our daily lives. But you guys are especially challenged by the issues brought forward today by the quillback. And that is what has brought me before this commission for the last seven months. It's, it's a challenge that we all need to find a way and a path forward. And we've heard a lot of discussion around economics this week. We've heard a lot of discussion around the piece that Mr. Merrick just brought up in respect to ensuring that those economics are sustained within these small rural communities, whether it's the ground fish we're talking about today or salmon. Um, we as elected leaders, we as appointees need to find the proper path forward. And for the quillback, I came here because there was an issue with a lack of data. And we all heard that that lack of data was generally created because the traditional methods for collecting that data weren't available within our areas of Northern California. And that's just absolutely 100% unacceptable that this result could set our seasons now 
with limited catch in a very specific area for the next several decades. I hope that doesn't happen. And I'm encouraged by the efforts of this commission and those that inform this commission through advice that we do have a path forward. And that's great. And I wanna hang my hat on that when I travel home 10 hours today to encourage my constituents that this body has found a path forward for us in a particular state of California. I also want to reflect back on that there's a process where we can integrate science that's not necessarily collected by our federal or our state bodies. Basically encourage this body to encourage our state and federal sciences to use industry data. It's not unprecedented and it's been going on for years in terrestrial data collection species. When I first introduced myself to you guys back last summer, I brought up a species like the Northern Spotted Owl, a species that lacked data in 1990s. But industry, because they were faced with a potential endangered and threatened listing, took it upon themselves to invest in methodologies that brought the science to both the state and federal agencies. That process worked and presented a data set to those listing agencies that prevented the species from being listed in the state of California. We can do the same thing with coolback, and that's why I'm encouraging this body to encourage both state and federal agencies to find a way to use the data sets that are coming out of these areas that can't be fished by traditional trawling methods to use the logs and integrate those logs to inform the science. I think then we could really speed up this process in getting our recreational and commercial fishers back in place because we'll have data on quillback. We'll have data on species like copper, which is obviously a species of concern and one you're looking at very closely, or species like China. So we don't have these potential perpetual cycles that create the issues that we're hearing today and make me drive 10 hours to listen to this, me present you some pretty boring conversation. So I'm, uh, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged what I see. I'm encouraged by the process come forward to potentially allow a season for us this summer, starting in June, and more encouraged that folks have been willing to accept the use of descending devices to make sure that we have survival of the quillback rockfish in these current plentiful populations. And again, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Howard? Seeing no questions, thank you very much. <clears throat> Next, we have Steve Huber. Steve will be followed by Jamie Diamond. Good morning, Steve. Good morning. Now, no, I didn't get my coffee either because I don't know why they want to open Starbucks an hour after we go into meetings, but that's, that's, a, that's a whole nother story. Um, we've talked enough about the quillbacks, and now we're going to look at the canaries. Um, I think that bringing us into 20 fathoms, um, mortality rates going to change. Um, we are 100% behind uh, dis descending devices that are actually real ones that will actually deploy when they hit the depth that they need to be done. Um, we are gearing up for that. Um, we're signing for it. We are going to talk about putting the quill back the canaries, the coppers, and the chinas into a into an area where people can read about them and find out what they do. I mean, if you kill a canary, you need to keep them aboard. You know, don't just send a dead fish back into it. But I also think that everyone's going to take the burden of the canary now. It's going to be it's all the way across the board, and I think we have to stay at status quo for that until we get more science involved into it before we start making adjustments in it. Because once we make an adjustment, we never go backwards. It never comes back. And I've seen that through all the years of history, from the salmon to the steelhead, from the Klamath to the, to the Sacramento, to every one of those areas. 
So my suggestion is we keep status quo for till we get the full stock assessment. And then we start making adjustments based on it. But the mortality rate should go way down under 20 fathoms if you're using a correct sending device. And I think that's, that's education and not taking a fish that you don't need to keep when you have plenty of blacks and blues out there. The colored fish are the ones that are our trouble. You know, the vermilions, the coppers, you know, a lot of people can't tell the difference between a copper and a quillback. So they're very similar and very much tough to ID. And if that's the that's where everyone's going to be involved, especially with some help from the Department of Fish and Wildlife and their counters to help educate people more and more. Uh, Ingle Marine is going to have out devices. They're going to have devices available to purchase. And uh, NEMS has actually given me eight by 10 flyers that are laminated that actually show the rockfish that we have. And we're working on it a little bit more to ID the five that we're really after watching the Quebec, the coppers, uh, the vermilions and the canaries. So um, everyone's kind of pitching in and I like it. I like where we're going. And, and, and I want to thank everybody for listening to us because um, it does make a difference for us. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Huber on his testimony. Bob Dooley. Not a question, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you. Good morning. Steve, thanks, thanks for coming this week and, and sharing your opinions. It, it matters when we hear industry in front of us and we listen. And I just want to let you know that. And I really appreciate all your comments and hear them and take them to heart and, and your advocacy at the docks and everything else is really well appreciated. So just wanted to let you know that. Thank you. Hope we see you around more often. Okay, thank you. Jamie Diamond. Jamie will be followed by Tom Hafer. Uh, good morning, Jamie. Good morning, Chair Penger, Vice Chair Hassamer, Council members and staff. I am Jamie Diamond, owner of Stardust Sport Fishing in Santa Barbara, California. My two charter boats fish the Santa Barbara Channel Islands and the Gaviota Coast. And although this agenda item does not directly affect me and my fleet in Southern California, it does affect my greater fishing community, both recreational and commercial. It affects my friends and my council family. I wanna highlight how the fleets through the gap have worked together here, compromised, disagreed, empathized and communicated with each other respectfully they're going home with heavy hearts. Species of concern OIs are set extremely low, which greatly affects fisheries for healthier stocks, which interact with less abundant species. Taking into consideration the needs of fishing communities to avoid short-term disastrous consequences has different meanings to different stakeholders. However, one fact is undisputable. Short and long-term consequences to fishing communities are intrinsically linked. In order for there to be commercial and recreational fishing industries over long term, short term management measures must must help preserve fishing businesses. More plainly said, if no fishing industry exists into the future because of overly extreme cuts in harvest, then the Council clearly has not taken into account the economic needs of fishing communities. Management measures implemented since 22 have greatly reduced and changed the makeup of the fleet. Many operators have already left the industry. Full-time operators in the state that are left are barely holding on. As management continues to tighten, it takes fewer restrictions to break the remaining participants. It is important to remember in the state of California, fishermen, both commercial and recreational, are up against a slew of other problems and restrictions, more than fishing. Current MPAs and state marine conservation areas, new proposed MPAs and SMCAs, marine sanctuaries, 30 by 30, Coast Guard issues, California Air Resource Board emission reduction regulations, and more. It's felt like death by a thousand paper cuts. We've been told, look, you're getting this new opportunity in the CCA repeal, all depth access, et cetera. Reopening fishing grounds that were previously taken away from us does not present new fishing opportunities. We're simply reinstating significant lost opportunity and providing much needed relief and flexibility for some of the existing fisheries. In the last two years, the commercial and recreational participants have been permanently lost. 
there, excuse me, there are commercial and recreational participants that have been permanently lost. More of the already reduced shoreside infrastructure and facilities will be lost. And I say more because it was already gutted during the early 2000s fisheries disaster. This last week, I have had the opportunity to observe much of many of the people behind me and, and people who have already left. And I have to say um, it has, and I, I think others have, have said the same thing, it's felt off, it's felt weird, stressed, strained, more than normal. It feels like everything is simmering and it's coming to a boiling point. Sectors have come a long way with, agent, with, it, with each other, within each other, with agencies, the relationships, where we are today is very different than 20 years ago. But it feels like things are about to erupt. From all the different sectors of fishing, everybody is just being minimized and minimized and shrunk. And the pressure is getting so high that I'm really concerned about how this is going to play out. We were able, as I said, to work together this last week. Everybody's walking away unhappy. Nobody's walking away excited. So compromise happened. Um, but the the jokes and the laughs that the, the little jabs you could make before, they hit it closer to home this week. It was much more intense and things were taken way more personal than they have in a while. Um, I'm concerned about how that's going to go moving forward, um, knowing that it is not going to be getting better. Um, I also would like to say, and I need to cite the fact that much of my statement today was pulled from previous gap statements from 2005 to 2008. Cut and paste some of it, and it applies today just as much as it did then. And I know we're aware of what's happening, and I really appreciate everybody's efforts to get us to a better place, to dig deep, and move us forward in a way that is right for everybody and right for the resource. I want to thank the GMT for their very thoughtful reports and their communication. They have come together as a team over the last several years, and it has been an honor to work with them, as well as every... Sorry. <laughs> as well as everybody on the gap and here. And I don't want to lose that. I really don't. So thank you for what you're going to do. I know we have to do what we have to do. I just need <laughs> to drive it home even more, I guess, that um that that in the off time when when we're not here the work that we have to continue doing looking outside looking at other alternatives are we doing this because this is what has been done or are we are we doing it because it has to be done because if we're just doing something making a change or a management measure or a stock category or whatever it is because that's how it's been done not necessarily because it has to be done that way then maybe we should look at that um we really can't afford to not think as creatively as possible. And I know you know that. So thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Questions for Ms. Diamond on her testimony? Not seeing any. Thank you, Jamie. I just want to say we, we don't just listen here. We do hear you. So thank you very much. And Tom Heffer. was signed up, but okay. okay, you got me now? Yes, yes, we do. Thank you. Yes, Tom Hafer. Okay, thank uh, you. For that. So I want to talk a little bit. So I'm a near shore fisherman in the South Central region. I just want to talk a little bit about that closure to 36 line Lopez. Um, so Quillback. So in the last 14 years, we've caught maybe a little over 200 pounds between Morrill Bay and Monterey near shore fishermen. Um, we're just kind of wondering why you brought the line down so low. I mean, shouldn't it be at like where the South Central region ends north? Because we don't catch quillback 
And with that 20 fathom closure out to three miles, um, it makes us tough. It makes it tough to go out and fish rockfish and, and just to make a living period. I mean, and, and now we hear we got to throw, if you're fishing above the 36 line, you got to throw back the link cut and the reds. Well, we catch that fish in the near shore. And they're way inside 20 fathoms, those fish. And now if we catch it and we have to throw them back, um, it just doesn't seem, doesn't seem right, you know? And some of us don't want to put VMSs on our boats to fish outside three miles above the 36 line, but I guess that's what's going to happen if we want to fish dead fish. Um, so I, I'm just kind of... I don't think that line should be where it's at. I think it should be a, where the where the South Central ends. And, and, you know, it's just, that's the right way to do it. We don't catch quillbacks. We don't target quillbacks. Um, we got a reduction on the coppers, the 75 pounds. That really screwed things up. So, I mean... And what Jamie was talking about, all these things that we have to deal with now, you know, offshore wind is a big thing in Morro Bay. We're totally against it. The site surveys are going to kill all the quillbacks and all the other fish that, where they're doing their site surveys. So, I mean, if you're going to let those guys go out and do all that wind energy exploration, but not let us fish outside 20 fathoms, it just doesn't seem right to us. So, you know... And it kind of seems like the state of California and the, and the feds want us off the water. So I suggest maybe the guys that want to be bought out, somebody buy us out. You know, we're getting fed up with all these things coming down on us. It's a real headache. And it makes the people really sad that we have to just get get more regulations and and more restrictions it's it's getting to the point where a lot of us don't even want to fish anymore because our permits aren't going to be worth squat because all these regulations wind farms going in sanctuaries going in it's it's like it's crazy now so i don't know I'm going to stop. Thanks. We're just fed up. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Tom. Are there questions for Mr. Hafer on his testimony? Looking around the table, there are no questions. So thank you again, Tom. That concludes our reports. Our public testimony takes us to council discussion and action. Um, action items are up here before us. Let's take a 10 minute break. We've been here for an hour and a half and uh, let everyone organize their thoughts and we'll come back into council discussion. Thank you.
All right. 45 second warning. Let's move back to our seats. All right, thank you. It looks like we're all assembled here to come back into the session on this. Uh, just as a reminder, your con council action is on the screen before us, and I will look for a hand to initiate discussion. Keely Kemp. Thank you. Um, I did want to um, add to some of the comments that um, the folks around the table already said, recognizing the work of the groundfish management team leading up to this meeting. Um, they've done a lot of work over winter trying to identify um, some of the analyses for specs, but also the, the challenges that the council really needs to take a hard look at. Um, they pulled together a lot of information. I've seen a lot of good creative thinking, um, and I, I think they've asked very politely um, for some prioritization and some help with their workload. Um, we still have a long way to go in the specs development, um, though it is fast. Um, and I want to help them out on, on that prioritization. I'm, I'm hopeful that the, the rest of the council is also ready to try to do that. Um, whether identifying what they should work on first or, or as extreme as taking things out of the range. Um, from the NIMS perspective, our top priority in this specs package um, in terms of the things that have come forward today um, is the rebuilding plan. And um, in particular, we want to make sure that there's emphasis um, and time spent on building out that rationale um, for delaying rebuilding um, for the needs of the fishing communities. Um, I understand that there's a lot of interest around the table at looking at the ABC control rule, which is the longest rebuilding alternative in that rebuilding analysis. And that will definitely require building that record for why we are going to take that additional time for the needs of the fishing community. So from our perspective, um, we want to make sure the GMT has the time and the space to pull that information together um, in conjunction with council staff and NIMS staff. Um, we'll certainly expend our resources to make sure that isn't there. Um, and, and I wanted to put that forward sort of to get that ball rolling on prioritization. Thanks. Thank you very much. Further discussion, Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Reicher. And I think maybe if I could have a question relative to timing or expected timing of completion of a rebuilding plan. And I don't know, maybe that's a question for Mr. Phillips um, that might help frame priorities for the entire GMT a little bit differently. Um, I'm not sure who that goes to, but I'll throw it out there if someone can answer that. I will look to Keely, I guess you've got that straw. Um, thank you. Um, I might have to ask you a question to clarify. So when you are asking the timing of the rebuilding plan, are you asking like council final action or when the analysis needs to be done. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Thanks, Keely. I, I guess we're a week away from a briefing book deadline for an April meeting, so I'm not supposing that there's any expectation that the GMT has any capabilities, even if they put this first and foremost and upfront, that there would be something in April. So I'm presuming that means June, but I just wanted to confirm that's, that's the idea here. Todd. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, so, the, yes, Caroline, you have missed this night. You have recognized the fact that we're very, very close between now and April. Um, it would be highly unlikely to have a full rebuilding plan before the council uh, in that two weeks. So, June would probably, unfortunately, be the time for the full document or full analysis. Uh, however, I would think that. In April, staff could come back to the council with at least the differences between whatever rebuilding strategies you select in terms of numbers, 
Um, so you'd have an idea of, of the overall differences. We, in the specs document, uh, or the management measures ad that were recommended, or not recommended, but we looked at per guidance from the council in November, uh, there, we may have already done some of that work. Uh, so there could be like a, a brief snapshot or an indication of what would come in terms of management measures. However, things like community dependence or socioeconomic, uh, major socioeconomic ramifications would be very, very tough to get done between now and, and April. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Reicher. Um, thank you. Just to step back a little bit, and I, I want to thank the GMT very much for the amount of information that's in front of us under this agenda item and the very great presentation and taking it in bite sizes and giving us a very concise set of um, questions where you need guidance and information. Um, I think that this sets us up very nicely for April um, and is a good segue. Um, but coming off of this last set of discussions, um, I think we can dispense with the Quillback Rockfish needs under this agenda item. I'm prepared with a motion unless there's further discussion around the table. Thank you. I want to look around for further discussion first. Not seeing any. I think we're ready for your motion. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you. I move the council adopt a range of 2025-2026 harvest specifications for quillback rockfish off California recommended by the GMT in table one from agenda item E7A, supplemental GMT report one, November 2023, with a technical correction to the 2026 <laughs> specification as provided by the SSC and agenda item F7A, supplemental SSC report one, March 2024. Thank you. The language on the screen is accurate and complete. It is. Thank you. Is there a second to the motion? Seconded by Corey Ridings. Please speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the intent here is to provide uh, a range of specifications um, and the widest range um, possible, uh, representing um, in table one, both uh, fishing of no none or no fishing up to the ABC control rule. Um, this is intended to support the rebuilding um, plan development, uh, but it also allows for the GMT to continue work, um, management measure development in, in support of keeping on our timeline for our specification process and a January 1 implementation date. Um, this is uh, supported and recommended by the GMT, the SSC, and the GAP. Thank you. Thank you. Questions to the maker of the motion for clarification. Todd Phillips. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Caroline, or, excuse me, Ms. McKnight. Um, should, are you indicating then with this particular motion that you would not want to see the, what we're terming the, we're calling the council or California uh, quillback number that you were recommended in November, which was the eight metric ton OFL. Would you want to see that continue on into the analysis? Uh, to the chair, thank you, Mr. Phillips. Um, this motion doesn't explicitly eliminate it. I think that it's already included in the analysis that are turned in at this point. So this would be in addition to. Great, through the chair, vice chair. Thank you, Mr. McKnight, I appreciate it. Any other questions for clarification on the motion? Seeing none, discussion on the motion? Seeing no hands for discussion, I will call the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Caroline McKnight. Thank you, thank you Mr. Reicher. Uh, just following that, I, I wanted to touch on another order of business in the system, which is uh, specific to providing management measure guidance for quillback rockfish. Uh, Mr. Phillips, you, you headed that direction <laughs> for me. Um, I just wanted to continue to acknowledge that um, the, these specifications coming from this rebuilding analysis 
are going to continue to severely constrain fisheries off of California. Um, however, CDF and W has been taking steps since 2023 and in conjunction with the council here and it, and and in season for 2024 to reduce impacts to quillback rockfish for both um, by, excuse me, by allowing some shallow nearshore opportunities um, balanced with offshore opportunities. So I believe that in terms of guidance for 25, 26 management measures, we are, we've planned for that and we are well suited in a place to um, be prepared for April and beyond accordingly with these, these um, harvest specifications. So hopefully that gives you what you need in terms of guidance. Thank you. All right, thank you. Further discussion guidance here. Maybe if we get our uh, action item list back up on the screen. See if anybody wants to add anything else. Heather Hall. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, take the opportunity to thank the GMT for the remarkable amount of work that they did um, and, and shared with us at this meeting um, the really helpful way that they presented the information to us in their presentation, thinking about how we can um, uh, help them move forward and give them some um, guidance, maybe help with um, prioritization and what they have in front of them to prepare for April and June. Um, I wanted to thank the GAP too. This was um, in, in their uh, working through really challenging conversations um, on short spine thorny head. I know this is a tough week for both of the those two teams and I think all of that work uh, sets us up really well for April and I'm, I'm very appreciative of it. Um, so I wanted to just start with that. I think I um, have my list of issues that uh, places where we can provide input to the GMT. Um, it looks like uh, one of the issues they brought to us was the, um, the sorting requirements that um, will come up and it seems like this could be one of those places where it's very low, low priority at this point. We can uh, talk more about it in April when they bring their um, full report to us, but that seems like a really easy place to signal a potential very low priority for, for work at this point. Um, maybe I'll just pause there. I think Lynn has organized some of this input uh, for us to talk about too, so I'll just pause and let that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Look around, Lynn Mattis. Yeah, uh, thank you, Vice Chair and Ms. Hall. Um, I was slightly confused because the council actions there are different than the ones that are on the um, sit sum, and I thought we were going in order. But um, I, I, we we have created a table to if uh, Chris could display it um, with guidance on the items that the GMT requested. Uh, specific guidance on. We went through the presentation and every place they asked for guidance, we are trying. We have tried to create this table um, to help that it's out in front of everybody and written. Um, so hopefully this is a format that helps the GMT council staff and whoever from NIMS is working on specs um, with this. Um, just walking down at sea set asides, uh, we believe the current the current range is sufficient. You don't need to look for any other um, alternatives. Uh, on the Petrali Sol issue, no further analysis on allocations or management measures. Canary rockfish allocations and widow rockfish allocations, the current range is sufficient. On short spine thorny head issue, prioritize pathway two as outlined in the gap report for analysis. No further analysis on the other pathways. Um, Ms. Hall spoke to the sorting requirement briefly. Um, the GMT presentation said that there was going to be some preliminary findings and maybe a scoping document in April. Please bring that to us and we will uh, discuss it. However, this should be a considered a low priority. 
on the discard mortality rates. Uh, this is seen as a technical correction. This is for the ca uh, canary, cow cod, and yellow eye. Therefore, it doesn't need to be part of the specs package. Uh, ask council staff to make the corrections. On the sable fish discard mortality rates for recreational fisheries, apply a 7% mortality rate, same as the other species without a swim bladder. Um, but put this on the workload and new management measures prioritization list, the item formerly known as omnibus. Um, for future further analysis. And then on continuous transit, yes, please keep this management measure as part of the specs package. So I think we've covered the places the GMT asked for guidance, um, and hopefully this is a format that is helpful to the team moving forward. All right, thank you, Lynn. I wanna make sure everybody's clear on this. This is offered as council guidance so that there's agreement around the table. Uh, this would move forward and any clarification. Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Reister. Um, thank you, Lynn. I like the table, <laughs> I find helpful. Um, just a point of clarification on the Sablefish DMR item. On the last sentence there says, put this on the workload and new management measure prioritization list. I think the intent there is to put it forward for the council to consider putting it on the list, not just throw it on there, right? I just wanna clarify that language. Thank you. Uh, through the vice chair, that's correct, Ms. McKnight. I, and I also see I have soaring requirements instead of short team requirements. All right, Heather Hall. Thank you. Um, and I think maybe it, uh, in this guidance, we have current ranges sufficient and yet we heard a little bit from the GMT and the gap on their preferences for the range. And so just thinking now about um, clarifying what we have in the table here for that. So for example, um, for widow rockfish, the GMT and, and yellowtail had um, added some lower and higher <laughs> at sea set asides in their table. And I think um, to be clear, what they brought up would be included in this range. Um, and then thinking about canary rockfish, just in terms of um, helping to provide guidance on priorities, the gap also in their table had, um, offered some ideas on what the, the range of those allocation scenarios could be. And so we say current range, but I'm not sure if we've been very clear here about what, what we mean by that. So just. All right, thank you. And uh, I'm gonna turn to Lynn and see if you can clarify the current range. I do remember the widow and the yellow tail that uh, the bolded items I think were new. Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair and Ms. Hall. Yeah, it was all the stuff that was in the uh, GMT presentation with the bolded and added. Um, the I think the mid-range widow allocation item, um, that was my intent with this guidance, uh, sorry, it is perfectly clear. It was trying to do things in a hurry. I uh, thought about this table um, about halfway through the gap presentation. Phil Anderson. Let me just turn to Canary uh, for a moment, just again, for clear clarity on what we're saying. Um, I'm sure the gap had a lot of deliberations before coming up with their recommendations. Um, and relative to the commercial non-trawl um, sectors, the, the uh, excuse me, the commercial non-trawl recreational uh, and sharing arrangement, they recommended status quo and not including the other alternatives that were in the GMT report. And similarly, the state-specific recreational shares, they recommended sticking with status quo and not exploring the other alternatives that were in the GMT report. So just, again, I would like <clears throat> clarification on what the current range is sufficient means relative to that. 
Lynn. Yeah. Vice Chair Hesmer, Mr. Anderson. With this not being a decision making meeting on removing alternatives, my the guidance was that what we have in the range is sufficient. They don't need to look for additional alternatives to be analyzed between now and April. And then when we come to the April meeting, that's when we will identify a PPA. Um, and I was seeing the gap recommendations as more of the April step than what we were trying to do right now. Um, given the analysis that's already been done, I don't think the GMT needs to do any further analysis on the canary allocations. I just don't think that this is the meeting where we are supposed to eliminate anything from the range of alternatives, uh, given it's a specs update, and I don't think it was noticed as an action item for this agenda item today. Hopefully that helps some on what the thinking was. Heather Hall. Thank you. And, and I was thinking similarly too, and, and when I started out by saying um, that I thought the gap in the GMT did a fantastic job of setting us up well for April was along those lines and they've already kind of um, dug into the details and, and given us something to think about between now and April um, about where we could uh, refine the alternatives and, and select the PPA. Um, so I'm agreeing with Lynn too that this is really just a high level update. I wanted to acknowledge that it feels to me that the GMT and the gap are um, on the right track in, in much of the input that we got from them. And um, so hopefully that's that's helpful and, and, and not confusing. Thank you. Chair Penninger. Yeah, uh, thank you, Vice Chair Hasmer. I'm, I, I look at this as kind of the broader um, between the gap and the GMT that the broader look at it is what we include on the, the gap that look at the status quo on uh, say for Canary, for instance, the GMT said to look at the range. I think we, the range is what we look at, what we'd have. So I don't think like, we should be excluding anything here at this point. So. Keely Kent. Thank you. I wanted to ask about um, one of the items that's in the gap report, and just whether there was any um, guidance that the council wanted to give. So the long leader gear recommendation from the gap about analysis for long leader gear in the California recreational fishery. I believe it wasn't in the, the GMT report. I believe it's not in the range yet, but I understand the gap has asked for it. Um, I think maybe now this is the second time and I'm simply confirming if there is any guidance at this point on that item or um, perhaps in April, there's further discussion on it. Look around and see Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Keely. I think that if I'm understanding the process right, and I might have to tap Mr. Phillips here to make sure that I am. Um, we did not move that. It was on the initial list in September as a new management measure item. Um, and it was not moved forward beyond that for consideration. So my understanding of process wise, it would be too far into our specification scheduling process to bring it back at this juncture. But if that's not the case, that would be a good conversation to have. But that's my understanding is that new management measures needed to be on the list in November for overwinter analysis to be ready in time for April. Pause for a second here, staff are conferring on that. Todd Phillips. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I was commuting with my with, with, with the better brains. Um, in the COPs, there is a footnote that says items can be brought forward in April. Um, one thing to note, though, is that anything brought forward in April or post November, we could say, could stall out um, analyses on anything else, such as uh, a rebuilding plan or that sort of thing. So in April, an item can be brought forward. Does Caroline? If I may, thank you. Just for clarification, that would include what we are typically calling a new management measure, as well as, I'm trying to avoid the word routine, but I'm going to say it anyways, standing <laughs> management measure changes. 
through the vice chair. Yes, Mc, yes, uh, Ms. McKnight, I would say that you are correct there. Um, I like the term standing management, management measures. It's a good term. Um, but yes, you could bring forward a new management measure. And again, it would apply the same basic logic there that anything brought forward could be detrimental to uh, getting the specs pushed through on time. All right. So that goes back. Keely, did that answer your question? Okay. We have this guidance, which uh, I have the situation summary checklist here that covers a lot. And I just want to make sure everyone agrees with this guidance and is clear with it. Caroline, did you have something? Thank you, Mr. Reicher. I didn't mean to get ahead of you. I think we had a few more order orders of guidance okay. to give, but I'll pause and let you finish. All right. I'll just, as long as this checklist, uh, if you want to call it that, is up here before us. See if there are any other questions on that. And I'm not seeing any, so go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And I was going to say yes. I, I have been mostly quiet on this table in front of us, but I am in agreement with it. I appreciate the conversation around the table sort of understanding what we meant by current range is sufficient. I agree with Ms. Hall and Ms. Mattis on, on what the intent there was. Um, unless there's anything else, I can move on to provide some guidance on copper rockfish uh, ACT south of 3427 per the SITSUM. Uh, the intent was meant to be, <clears throat> excuse me, for a recreational um, non-trawl recreational ACT south of 3427 um, in direct response to the assessment um, demonstrating lower proportional biomass in that area. And given the timing of how data streams and data programs work, um, it makes um, reasonable sense to provide that kind of target for a recreational fishery as they tend to harvest the, the bulk of that species in the south. And I'll ask Mr. Phillips if that is sufficient guidance on that particular item. Through the vice chair, yes, Ms. McKnight, that really does help. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Further guidance, Lynn Mattis. Thank you, vice chair. Uh, in the situation summary, under the same uh, council action um, and attachment one, there was asking for clarification on council intent regarding the Canary rockfish uh, harvest specification uh, back in November um, in between coughs and cold medicine, I made a motion um, on the uh, harvest control rules specifying only adopting alternative harvest control rules for Rex, Sole, Short Spine, and Dover Sole. I intentionally left sablefish and canary rockfish out that we would, the intent being that we would only use the default. Uh, it was caught later in the meeting and Ms. McKnight did a, a, a later motion to specify that we were only going to look at the default and to remove the alternative for sablefish. We neglected to do that for canary rockfish. So while my intent was to only be looking at the default of P star 0.45, uh, there's been a lingering question about the P star 0 0.40 out there. Um, the intent with the motion I made, but I think there may be some misunderstanding among other council members, was to not continue to look, only look at the uh, P star 0.45 and no further consideration of P star 0 0.40 similar to sablefish. Um, I don't know if we need to have discussion in case other council members had a different perspective on that, but that was my intent. I just may not have clarified it or caught that we needed to do canary like we did sablefish. Look around, Heather Hall. Thank you, and thank you for that, Ms. Mattis. I think it was our understanding that um, P star of point four was in in the range and 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 to be analyzed. And I know. I do recall hearing from the the GMT and the gap that you know um, it's going to be constraining, but we were also balancing that with what we heard from the stock assessment too, and um, um, the idea that 
Canary Rockfish has potentially never actually been rebuilt. So at in November, when we're setting up the range, I uh, thought that it was appropriate to have 0.40 P-star um, in the range so that we could look at that here when we get to April and narrow the range of alternatives. So looking around, is it clear? It's not clear to me right now. So I'm not sure who to turn to on, on the range. Lynn? Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I, given that this is an update and the council action is guidance, not a motion or not an action item, I, om I almost think we need to wait until April to further refine it. I know the team has been focusing on the PSTAR of 0.45, has not been doing any work really on PSTAR 0.40. Um, I'm just procedurally wise a little unsure of exactly how we proceed, given that we're not in an action meeting for that item. I, I don't know if it would take a formal, another formal motion on that one. I think I'm rambling I'm, and talking my, my own self into circles, but I do know the team has been focusing on 0.45. And I thought I saw Mr. Phillips nod his head when I said that. Um, so I guess some procedural assistance at this point would be helpful. And what I'm hearing is consistent with the motion that was passed. The team is focusing on P star of 0.45. Yes, Mr. Vice Chair, you're correct. Um, the team interpreted, staff interpreted, and NIMPS all interpreted uh, the motion as did, uh, well, NIMPS folks on the, the GMT, I should say, can't speak for Keeley. Um, we interpreted your motion, uh, Ms. Uh, Mattis, to be exactly as you said. So we did not do any work on um, the alternative harvest control rule for canary rockfish. And that the door is open to revisit that in April? Yes, it would be tough, but we could revisit it. All right, thank you. Heather Hall. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate the conversation here too. And if April's the time to bring it up, we can, but, uh, well, it makes me wonder where the point of confusion was and why this isn't if there was if there's clarity on the motion why was the confusion brought up in the briefing book in the in the report so i'm missing that a little bit todd yes thank you mr vice chair um um miss hall so i had had several discussions with um, different members on the council and they were confused as to what that motion meant and also it was because the clarity was made for sablefish, we also were wanting to make sure that that same clarity was provided for, um, not copper, but canary rockfish as well. And so the easiest way that we determined to do that would be through uh, Ms. Ms. Blattis explaining it. Thank you. Is there further guidance? on these items for discussion. Todd? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I feel I've spoken quite a bit during this particular agenda item, but you get to hear me some more. So the SSC in their report brings up a point um, regarding Washington Cabazon and the request for a catch only projection. Um, so if we could acknowledge that that's acceptable. Heather Hall. Thank you. Uh, no, I have a question about that. Um, thanks for bringing that up. Um, can you help me understand why it's needed and, and why this request for a catch only update is it's not too late in the process? Yes, I, um, I would prefer that we go to my virtual um, compatriot, Ms. Uh, Marlene Bellman. She has the the science words that I don't possess.
Marlene, are you there? Yes, thanks. Thank you for the question. Um, in reviewing the numbers for the specs, um, oftentimes we come upon um, numbers or projections that need to be updated um, relative to um, additional catch. Um, and this was one of those that um, came to our attention that the, the same values had been rolling forward, such as like a constant um, specification for the category that this is, that is under. And in this instance, um, there's actually sort of year specific um, projections that would potentially be needed until you reach that constant uh, value that would be used and would roll forward. And so um, there was a need to acknowledge that uh, this projection would need to be updated to, to get those values so they're actually accurate and they're not a static, um, they're not necessarily a static constant value that you would continue to use in each cycle. Um, that in this case, we actually would potentially have uh, year specific values to utilize from this projection. And in doing so and realizing this technical correction, um, it was felt that it would be helpful to also um, update the catches in those projections as well. So in addition to not carrying forward um, a static set of numbers that was perhaps not intended to be a constant value, um, it was also requested to update the catches in those projections as well. Um, this potentially would have been caught and put forward when we requested a couple other things that were um, identified in the specs process in November, but this had not been caught or brought to our attention back in November. So again, we, we had a couple of projections requested already to make sure we had the most accurate values for 25, 26 going forward. And again, this is, this is one of those that was identified and would benefit from um, an updated catch projection with those most recent catches included as well, so that we have the most accurate um, OFLs moving forward. Thank you. All right, Heather Hall. Thank you, Marlene. I, I'm, I'm following, um, I'm tracking that uh, this does seem a bit out of the ordinary. Um, I, I heard you say technical correction, um, but it also makes me think about the council's request to consider a catch only uh, projection for Dover Soul, where we're using an estimate, estimated catch of 50,000 metric tons compared to our actual catch of 6,000 metric tons. And we're told that uh, there, there wasn't time to do that. And so, um, thinking about it in that context and just want to be very open about that. Um, so in terms of, um, you know, the recommendation or the, re the request from the SSC to review this, it, it, it feels again, like it's going beyond um, just a technical correction and almost, you know, updating, um, the the assessment that was done for um, Cabazon and and so I guess um, the question there and thank you um, for that Marlene is is how what is the workload there and and how do you how are we um, adjusting to that that workload issue that we heard for Do Dover Soul. Thank you for the question, uh, Council Member Hall. We um, we've been in communication with the Science Center and the saxophone and author that would be um, responsible for updating this Washington Cabazon projection, um, and basically been told that that's a reasonable workload and that that's. Um, well on track for being able to bring it back um, in April. Um, I have not, uh, I have not had any, you know, similar communication relative to Dover Soul, and 
potential requests for for updating that one. So I'm I'm not aware of what the workload associated workload would be or what sort of subsequent conversations have been around Dover Soul and the council's intention there. Thank you. Phil Anderson. I'm not sure but that this is, but it feels like a process foul to me. Um, we, we, during our, for preparing for our biennial uh, spec cycle, we lay out the stocks that are gonna be assessed. Uh, we get those results in September and November. And then from November on, we take uh, that information and begin to develop and think about management measures to meet uh, the requirements of, of um, uh, ensuring that we're uh, managing our ground fish stocks appropriately and consistent with those stock assessments. So to bring this in at this stage and get some result, unknown results when we only have one more meeting to um, consider how we might react to it um, is the to me is a precise reason we don't do that. And we have a schedule set up where it gives us uh, adequate time to consider the results of a, of a stock assessment, uh, be it an update or a full assessment. Um, uh, and then in November, and then have the, this seven month time frame in our, in our council meetings to reach our specs decision in June. But so um, I don't like surprises and that this feels a lot like one. Heather Hall. Thank you. I, I wonder if a potential path forward um, might be, and I should start by saying I, I agree with what um, Mr. Anderson just said, and, and but maybe to move us forward, um, wondering if Marlene, you could um, consult with the Science Center on the question I asked around workload ability and, and to do that for both the Cabazon issue that you brought to us, but also the Dover Soul question that we've been asking since November. And, and, and maybe that's something that we could hear um, about in April. Sorry, what, was there a question to Marlene there? It was a request that Marlene uh, consult with the Science Center on the workload question relative to not just Cabazon and this request for a catch-only update, um, but also uh, Doversol, because that has been a question as well. So I'm, I'm asking if we could um, understand that better in April. Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you for the comments, Heather and Phil. I, I think I agree wholeheartedly that it, it's hard to get caught with surprises and know how to respond with not a lot of information in front of you. I think maybe a consideration to your request in addition to that would be a better understanding of the workload associated with catch-only projections. It wasn't too many cycles ago where on the GMT there was consideration for putting lots of species on the list for catch only projections because there are benefit um, in the long run to <clears throat> replacing actual or realized catch with assumed catch. Um, and so I feel like we did have a period in time where we had too many on the list and then we cut that back. And so it's a bit of a slippery slope. So I think just understanding what that looks like from a workload perspective in April would be helpful to understand if there's others beyond just those two species that should have or could have or none should be in a total package. Thank you. All right, thank you. Lynn Mattis. Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair. I agree we need some more information. I'm just worried by waiting till April to get that information, then it's after April before we would get the results of that assessment. And 
normally we do FPA on the harvest specifications piece in April. So to me, waiting to get the preliminary results of an assessment till April is way too late because then, you know, there's no time, what little time is there to develop management measures by the time we do June final action. Um, I know it's a Sunday and probably not everybody's working, but if there was any way we could get even a little feedback by in time for our workload planning discussion tomorrow. Um, I, I agree with what the others have said. This is coming very, very late in the process. And November was too late to ask for it for Dover. So asking for it in April seems way, way too late for another species. I just, I think we're too far in the process and it could, yeah, Cabazon off of Washington maybe doesn't affect as many sectors as something like Canary would, but it still has the potential to delay our work on the harvest specifications package overall. All right, thank you. And in thinking about this, the workload issue, bringing that back to us in April is late. Um, I'm just going to look back at the SSC report. They're suggesting we do that, and we're looking for guidance. So do you want to offer the guidance that we follow up on that or not? That I think that's where, what we need to decide. Phil Anderson. Well, I would say that I appreciate their suggestion and it would have been timely to have in September, but it's too late in our process to number one, do the work and respond to the results in the, in our biennial spec cycle and do, uh, and do our, uh, due diligence and ensuring that the public has an opportunity to comment on the results and the implications and we don't have that time left within our biennial spot specs process and have our final decision in june thank you sharon kiefer thank you mr vice chairman i'm assuming there are, you know, we start the checklist for not the upcoming biennial, but the one after that. Um, and so I guess I just kind of look at this as a marker potential to be in the proper time of the cycle for not this round, but the next round. I assume the council probably keeps or the staff probably kind of keeps a checklist of things that might come up that are not at the appropriate time in the cycle we're in for that might be something to be considered the next time. I, I, that's just my assumption. To the vice chair, yes, you are, you are correct. We definitely keep lots and lots of lists. Thank you. Executive Director Burden. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Just in the interest of um, maybe getting some resolution on this item, I, I do tend to agree with. Mr. Anderson's uh, wisdom. Um, we do have a process for a reason. The, there are uh, times when we deviate from that process, like if there's a conservation concern that we're, we become aware of or a significant economic impact that we become aware of. In this case, um, the as far as I'm aware, the catches of Cabazon have been well below the ACL, so there's nothing that tells me we're likely looking at a conservation problem. Um, I haven't heard from Washington that, there, that the species is binding the economics of the fisheries. I don't see a large scale economic problem like we had with Quillback. I, I personally don't see a reason to abandon our process is, is what I, where I've landed, so. Heather Hall. Thank you, just wanted to acknowledge the input from Ms. Keeper and, and Mr. Anderson and executive director here at, um, it aligns with my thinking as well. And, and um, so offering the guidance of, you know, thinking about this in the future, I, I suppose um, the science centers could go forward with this on their own. Um, and I would just say that if they do, it'd be interesting to hear 
um, whether they were able to do that on their own for Dover Soul as well. Thank you. Thank you. And while everyone is checking their guidance checklists, I don't want to cut it off, but I'm going to turn to Todd on what we've already provided guidance on. We had a motion on Quillback and then some guidance. Um, are there some holes yet to be filled? Uh, from what I understand, you have the council has given essentially a prioritized list of how to move forward. Um, we do note that Quillback rebuilding plan will take precedence over just about everything. Um, the guidance that document or the, the table that was shown is very, very helpful. So I really appreciate that. Um, the motion was clear and adopted. So I don't see, I, I think you've addressed just about everything. So the key issue, of course, was ensuring that the GMT had a uh, prioritization or direction of how to move forward in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. All right. I will look around and make sure everybody agrees with that or is there anything else to be added here? I'm not seeing any hands. So thank you all very much for your work on this and that will close out this agenda item. And I need to move the gavel back to our chair. Okay. Thank you, Vice Chair Hasmer. Um, well done. I think we're actually uh, perfectly on time. Well, okay. Well, we had a break a little bit ago, so we'll continue on and to uh, go to in season F8. And Todd, I'll turn to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Council, we have agenda item F8, which is in season adjustments, final action. So under this agenda item is where the Council will consider making any adjustments um, to fisheries as needed to attain but not exceed ACLs. Uh, in particular, this agenda item will is expected to address um, the California recreational fisheries, noting that in November, California brought forward a suite of actions to for the commercial fishery and noted that under in March they would return with a, a similar uh, set of guidance and or motions for the recreational fishery. Um, I will note that we also have uh, the whiting cooperatives. We're here we're invited to come speak to the council. And this is per a motion that Mr. Anderson made back in September where he uh, where it was encouraged that the the Whiting co excuse me, the cooperatives came to the council and discussed any work that they had made or any progress they had made on intersector um, cooperative agreements. And so we'll hopefully hear it from them as well. Um, looking to your actions, of course, is to consider projections for 2024 fisheries and then drop any 2024 in-season adjustments as necessary and adopting final in-season adjustments is the target action. So that's my overview, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you, Todd. Questions for Todd on his overview? Okay. Not seeing any. With that, I'll turn to uh, Caroline and for the CDFW report. Caroline. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll start with agenda item F8A. Uh, this is supplemental C CDFNW report one. This report was in the briefing book prior to the start of the meeting and has been there for quite some time. This is a standing report that we submit every meeting that shows um, how our respective commercial and recreational fisheries have tracked against the harvest limits um, for 2023. Um, I will read it. <laughs> I will just make sure if there's any specific questions or um, points of clarification. From anyone. Okay. Questions for Caroline. Oop. Questions for Caroline on CDF report one. Thank you. Good. Okay. Thank you. Um, moving on to agenda item F8A. Um, this has also been in the, the briefing book for a while. I'm not going to read it um, verbatim, but I'm going to just touch on a few things like the, the take home message from this report is um, over the course since our last meeting in November, um, CDFNW has been um, busy at work making some uh, amendments to our state regulations um, in response to impact reduction needs for quillback rockfish. Those include uh, creating a 20 fathom boundary line um, in state regulations that falls entirely inside state waters and is applicable to both the recreational and commercial fishery. Um, and then 
signaling in, in anticipation of uh, this particular agenda item at this meeting, we've been signaling in our state regulatory process through our um, California Fish and Game Commission process, um, restructuring our 2024 recreational season steps and sub bag limits. Um, and so we'll be concluding that process after we complete our business here today. Part of that package also includes um, the requirement to have a descending device um, on board and ready for use. Um, that has been broadly and widely supported by um, our industry and is included in our state package. Um, and then including uh, a, a newer or a sub-management line within our central groundfish management area at 36 degrees um, so that we can separate out our, our season structures and bag limits and depths north and south of that line, again, in response to quillback rockfish. Um, additionally, the last thing um, is um, some acknowledgement that we continue to take systematic and stepwise approach to reducing our impacts to vermilion rockfish, which is um, highly attained um, and in an overage status, um, but is an important uh, species in our recreational fishery. So we have signaled um, a reduction in our sub bag limit in combination with looking at different season struct or season lengths um, to stay within those harvest limits. Um, and then additionally, uh, quillback rockfish will continue to be prohibited. Um, and then there's some additional discussion regarding a bag limit or sub bag limit um, on copper rockfish from one to zero fish. Again, in response to looking at the length of seasons and trade-offs um, for season structures. Um, I think I will pause there and see if there's any questions relative to content in our report too. Okay, questions for Caroline? Okay, you're doing good. Okay, and, and then just uh, to wrap it up, um, CDF and W is held um, leading up to this meeting, two separate industry specific meetings to walk through some options uh, to get us to where I believe that we're at today with um, our advisory body reports. I think I'll conclude there. All right. Just make sure there's no questions for you at all before I move on to uh, the GMT report. Okay. All right, we'll for Lynn Massey and the GMT report. Morning, council members. I'm Lynn Massey, the National Marine Fisheries Service representative on the GMT, and I have my CDF and W friends with me for backup. Uh, this is a long report here, so I will read portions of it, but I'm going to largely summarize a lot of it. Uh, if I skip over a detail that you were hoping to hear more about, please feel free to make me backtrack. It's no problem. Um, so first off, uh, the GMT got an overview of the CDF and W reports that Ms. McKnight just briefed you on. Uh, for the management alternatives for the California Recreational Fishery. We don't have any specific recommendations on them. Uh, we largely default to the gap in the EC's input on that. Uh, so we don't have any specific anything specific to flag for you there. Uh, next, uh, while we were working through a proposal that I'll brief you on shortly, we realized uh, that the trip limit tables published in January 2024 don't capture the full intent of the council action in 2023 for the area between 4010 and 36, specifically for minor shelf rockfish uh, in the limited entry fixed gear and open access fisheries. We messed up an area delineation. Uh, the short of it is that uh, I'm sorry and we'll fix it. Uh, we won't read you all the specific changes that we need to make. Um, if you take no action today, NIMS can fix it. If you decide not to take up our proposal today, uh, I'm sorry, if you decide not to take it up, we'll fix it. If you decide to take up our pr proposal, I will make sure that the changes are appropriately melded with the uh, new trip limits that we have proposed for you in this report. So moving on to the in-season proposal that we have for you here, um, as you all know, in December, 2023, NIMS declared the California stock of quillback rockfish overfished uh, prior to that in 2023, uh, we did exceed the OFL contributions to the complex. This council took several in-season actions to immediately reduce quillback rockfish mortality in the, in the recreational and commercial fisheries. Um, one of those changes was several rockfish conservation area boundary moves. Um, you extended the non-trawl RCA for commercial fisheries out to the three nautical mile line between 36 
and 42 at your November meeting. Uh, and so that square of those restrictions is what we uh, call in the GMT, the quillback problem area. Um, so it's a big block of uh, RCA restrictions where only 12V gear, I'm sorry, I realize that term is outlawed, only non-bottom contact gear uh, can be used. Uh, and we also took away trip limits for co-occurring species like lingcod, other flatfish, cabazon, those things. Uh, we also reduced trip limits for shelf rockfish. Um, so what the GMT is proposing for you today is to bump that latitude line up a little bit. So in 2023, the GMT suggested that line at 36 because uh, we chose the southernmost line that we knew was safe. Uh, we know that there is next to no quillback rockfish encounter south of 36. As this council and everybody knows, we heard overwhelming public comment from fishermen out of Monterey Bay ports that they very rarely see or encounter quillback rockfish. Um, the purpose of this proposal is to listen to that. Um, so after we got that overwhelming public comment, the GMT decided to sort of follow a breadcrumb trail north. We took a much more granular look at the area between 36 and 3707, which is Onion Nuevo. Um, so the proposal that we have before you today is to bump that latitude line up from 36 to 3707. And what that would do is the shoreward restrictions that you added to the non troll RCA. So you took that shoreward boundary from 50 fathoms in that area and you extended it all the way out to the three nautical mile line. And that was to close near shore grounds where quillback rockfish are. So we would undo that. It would take the shoreward boundary back to 50 fathoms in that area. And the exact area that it would open is on figure one. Um, hopefully you have a color version in front of you, otherwise this might be challenging. Uh, but that very dark area, it should be bright blue on your map. Um, it's about 61 and a half square miles that, would be, that we would be opening up to the commercial non trawl fishery. So limited entry, fixed gear and open access. Um, we have a data overview for you in this re report. I will not read all of the tables, but there's data tables that you have in front of you that include commercial catch, recreational catch uh, from a long period and a recent period. You also have WICOP data and you have uh, CCFRP data and ROV data. We've delineated it for you by area along the California coast and we have italicized all catch and encounters that occur south of Año Nuevo. Um, they all are unidirectional in what they're telling us. Uh, Quebec catch and encounters is very, very, very rare uh, south of 3707. Um, so that is why we're bringing this pro proposal to you. And a quick backtrack on the map, uh, the bright green that you see would be the non troll RCA that is left. Um, so I realize as you're looking at this map that 61 and a half square miles uh, doesn't look like much. We have heard testimony from fishermen that those fishing grounds mean something. Uh, primarily it's grounds for shelf rockfish that they could have back and target. Uh, and that does mean a lot to them right now in light of the uh, salmon seasons and the shortened crab seasons. Um, so next in our report beyond that boundary line move, we've made some trip limit suggestions. Um, and so what those trip, I won't read them line by line, but what they're doing is they are reverting the things we took away back prior to your September and your November in-season actions with some exceptions. So we're bumping shelf rockfish back up. We're giving back other flatfish, giving back lingcod. Um, there's a couple of sub options for you in here. Uh, we're still proposing uh, well, we're giving you the option to consider that minor nearshore rockfish remain at zero and that cabazon remain at zero. And that is a result of discussions with our enforcement committee. They've identified enforcement concerns with differing possession re requirements in state versus federal waters. And that was an ask from them to consider that. And so that's in our report for your consideration as well. We do have an impact analysis that I do think that I should read for you. Um, I'll try to be brief. 
So based on the data presented above, which is in all those tables I pointed out, uh, commercial coolback rockfish encounters between 36 and 3707 are rare. Therefore, the GMT anticipates minimal mortality impacts from moving the shoreward boundary of the non-trawl RCA between 3707 and 36 to 50 fathoms. However, due to its overfish status, catch limits are expected to be very low throughout the rebuilding time frame, and thus only a very small amount of fish will be available to account for discard mortality. The small amount of discard mortality that may result from opening this area will be a risk call by the council. Moreover, since quillback rockfish are prohibited, no landings of quillback rockfish should occur. Impacts to quillback rockfish from moving the shoreward boundary of the non-trawl RCA between 3707 and 36 to 50 fathom will come as discard mortality and will not be known until June of 2025. The GMT notes that many nearshore permit holders do not have a vessel monitoring system and therefore would not be able to take advantage of this opening until they obtain a VMF. Encounters of quillback rockfish within this proposed opening are rare, but greater than zero. Therefore, if open access effort with bottom contact gear targeting co-occurring species increases, it could in increase quillback rockfish mortality. Additionally, movement of the shoreward boundary RCA line may cause an effort shift from Half Moon Bay and to a lesser extent San Francisco, as fishermen from the sports may become incentivized to travel south of 3707 to take advantage of fewer regulatory constraints. The extent of this potential effort shift is unknown and only speculative at this time. If the council selects option one, and option one is moving the boundary, there is likely to be an increase in lingcod, cabazon, and other flatfish, minor nearshore and minor shelf species mortality from 36 to 3707. However, the risk of exceeding these harvest limits is low. This action would not revert the sub-trip limit of vermilion rockfish south of 4010. <laughs> Management impacts. CDFNW published commercial fishing regulations in February 2024 that geographically align the non-trawl RCA boundaries from the November 2023 in-season action. And that's the one where the shoreward boundary between 36 and 3707 was three nautical miles. If the council chooses to open the area shoreward of 50 fathoms from 36 to 3707, there would be a mismatch in state versus federal regulations that may create enforcement challenges and cause confusion among industry. Specifically, California issued emergency rulemaking north of 36, which allows commercial fishermen who hold a state-issued shallow and or deeper nearshore fishery permit to fish up to the trip limits established by the emergency action for those species authorized under each permit. A catch of these species is only authorized between the shore and the new California state 20 fathom boundary line. Groundfish species that are not authorized for retention under the nearshore fishery or deeper nearshore fishery permit may no longer take and uh, be taken and possessed in state waters north of 36. Uh, economic impacts. Fishery closures related to quillback rockfish are expected to have adverse economic impacts on California fishing communities in 2024 and are expected to continue until the stock rebuilds. Moving the shoreward boundary of the RCA to 50 fathoms would yield positive economic impacts to commercial non-trawl fishermen that fish in federal waters in that area, which would otherwise not occur without the boundary move. Fishermen who fish out of Monterey ports, ports typically rely on salmon and crab fisheries as part of their portfolio. Due to the 2023 salmon season being canceled and potentially in 2024 and shortened Dungeness crab seasons, there's been increased participation in the open access ground fish fishery. Therefore, although the area being opened is relatively small, 61 and a half square miles, this non-trawl RCA boundary movement could provide potential relief to Monterey Bay fishermen confronted with constraints and other non-ground fish fisheries. Additionally, the fishing grounds that would be open include shelf rockfish fishing locations that non-trawl fishermen relied on prior to its closure via the November 2023 action. And a few other considerations. Um, it's important to note that the potential non-trawl RCA boundary change would only lift restrictions for the commercial non-trawl sector. No changes are being brought forward for the recreational fishery at this time. The GMT is specifically focused on the commercial sector. <laughs> because this, this sector typically historically accounts for only 25% of quillback rockfish mortality, whereas the rec sector accounts for 75%. Um, so this brings us to our recommendation and uh, we made a, a recap pro con list for you here to work through. Uh, so based on the available data presented above, it appears the quillback rockfish encounters between 36 to 3707 are rare. The potential socioeconomic benefits gained from this action could outweigh the currently understood small risk to quillback rockfish, as well as the enforcement and management challenges. Therefore, the GMT recommends option one, which would move the shoreward boundary of the non-trawl RCA to 50 fathoms between 36 and 3707 north latitude, 
adopting the revised trip limits presented above subject to the gap in EC's input on the trip limit for minor nearshore rockfish in Capazon. However, we recognize that this does not come without risks and this decision is a council risk tolerance call. Um, so to recap our pros of option one, existing landings, observer and survey data indicate rare encounters of pullback rockfish in this area. It would give back 61 and a half square miles of non trawl fishing grounds beyond the three nautical mile state federal boundary line, relieving some of the negative socioeconomic impacts on fishermen across the three ports in the Monterey Bay area. It responds and listens to numerous public comments from fishermen stating that it is rare to encounter quillback rockfish in this region. And if the area, uh, if the area is open and quillback rockfish impacts increase between 36 and 3707, the council could close the area again via in season action. Uh, the cons of option one. Uh, this change would not address public comment on fishing in state waters in Monterey Bay as the council only has jurisdiction in federal waters. This change would create a mismatch in federal regulations versus state regulations that would create enforcement challenges and regulatory complexity that may confuse fishermen. Movement of the shoreward non trawl RCA boundary may cause an effort shift as fishermen from nearby northerly ports may become incentivized to travel south of 3707 to take advantage of fewer regulatory constraints. And last, low impact on quillback rockfish does not mean no impact. And due to its overfish status, ACLs are expected to be very low during the rebuilding time frame. Since quillback rockfish retention is prohibited, impacts will come from discard mortality. The lag and the availability of this data may reduce the council's ability to respond rapidly within season action. Um, and last in our report, we did provide the typical scorecards for you as an appendix. I'm not gonna go over them, uh, but if you have any questions on them, we're happy to take them. That concludes the GMT statement, and I'm here with my CDF and W friends to answer any of your questions. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Uh, questions for Lynn on the uh, GMT report? Okay. Wow, really? Not seeing anything. You did all the work for nothing. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Very good. Okay, next up is uh, Merritt McRae, uh, the Gap Report. Welcome, Merritt. Good morning, Chair Pettinger, uh, council members. I'm Merritt McRae and I'll be reading from Gap report, the gap report on agenda item F8A, supplemental gap report one, the gaps report on in season adjustments. The ground fish advisory sub panel recommends the following for in season adjustments. For, the, for California recreational fishery management, California recreational option two with a two fish vermilion sub bag limit as described in F8A supplemental CDF. And W report two for the commercial non trawl RCA option one move the shoreward boundary of the non trawl RCA between 3707 north latitude and 36 north latitude to 50 fathoms. We offer our thoughts for the Pacific Fishery Management Council to consider for the California recreational fishery California recreational members of the gap and other in industry representatives have met several times with California GMT members in the past few months. We appreciate the effort, skill, and knowledge brought to bear on modeling various recreational season structures and their projected mortality on several extremely important and constraining rockfish species off California. In particular, we wish to thank Melanie Parker and James Phillips of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. The GAP endeavored to select season structures both, both north and south of 36 north latitude that provide the greatest access to robust species while limiting the impacts to others in need of conservation. We wish to have as full access as is available for recreational anglers and the industries that support it. The GAP therefore supports and recommends to Council California Recreational Option 2 as described in Agenda F8A. Uh, supplemental CDFW and report two. Table five in that document illustrates that season structure, while table six provides the projected impacts to the constraining species relative to their 2024 harvest limits. For vermilion rockfish, a two fish sub bag limit reduces the projected impact 
to that species below the informal recreational share of 210.7 uh, metric tons with a mortality projection of 195.4 metric tons. Therefore, the gap recommends a daily sub bag limit of two fish per angler be the council's choice for waters south of 4010 North Latitude. Um, we have included in our um, written statement a copy of those two tables, tables five and table six, uh, for clarity if you'd like to look at them. We note the 50 fathom point to point lines exist in federal regulations and are available for use. And the 20 fathom point to point line now exists in California state regulation and is also available for use. Where the 20 fathom contour extends into federal waters, California's 20 fathom lines approximate the exclusive economic zone boundary between state and federal waters. In an effort to maintain consistent regulations through the northern groundfish management areas, supporting CDFW route reach and enforcement efforts, representatives from those ports in those regions made some difficult local compromise compromises for the greater good of the whole, while maintaining quillback rockfish projected mortality within the minuscule quillback limit. We note it is access to waters inshore of 20 fathoms that was the most desired of the options. That's between the 50, greater than 50 and less than 20. Regarding the season structure for 36 north latitude, for south of 36 uh, north latitude, the springtime three month period of all depth access uh, in California Rec Option 2 provides needed flexibility to find calm water fishing opportunities during typically challenging windy weather that time of year. It is critical to ensure, to the extent possible, that charter trips and private boaters have other opportunities in case one area or more is inaccessible due to weather. This time of year, crews are economically challenged after three months ashore, and getting back to full time uh, to work full time is exceedingly important. During the summer months, summer quarter, anglers are often focused on ephemeral opportunities for large inshore, inshore migratory fish like white sea bass. However, it's the backup opportunity to provide a much more dependable catch of shallow water rockfish that keeps the charter, charter fleet busy and anglers successful. Typically, calm, calmer fall weather provides the best access to offshore opportunities in deep waters. So a deep water only season works best at this time of year. In addition, during the holiday season, angler interest wanes such that the impact of unfishable weather days is less. For the commercial non-trawl RCA boundary change, the gap reviewed the numerous public comments in the council briefing book, all of which stated that quillback rockfish is very rarely encountered in the waters of Monterey Bay, California. The GMT catch analysis and agenda item F8A, supplemental GMT report one, supports those claims. The gap therefore supports liberalizing the RCA in this area to afford some additional access to shelf rockfish fishing grounds. While there may be some costs associated with this option, such as enforcement complexity, the GAP believes that the benefits afforded the fleet and fishing communities in this area outweigh those costs. Referen referencing supplemental GMT report one, the GAP recommends the following. Option one, move the shoreward boundary of the non-trawl RCA between 3707 North Latitude and 36 North Latitude to 50 fathoms, which is the shoreward boundary, which was the shoreward boundary prior to January 1, 2024. Revert modified trip limits for the below species, and that refers to a table in this um, GMT report, um, and complexes back to what they were prior to September and November 2023 in season actions, with potential exceptions for Cabazon, Vermilion rockfish, and minor and shallow and deeper nearshore rockfish. The revised trip limits for the limited entry fixed gear and open access sectors would be supported by the gap as well. Uh, and I'll note that Cabazon was um, added to con conform with the GMP GMT's recommendation, but um, after our statement went into the briefing book. So we support the GMT in that. Thank you. Thank you, Barrett. Uh, questions of the gap report caroline mcdonald 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Merritt, for the report. Um, not necessarily a question per se, but just an opportunity to thank the GAP um, and thank all the other stakeholders who have shown up both at our pre-meetings leading up to this particular meeting, but for being here all week and putting in the very challenging hard work to come to a compromise and agreement um, to make this recommendation. Um, this has been um, months in the making to get us to this point. And I just, I really appreciate that it's it's gone, I think, better than maybe we anticipated and that we're finding common ground and, and moving forward together. And I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Through the chair. Thank you very much for that acknowledgement. Um, I know this is a long statement. Thank you for listening to it. But we have constituents who are listening in and are anxious to hear us deliver this. Okay. Thank you, Caroline. Anyone else? All right. Thanks, Mayor. Okay, that takes us to the EC report and Greg Bush. Greg, welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of council. My name is Greg Bush with National Marine Fisheries Service, Office of Law Enforcement, and I'll be reading in EC report or supplemental EC report one, enforcement consultants report on in season adjustments, final action. The enforcement consultants have reviewed the documents pertaining to agenda item F8, in-season adjustments, final action, and have the following comments. The EC met with members of the ground fish management team to discuss a proposal to move the shoreward boundary of the non-trawl RCA between 3707 North and 36 North to 50 Fathoms. Moving the shoreward boundary of the non-trawl RCA to 50 Fathoms would create two small open commercial fishing areas the northern area being less than one nautical mile across in several locations, which is indicated in the graphic below. These areas are situated between the state water line where the take of ground fish is closed and the non trawl RCA where ground fish can only be taken with non bottom contact gear. DC had previously commented on the enforcement challenges associated with small management areas and recommended that the length and width of proposed areas be greater than one nautical mile to ensure they can be effectively enforced with vessel monitoring systems using the 15 minute ping rate. North of 36 North latitude, the take and possession of ground fish is prohibited in state waters, except that near shore rockfish, Cabazon and Greenling can be taken shoreward of the state defined 20 fathom line with a state issued near shore permit. For reference the 20 fathom line follows the coast approximately halfway between the coastline and the state water line between 3707 North latitude and Santa Cruz. Moving the shoreward boundary of the non-trawl non RCA to 50 fathom would create five different management zones with varying take and possession constraints within a close proximity to each other. There's less than seven miles across from the shore to the fifth management area. And in our graphic, we didn't in indicate the 20 fathom curve, but it's approximately midway between the shore and the state line. So you'd have inside of 20 fathoms, short as 20 fathoms, you'd be allowed to take and retain near shore rockfish, cabazon and greenling. Then you'd have a no fishing area. Then you'd have the new open area, then the non trawl RCA where you can fish with non bottom contact gear and then open outside of there. And we'd be monitoring those with VMS as our primarily primary external monitoring tool. State regulations prohibit the take of deeper, shallow, near shore rockfish, cabazon, and greenling shoreward, shoreward of the state 20 fathom line from taking shelf rockfish anywhere in state or federal waters. Adjusting the trip limit tables from 36 to 3707 to allow 2,000 pounds of minor shore or minor deep, shallow, near shore rockfish and unlimited cabazon would make enforcing this provision more difficult, even if the vessel had BMS. A vessel could loiter or fish inside 20 fathom, potentially taking nearshore species in state waters, then continuously transit across the, the California ground fish restriction area into federal waters and take shelf rockfish, then continue, continuously transit through state waters back to port with shelf rockfish and nearshore rockfish in possession. A vessel that fished in both state and federal waters and let in any ground fish other than the RCG complex would be in violation of state and federal law. Enforcement could not effectively use VMS as a tool to determine if a vessel fished inside of 20 fathoms. This could only be determined with on the water enforcement. To alleviate this concern, the EC recommends that minor, deeper, shallow, nearshore rockfish and cabazon trip limits remain at zero per, 
two months to avoid potential enforcement challenges. That is maintain the status quo for the trip limit tables. The, the challenge just to explain is that right now with the emergency rule that California um, issued, you can fish for nearshore rockfish inside of state waters, or you can fish for federal ground fish out in the EEZ. But you can't combine the trip and fish both in state and federal waters. If you open up federal waters to nearshore rockfish in the federal, in that area, a vessel can fish inside of state waters for near shore and can only fish in federal waters for near shore. If they keep any species other than the near shore rockfish, Cabazon and Greenling, they'd be in violation. And that becomes a, a monitoring challenge for us, as well as a compliance challenge for the, for the fishers who are fishing both in state and federal waters on the same trip. If they keep them separate, it's not as much of an issue, but a challenge for us to, to monitor if there's any loitering that takes place in state waters. The EC also reviewed F8A supplemental CDFW report two under this agenda item and met with members of the GMT to discuss the proposed alternatives and have the following comments. The EC prefers the proposed California Rec Option 3A, table seven, where the season instruction is the most consistent throughout the management areas and date ranges. Option 3A only uses three management schemes throughout the year, all depth open shore to the 20 fathom boundary line in state waters and the offshore only fishery greater than 50 fathoms. Furthermore, when comparing the proposed options, 3A was the most consistent when comparing the season structures in the central groundfish management area to the north and south of 36 north latitude, where only four months out of the nine months differed from each other. The EC has concerns with California rec options one, two, and three B due to increased complexity and enforcement challenges caused by having more depth disparities in the north and south portions of the central GMA. Furthermore, options two and three B include new depth constraints unused in previous management areas, that is less than 30 fathoms and less than 50 fathoms. These options would create a higher burden in recreational fishers to learn and understand the more complex season structures and depth constraints. Additionally, these three options result in increased potential for fishers to inadvertently be out of compliance by unlawfully or unlawfully exploit the differences within the non-conformed GMA central to north of 36 and central south of 36. Transiting. The EC would like to note in the central GMA in all four options, the taken possession of nearshore rockfish, cabazon, and greenling would be authorized in one portion of the central GMA, but those fish could not be possessed on board while transiting through the other portion of the central GMA during the months of April and November. For example, in April, nearshore rockfish could be taken during the all depth fishery in the central to south of 36 fishery, but could not be possessed on board the vessel if it transited into the central north of 36 offshore only fishery on the same trip. Multiple day fishing trip declarations. Boat owners and operators that file for a state multi-day fishing trip declaration, which allows them to retain up to three daily bag limits when fishing during a multi-day trip, will have to be aware of the challenge, the changing retention allowance in all four options. For example, in option 3A, if a vessel files for a multi-day fishing trip that starts on September 30th in the Southern GMA, takes a daily bag limit of nearshore species during the off inshore fishery, the vessel would not be able to possess that daily bag limit on October 1st, when the season structure transitions to the offshore fishery and nearshore fish species can no longer be retained. This will reduce the number of available fishing days for some vessels. This concludes the EC statement, and uh, I will attempt to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thanks, Greg. Uh, questions on the EC report? Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the report. Uh, not a question per se, but I just wanna um, extend my appreciation to the EC for carefully thinking through not just the change in the line and the opening little sliver in the map, but how that comports with the trip limits. And I just wanna recognize that I know that does make it challenge, even more challenging for enforcement when we've got now open, closed, open to some things, then open to other things, and then open to everything as you work your way from the coast out. Um, but we appreciate that flexibility and, and all the attention that you put on this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks Caroline. Anyone else?
Okay, thanks, Greg. Okay, that concludes uh, reports. That takes us to uh, public comment. We have nine. <clears throat> First up will be Glenn Merrill. Glenn? Okay. Okay. And also, um, Kristen, are you there? Are you online? Have you, have you come up the same time with, with Glenn? It's possible. Hi, yeah, this is Kristen. I'm online. Um, yep. I think I'll, okay. Glenn will be speaking right now. WC, I'll be speaking later. Thank you. All right, we'll, we'll let Glenn start it off and we'll go to you. So, Glenn, welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. Uh, my name is Glenn Merrill. I'm with Glacier Fish Company, but today I'm representing the Pacific Whiting Conservation Cooperative. I think, as you know, that is the cooperative that represents all of the participants in the CP uh, whiting sector. Just to highlight where we're at today, the council had requested in September that uh, we would uh, encourage the Pacific Whiting Conservation Cooperative and the Whiting Mothership Cooperative to develop an inner cooperative agreement that establishes uh, preseason and in-season measures that would be applicable to our cooperatives. I think the council noted that ideally the uh, inner cooperative agreement will specifically reference bycatch avoidance measures recognizing that there will be differences as well as commonalities in the approaches that are used for bycatch management for the two sectors. Uh, the council had encouraged the intercooperative agreement contain a data sharing component, as well as that we provide this update here in at the March meeting. And I think the council had noted with the hope that an agreement is in place for use in the 2024 fishing season. I think just to begin with, we've had a number of conversations uh, with uh, WMC in walking through the way that our two sectors perform, looking at various measures that could be applied within our cooperatives in an intercooperative agreement. We've had, I think, some successful uh, discussions. I think that there are a couple of things, however, that are still outstanding and perhaps additional work is required between the two sectors. I do want to highlight that I think we've gotten agreement on a few of what I would like to call overarching principles that we think are important in an inner cooperative agreement and certainly important in each of the cooperatives as they operate throughout the year. I think just to highlight in, to begin with that salmon avoidance and limiting bycatch of salmon is the top bycatch priority for the at sea whiting sectors. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone, but it's obviously something that we're very concerned about from a PWCC perspective. And I think that that's been something that we all agree with in terms of a joint agreement between the two sectors. Uh, we agree that uh, one sector should not preempt the harvest opportunity of the other sector. And again, this is my understanding of the conversations that we've had with WMC and certainly Ms. McQuaw can speak to those issues from WMC's perspective later. I think we also uh, are aware that any kind of uh, measure that we take, we should uh, avoid creating a conservation or a management problem for you at the council, for the National Marine Fisheries Service. Obviously, that's of concern for us as well. We've also highlighted the importance of effective data sharing and communication is critical to our success as a inner cooperative as well as, as cooperatives ourselves. Um, we've had a lot of discussions about the differences in the ways that the sectors, the vessels, our operations uh, manage bycatch, that there are certainly operational differences in the way that we participate in this fishery. Uh, I think we plan to continue those conversations prior to the season uh, and look to try and come to resolution on some of the specific elements uh, in our inner cooperative agreement. We certainly will discuss our fishing plans prior to the start of the fishing season as well, so that all parties are, are aware of those issues. Um, I think that's really where we're at right now. We're continuing to make progress, continuing to have conversations. I do want to take a moment, however, to highlight that regardless of our status with our intercooperative agreement and where we are with those specific measures, certainly from PWCC's perspective, we understand the importance of looking at our performance, particularly in 2023, and improving on that performance moving forward for this year. I think we all recognize that the spring in particular was a challenge. Our performance improved substantially throughout the year. I think there was a very, very unprecedented um, series of bycatch issues that presented itself to us in the spring. Those were unanticipated and certainly outside of our previous experience. We've learned a lot from those experiences, and that will certainly be guiding PWCC as we look forward 
to this coming year and our in-season agreements that we establish internally within a cooperative. And again, we are committed to continuing to work with WMC to try and work together for an inter-cooperative agreement. Uh, that's the summary of where we're at right now. Okay, thanks Glenn. We're gonna to go to Kristen and then have questions uh, afterwards. So Kristen. Hello, good morning. Um, just checking my audio. Can you hear me all right? We can. Great, thank you. <clears throat> well, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, my name is Kristen McQuaw and I'll be providing the following status update on behalf of the Whiting Mothership Cooperative. Um, after hearing reports from the individual Whiting Cooperatives last September, the council encouraged the ASI sectors to develop an intercooperative agreement one that would establish measures to minimize incidental catch of set aside and salmon species. The council motion also requested an update on our progress at the March meeting, hence uh, my comment here today. Over the winter months, the Mothership Cooperative has worked diligently towards forming an intercooperative agreement with our ASCII colleagues. Uh, WMC wrote and proposed an initial draft agreement and has met several times both internally and jointly with PWCC. We have made progress towards an agreement as the co-ops identified several unifying objectives to build upon. We have also agreed upon improved communication such as pre and post season meetings and communication checkpoints throughout the season. Um, however, the cooperatives are still negotiating as we work towards identifying mitigation measures that are effective while recognizing each sector's operational differences. Uh, we will work uh, we will continue to work earnestly with PWCC towards establishing an intercooperative agreement. And I'd like to say thank you to the council for your support in this process. Okay, thanks, Kristen. All right, so uh, questions for uh, Glenn or Kristen, council members? Jill Anderson. Um, thank you. Thanks very much you know, to you both for your um, follow up and your report and your efforts to reach a, an agreement. Um, I'm wondering uh, in terms of the, I know we were, we had talked a bit about in um, trying to increase the kind of what I'll call real time communication such that if there were bycatch events in one, one sector versus the other, that there was, um, I'll call it immediate and timely communication um, to help inform and avoid a second vessel going into an area that it had a, a high bycatch event. I'm, I wondered if you could uh, give me a sense of, of how your discussions have gone relative to trying to achieve an agreement that includes that type of real-time communication. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know uh, if Kristen wants to go first or if I should go first, but uh, I can take a crack and then perhaps if Kristen wants to fill in. I think we're I think we're having effective conversations on those types of protocols, you know, what communication looks like on the grounds. I'll note that we already have uh, what I believe is fairly effective uh, data sharing agreements, and I think those can be made more robust as we continue our discussions. In terms of very specific details about how exactly that communication um, should be undertaken, I think that's still something that's under discussion. Okay, Kristen. Is yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, um, through the chair, Mr. Anderson. Thanks for your question. A um, little bit of a dance here. This I don't think was intended to be a joint presentation or joint comment, but. Um, we're kind of going with it here. Um, as far as the communication piece, I think the mothership cooperative has always, um, you know, practiced, you know, kind of, you know, communicating lightning strikes or chronic bycatch. Because there's a difference between a lightning strike or just, you know, genuinely accumulating bycatch um, throughout the season. Um, and we've always made it a top priority to communicate that with, um, you know, PWCC, the Shore Base Whiting Cooperative, um, NOAA, and uh, council staff when needed. Um, and I think in our 
as far as the inner cooperative agreement, we're still working towards those details. Um, but I think the increased communication between the sectors is a top priority. Um, and, you know, with maybe some preseason, you know, meetings, letting our skippers talk um, about different fishing grounds and uh, what they see. Um, but we're still, <laughs> I guess the details of our agreement are, are still being worked through. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Phil? Well, well I can wait for Mr. Smith. Wait. Um, how would you each characterize the level of priority you're placing on reaching um, an intercooperative agreement prior to the start of the 2024 season? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Anderson to the chair. It's certainly a priority for us. I think there's a question about you know what what the scope of the agreement will be. And I think the PWCC perspective has been, uh, I think that there are a number of things that I think I tried to highlight in terms of overarching principles. I think there are a number of things in terms of data sharing agreements um, where I believe that we are very, very close or if, if not very, very close, actually in agreement on a number of those issues. I think we can reach agreement on those issues. I'm hopeful we can reach agreement on those issues. I think there are perhaps differing perspectives on vessel operations or uh, bycatch provisions, and that may take some time for us to resolve. So I think there are probably a couple of approaches here. One is agree to what you can agree to and move forward with that portion of the agreement and continue to work on the other issues, um, or try to seek a more comprehensive agreement at one time. Um, those are probably two different approaches to things. Okay. Well, Chris, do you have anything to add? If not, I'll put you guys' hand up. So. Uh, yeah, Mr. Uh, <laughs> through the chair, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Um, if I can just, your question was how are each, each sectors um, both prioritized achieving an agreement um, prior to the 2024 season, is that correct? Yes, I wanted to get a sense of the level of priority that each sector is placing on getting an agreement uh, prior to the start of the 2024 season. I appreciate the work that's been done up to this point in time. The start of the 2024 season isn't that far off. Uh, it sounds like you have a ways to go um, to get to that point. Uh, and if you're putting, I'm just trying to get a sense of, is if this is a, a high priority for each sector to try to achieve that objective. Through the chair. Yes, thank you, Mr. Anderson. I appreciate the clarification. Um, yeah, the Mothership Cooperative is, uh, you know, it is a priority for us to see a, a Inter cooperative agreement through. Uh, we've had a lot of both internal meetings, um, joint meetings, uh, a lot of drafting sessions. So they said the Mothership Cooperative put together a draft, an initial draft, you know, agreement and language. And, you know, we've been working uh, earnestly with PWCC to refine that. You know, I think we've got agreement on a lot of these overarching. Um, uh, objectives, um, but you know, it's really right now what we're teasing apart is the mechanics um, uh, of how we can achieve those objectives. But for the Mothership Cooperative, um, you know, it certainly is a priority. I think we'll have several more meetings, at least um, with the Mothership Co-op here before the start of the season um, of how we kind of move this agreement, you know, along. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Then thank you. And so thank you for your testimony. Um, I mean, I, I got to admit, most of this road's been paved five, six, seven years ago when we all sat down in the room together and, and worked this out. And I'm, uh, I, I'm a guy who purposely didn't want to learn the sectors, so I didn't have any one favorite sector over the other so so um but but i i know um when some of us sat 
down together when we were uh, on sub panels when we had a pretty good thing worked out and and I remember getting all kinds of calls when hot spots would happen. Not not that you have to call me anymore, but 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 I was a salmon uh, chairman back there of the SAS. But um, you know, Brad Brad, Brad uh, Chairman Brad was in on that, and 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 a lot of us sat in a room. So I know there's a plan of attack somewhere on a on a shelf, and 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 I and I know it worked very well until. Um, We'll just call it the light lightning strike or oops or whatever you want to call it. I'm not putting any, I'm not, I'm not certainly not meaning to point any fingers, but but I know it's um, it was a little bit tough getting there, <laughs> but but we did once uh, once we knew we had uh, common ground and we and we decided and we wanted to work together and and help everybody. So I know it's out there somewhere. Um, there is a roadmap. And it worked pretty good for quite a while. And, and uh, um, I, I guess that you're working with the different sectors, I would assume. Uh, um, but I'm, I'm sure it's, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say, it's not like we're trying to reinvent the wheel here because we've already, we've already uh, said pave, pave the road most of the way. Maybe there's just a, a pothole that we didn't see and we can fix her up and get going again. But I appreciate you coming here and I appreciate you uh, filling us in what, what, how to make it, how you guys plan to make it better or trying to make it better. So um, anyway, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you much. Bob Dooley and then uh, Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks Glenn and Kristen for coming forward with the, the report. Um, I guess from my perspective, there was a, a desire from the council at the last time we addressed this to, to have some uh, confidence that this inner cooperative agreement would be developed prior to the, the start of the next season. And I appreciate this update, but I, I reflecting on Mr. Anderson's comment and, and, and question about um, how much of a priority is this? And I didn't hear that uh, there was a hard deadline in your minds to get something to this council to give us confidence that no, what happened last year won't happen again and what measures will be taken. And I re related specifically to an inner cooperative agreement. Um, I think you all know that I'm part and parcel of a lot of those agreements when they were developed in the original time. And I think uh, particularly the mothership co-op, because I'm most familiar with that, was uh, very, very thorough and I can continues to be. Not saying that the, the, uh, the approach the CP sector is taking is, is not, I'm saying, uh, but as we meld the two together to an inner cooperative agreement to give the council uh, confidence that this as was warranted earlier, that the cooperative structure can do things that the council can't in controlling bycatch, particularly of concerned species. And I think you've been here a long, uh, long enough this week to hear that I'll use uh, George Bradshaw's um, comment that we're, uh, for many sectors, we're an extinction event. And I heard that and I'm emotional about it a bit because I feel it. I feel it with those other sectors. So understand the concern of the council, understand the concern of, um, of the other sectors, understand that people are, you know, this, this is a serious issue and I know you do. And I know you do and I know I'm speaking to the choir here a bit. But I think a priority needs to be made to come back in April with a completed agreement that gives this council um, confidence that the intercooperative agreement will give us confidence that um, bycatch will be down to the extent practicable. I guess that's the, the proper word. And, and I think, you know, understanding 
it's, I understand all the ins and outs of it, been doing it many, many years, but I think that message has got to be, got to be here. And um, um, I can't emphasize that anymore. So that's my opinion on that. And I think it reflects the opinion of many sitting around the table here. So um, appreciate the work that's going so far, but I would, I would suggest that we're at a deadline that we, that there is an imminent deadline. So uh, thank you. Thanks for that, Bob. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I may yep, respond please. to that. Yep. I, I think, thank you very much. And I really appreciate those comments, Mr. Dooley. I think one of the things that's of key importance to us in the PWCC, and again, just speaking from our perspective, is that performance is what matters. How do we do in terms of our performance for bycatch issues? And particularly, I think Chinook salmon is obviously something of great, great concern to this council. It's great concern for us in PWCC. I just want to highlight, it's also a very significant concern for the company that I represent. We're owned by 15 communities, uh, 8,500 residents in Western Alaska, mostly Alaska natives. Understanding Chinook salmon, Chinook salmon bycatch, it's important to the people of Alaska, importance that it has here on the West Coast is something that we're very aware of. So bycatch management is important. Bycatch performance is important for us as well. It's important for us as a sector. It's important for us as a company. I think one of the things that we're doing as a PWCC cooperative is, is two, two pronged approach here. One is the approach that the council had requested that we work together with WMC on the intercooperative agreement issues, but it's also to learn from what happened in 2023 in the spring, which again was an unprecedented event in terms of Chinook salmon bycatch, and incorporate measures within our intercooperative agreement to the extent we can, or certainly within our PWCC agreement in terms of providing us with a better opportunity to be more responsive to bycatch that we observe in the grounds and in a real time fashion that improves our performance relative to 2023. We understand that, we hear that, that's something that we plan to incorporate within our cooperative. And I think I'm hopeful that we can come to agreement on some issues, perhaps before the season with the understanding that any intercooperative agreement, when we get into some of those very fine scale details, might take a while for us to resolve. But I think we are committed and we are prioritizing that as something for a PWCC perspective. So thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Glenn, for being here and Kristen for being here virtually. Um, I just want to follow up a little bit about actually what you were just talking about, about this performance criteria and learning from 2023. Um, obviously, at this meeting, we're also thinking about salmon, and especially for those of us in California, we're keenly aware of what's going on and the importance of every single fish. Um, so I was hoping you'd be able to provide a few more details about how things are going to be done differently, what sort of changes to get that performance you're actually discussing and, and thinking about. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the question. I, I think there's probably a couple of things we're looking at. I think one of the things that um, from a PWCC perspective that we found helpful was to better understand the way that the fleet operates uh, during conditions where you might have Chinook salmon more prevalent, so particularly during the night. Um, what do those, what measures might make sense based on data that we have from our fishery that we could incorporate in order to try and minimize uh, Chinook salmon bycatch? I think one of the other challenges that we found this year, and I think this is something where we require good coordination with both the council and the National Marine Fishery Service, is that at times if you're moving out of situations where you might have a higher encounter rate with Chinook salmon. It can push you into situations where you might have encounter rates of certain rockfish that are higher. I think dark blotch rockfish was problematic somewhat in this last spring. And then I think also uh, sablefish was somewhat problematic. So understanding those dynamics and understanding the trade-offs that exist between those species and coordinating that closely with the Council and National Marine Fishery Service will be important for us as we look at this season moving forward. Um, and I think also we certainly understand the importance of having the fleet be very aware quickly about what measures uh, may need to be taken. I think one of the things that we did establish in this uh, spring fishery 
what were closure areas that were applicable based on some of the bycatch um, sort of hotspot management, if you will, for our fleet that we think proved to be effective with the understanding that you also have to have enough data to know as salmon move, as whiting moves, that you're able to responsibly adapt those measures as you see changing conditions on the grounds. So I think those were two big lessons that we learned from this um, spring fishery that are certainly the things that will help to inform our um, PWCC agreement as we begin the fishery. Um, Kristen, I see, I apologize for not allowing you to uh, respond to Bob, but do you have something for Corey, uh, but also Bob? So. Uh, we have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you guys uh, dancing between the in-person remote uh, <laughs> reports here. So thank you. Um, I guess uh, maybe a, a general response to both. Um, you know, I think we've I've come before you several times before um, and discussed, um, you know, the Whiting Mothership Cooperative. And really since it was formed, you know, back in 2011, um, it's successfully operated under both a membership and bycatch agreement, both of which um, lay out in, in pretty extensive detail um, some carefully developed um, and established bycatch mitigation tools. Um, we have always been very transparent about these tools, um, and we have a proven track record to show um, their effectiveness, um, particularly when it comes to Chinook bycatch uh, avoidance. You know, a, a quick summary, you know, we sit down and have preseason um, closures. We have, uh, you know, night and depth restrictions. Um, we require the use of salmon excluders 100% of the time. And we also um, have, you know, shown, you know, time and time again, our ability to, you know, analyze data in real time and then respond um, you know within 24 hours and whether we need to you know, close a hot spot um, or you know respond you know what's, what's the most appropriate um, you know we also have movement triggers i think last year um, you know for chinook we moved 25 times you know individual motherships um, moved 25 times with their uh, associated catcher vessels um, you know, that's also, you know, not to mention the amount of times we moved for, you know, the set aside species. Um, you know, I think we prioritize, you know, you know, anything that's <laughs> avoiding anything that's not whiting really, you know, that's where we're, we're looking right now. And of course, um, Chinook salmon is, uh, kind of the front of our minds here. Um, and so those will continue, um, you know, we remain committed to that moving forward and our, you know, I think we pride ourselves in our communication, both internally with our fleet and then, um, you know, with, like I said before, with PWCC and with the shore-based cooperative and um, all of our fishery managers, um, you know, reaching an agreement is also a, a top priority. Um, it is, you know, we've had, uh, our membership, it is, uh, you know, this is why we've, you know, we're continuing to, uh, you know, meet with PWCC and look back and, and refine the agreement, refine the language, see what works, you know, what un try to understand each other's operations better. Um, you know, if we don't have uh, sufficient provisions in place, it, it makes it hard to sign on to an agreement. And so we're, um, you know, from the mothership perspective, we will do you know all we can to to find a way to come up with an agreement um, that is both effective, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, I guess reasonable for everyone. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Kristen. Anyone else? Okay, thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Kristen. Um, we've been out for almost. Two hours. Do we want to take a short break right now, and then uh, either either finish the public testimony um, before we break, um, or um, we want to break down here regardless? I would assume. So it's been a long time. Which would you guys take? Yes. We want to power through public testimony. Break.
Okay, I'm here a break. Okay, quick break. Um, be back here at uh, 11.45. Just trying to... <clears throat> Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. Okay, uh, please take your seats. I'm here, I'm here. Okay. <clears throat> nope. Don't make me use the gavel. <laughs> All righty, we're back to uh, uh, public comment. And uh, I'll turn to uh, Jamie Diamond. Jamie, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Pettinger, Vice Chair Hasmer, Council members and staff. I'm Jamie Diamond, Regional Vice President for the Sport Fishing Association of California. The Sport Fishing Association of California is a nonprofit organization representing the majority of family owned sport fishing boat operators serving recreational anglers in Southern California. We want to thank the California Department of Fish and Wildlife staff for their overwinter modeling work and pre council check ins affording our vessel owners and captains the opportunity, opportunity to provide input on season structure and sub bag limits. We support the GAP recreational in season adjustment recommendation, California recreational option two with a two fish per million sub bag limit as described in F8A supplemental CDFW report two and offer the following voice of my fleet. <laughs> In April, May, and June, all depth access is imperative as it allows the fleet flexibility to work with dynamic conditions and give them the widest range of territory to fish. And this is in regards to the Southern management area. Uh, this will help us ensure trips are not canceled due to weather. For our crews after an extended layoff over winter, it's imperative we have every option available in terms of territory and shelter from weather to ensure our livelihoods. Springtime in the East and West Channel, Santa Barbara Channel, can present some of the, the most challenging weather conditions our fleet faces. Allowing the fleet access to deep waters only could be disastrous, even in not allowing the fleet access to deep waters could be, oh, sorry, allowing the fleet access to deep waters only could be disastrous even in the best of weather years. It could be the undoing of ground fish dependent CPFV fleet and the public access it provides. 
July, August, and September is a perfect fit for the less than 50 season, the near shore season, as the fleet from Orange County North has island game fish opportunities and can survive on ground fish to supplement a day's effort and catch while working in the shallow waters. October, November, and December with favorable weather conditions in the Southern California Bight is the only choice to place boats in a deep water only model. Further, as angler participation slows during the holiday season, there'll be less adverse impact during those days when unfavorable, unfishable conditions present themselves over the deeper waters of the Bight and Southern Cal Central Coast. Weather is a driving factor here, and those of us who must contend with these conditions to make a living season after season understand the strategy proposed. We are disappointed the Vermilion ACL is so low, given the abundance we observe on the water. The Sport Fishing Association of California would like to highlight the need uh, for real-time in-season recreational catch monitoring. This would provide us the opportunity to throttle back on species we may be approaching, on recreational limits to avoid overfishing. We believe the SAC fleet has proven our ability to implement highly effective voluntary precautionary management measures. We've done this in the past for sheephead and continue to do this for copper rockfish. SAC is continuing our collaborative sampling project with Melissa Monk and Rachel Brooks at the Southwest Science Center Moss Landing. Merritt McRae is our SAC lead and expanding all the way up the California coast to Crescent City. The goal of the project is to create a continual collection of needed rockfish data, age, length, sex, fecundity, health, and more, building a robust data source to better inform stock assessments in the future. The Sport Fishing Association of California reiterates our commitment to fisheries management, and we appreciate your time. I'm available for questions. Thank you. All right, Jamie. Uh, questions for Jamie on her testimony? <coughs> I don't see anything. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. All right. Next up is Wayne Koto. Wayne, welcome. Good morning, Chair Pettinger, Vice Chair, Council Members, and Staff. Wayne Koto with Coastal Conservation Association of California, representing the recreational anglers. We'd like to thank CDFW, GMT, and the GAP for reaching out and, and the offer to do the scenarios to help fix last year's unintended consequences of our management actions. While we can always debate on how we got here, it's irrelevant now. Unfortunately, we can't win. No matter what decisions we make, someone's going to lose and they're going to be upset. We have to choose the least worst of, the, of what is being proposed. We need to stop the unnecessary or the reactionary management practices and blaming anglers for going over harvest guidelines while they're staying within the regulations set for them. We look for opportunities to enjoy our favorite sport of fishing. As a normal recreational angler, they have no idea what goes on behind the scenes to balance conservation and management. They're frustrated and don't understand why the claims being made don't match with the reality they're seeing on the water. National standards were developed for a reason, but are clearly not equal in application or deliberation. We don't get this, if we don't get this right soon, it won't matter as communities and industries will fail. The efforts will shift elsewhere and not return. From the commercial perspective, it's just getting too hard and not profitable. Frustration is turning into desperation. From the recreational perspective, the fun is, is being removed. We all need to do better. Recreational anglers spend $3.4 billion in fishing in California. There's nothing we can do to change the decision that's going to have to be made today, but we are trying to be proactive in, our, in fixing the issues plaguing our current practices, procedures, methodologies, and modeling. We have initiated the use of descending devices for California. We're finding alternate ways to help collect missing data like age spawning certain species for certain species with our partners. We're working to allocate more money to help with scientific data needs. We are educating the public on how this complex and the whole process is and why they need to help. We all need to find choke points that are hindering our efforts for success. Setting the right priorities are going to have to be the largest, that have the largest benefits are always extremely important. Let's be careful of more unintended consequences from more restricted fishing access. As we limit access and bag limits, the effort will shift somewhere else 
And we will uh, be in the same scenario again, just with a different species. How do we help you to help us? We've been saying that theme for the last few years now, and it's even more important now than ever. While we're not happy, we agree with the GAP proposal to accept the California rec uh, recommendation option two, which includes the decreased bag limit for Vermillion. Again, we thank CDFW, GMT, and the GAP and staff for their work on our behalf, and we look forward to increased communications and improvement efforts going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Questions for Wayne on his comment, uh, commentary? Okay, thanks, Wayne. Next up is uh, Joe uh, Villarreal. Joe, are you there? I see you're unmu unmuted. Joe? Okay, let's come back to Joe. Uh, we'll do Melissa Mahoney next. Melissa? Is Melissa there? I don't see her. Is he? Okay. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. All right. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chair Pettinger. I'm, I apologize. I am not there with you this morning. I had to come back last night, so I'm appreciating the remote entry. Uh, I am... Let's see, I am. Uh, I submitted a a letter to you all a couple of weeks ago on this agenda item, and uh, sorry, let me go back and introduce myself. My name is Melissa Mahoney. I'm the executive director of the Monterey Bay Fisheries Trust. We are a nonprofit organization working in the Monterey Bay area to make sure we have local seafood on local plates. We work with uh, all the commer commercial sectors, uh, and we are also a quota shareholder in the Trawl IFQ program. So at the request of fishermen in our region, I submitted a letter to you back a couple weeks ago to impress upon the council uh, what you now know, what you've been hearing all week is a very serious economic challenge situation going on with our fishing fleet. And I use the analogy of the three-legged stool um, in my letter. And again, you've been hearing this all week that without salmon, with very little crab, and now with the closure of nearshore access in state waters, it's just getting to the point where a lot of fishermen are not sure they're going to be able to make it through. So uh, I had made some requests in the letter and um, very happy to see that uh, the primary request was uh, responded to by the ground fish management team and the gap. And so I wanted to just express uh, appreciation and support for uh, what's in the GMT report. Um, really appreciate their data analysis showing that commercial quillback encounters are very rare between 36 degrees and 37, seven degrees north latitude. And that that led to their recommendation to move the shoreward boundary of the non trawl RCA in that area to 50 fathoms. That would give the fishermen in our area a little bit more room. It would give them about 61 square miles of fishing opportunity, just like they had last fall before this started. It still doesn't offer the relief in state waters for open access vessels, um, but I understand that this federal change will support future consideration at the state level to change the emergency rule in Monterey Bay state waters that is currently in place through about mid-August. And I want to uh, express appreciation to uh, CDFNW staff and the GMT for taking into special consideration the Monterey Bay area because because of the state waters line, there is so much area that fishermen have to transit to get out to federal waters. And so they gave us the time uh, this week at the council meeting to really walk, walk through that challenge and um, 
even though it is still it is going to be complicated for a little while because this potential action in front of you could have uh, it could there could be a difference between the state and federal uh, management for a while and that can be tricky for for the enforcement and for the fleet to make sure they are following the rules but this is where we are and this is kind of a step-by-step -step process to get back a little bit of area so really appreciate everyone for hearing uh, and considering what the the fleet needs and to look at the data and to see that okay we can we have low enough risk of cool back we can we can make this effort um, a couple other requests that were in the letter that I, I wanted to just touch on. Um, I had asked for uh, we support the documentation of eco any economic impacts of the nearshore and other closures on our fishing communities. And I'm, I'm really not sure what stage the Science Center is in, in continuing to document uh, economic impacts, but I just wanted to touch on that as I, I think a very necessary and needed data component for the council to be considering uh, really up and up and down the coast uh, to document the economic impacts that are happening in our federal fisheries. I also saw uh, that under agenda item F3, there uh, it looks like the quillback benchmark assessment will be prioritized and so I'm appreciating that as a request here and uh, I wanted to just express support for any efforts to involve fishermen in data collection. And for, I, I know that this is this is already happening uh, with specific projects, but just in general, that fishermen are really our research partners for better assessing life history research gaps across many species of concern, especially those that we heard about just in the last agenda item. Uh, stocks that are coming up as concern and more and more data collection and better understanding life history and biology and abundance and distribution from those who are on the water is going to be even more important. I think this is one area where we can all get a little better in time. So in closing, I have a couple other pieces here forgive me i lost my space uh oh, back to the um to the the change for uh the 36 to 37 for the rca line i would like to offer our support for cdf and w enforcement in a way that we could help you all do outreach and education in our area because i do see that these rules are going to be tricky both for in, uh, enforcement for you all and for the fleet to fully under understand these rules and to make sure that they can avoid unnecessary violations through some kind of proactive education of the fleet we'd we'd be willing to help you with that at the ground level and lastly, I wanted to encourage the council to support all the opportunities they can to use uh, for fishermen to be using the midwater gear in open access fisheries, since those gears do not interact with the bottom tending species. And that will allow more opportunities for targeting, targeting midwater since lingcod and vermilion open access is, is closed. So, um, again, I know that's kind of a state water federal issue, um, but I, I did want to put out support for those, those 12 E gears, as you call them, um, that were mentioned as part of the, um, the November federal register notice, um, that those are really good gears, uh, even for state waters usage and um, should be allowed as much as possible to help uh, fishermen capitalize on the midwater species while they can't get access to the bottom. That concludes my comments. And uh, again, just expressing deep gratitude to the council and everyone there. It was great to see you all uh, for the short time I was there. And um, thank you for all the work you do. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Melissa. Um, questions for Melissa on her testimony? Bob Dooley. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Melissa, for coming forward. I just uh, wanted to ask you, you know, <clears throat> some folks are looking at this opener between 36 and the, moving the line to 37.11 or 37.7 is such a small area. And I, I just, uh, maybe you could speak to the importance to that in relation to available options to the local fleet there and how how critical it is to their to them and I just you know it's um, it's so it I know it but I think the council needs to hear it and I think it's it's and we've heard it all week but I from your perspective in your seat being you know just uh, at the at the trust and being so supportive of fisheries and and um, public's access to to uh, local fish and trying to restart an, an, an area that's been so depressed and in the light of salmon closures and crab delays and all of those and how important this small sliver area at least until August is to our local community there. So uh, I'll stop there, but if you could speak to that a little bit. Chair Pettinger and uh, Mr. Dooley, thank you for the question. Um, so over, over the week, I have been trying to uh, put feelers out to try and quantify, you know, how many boats have been affected by the near shore closure. And it's been a little tricky to come up with numbers, but I, I've had a few uh, fishermen uh, from each of the ports try and give uh, an understanding of sort of how many boats are affected. Uh, the, the largest number that I was given um, from a buyer in the area said that he thinks there's a somewhere around 120 small boats in the area that he buys from in a year. And of those 120 boats, obviously some of them have near shore permits. And so they are going to still be allowed to fish inside 20 fathoms. Some of those guys are halibut and we know that California halibut is not part of this. And, and so that, that cuts away. I wasn't able to get him to uh, peel away of those 120 boats, how many are just open access in state waters, because as I understand it, that is, that is the biggest hit here is that the the small boats that just fish open access that that don't have vms that don't have the safety to go as far out to federal waters which in as you know by looking at the map in monterey bay it's quite a bit farther to get to federal waters because of the line going across the bay so we can assume that there are many many boats that are caught in that uh, in that closure, um, to get a little more granular, um, I, I have heard from, from a fisherman in Moss Landing that there are at least six boats there that fish uh, more than half of their time inside state waters. And he thinks that, that the catch of those six boats has been reduced overall by at least 25% across the fleet. So that's 25% less fish coming into Moss Landing, which is already very, there's very little uh, hook and line, you know, small boat fish coming through. And for those six boats, 50% of their time is, is currently gone and they're trying to figure out, well, okay, can I get VMS and can I go 14 miles out? Um, that's where the, that's how far they have to steam out in, out of Moss Landing to get to federal waters. So that's really been hard for those six boats. And then my information from the Monterey area is that there's maybe about 10 or so of the open access vessels there. Uh, they don't, you know, they can go a little bit south and out. So they're not, they're not having to steam as many miles out to federal waters, but these are uh, either very new entrants who have, who need a low economic, low cost bar of entry, or they are, kind of nearing retirement. And so for them, the thought of having to go get VMS and go do all of the, the federal, the pieces to be able to fish in federal waters, it's just not something that, that works for them. So 
I know I've given you a smattering of numbers to quantify, and I wish I had a, you know, a more solid and accurate number, but I, I hope that I've given you a sense from the information I gained that we have a lot of small boats in our area that are being hampered by the situation. And on top of having no salmon, on top of having the sixth year in a row of a very constrained crab season, not being able to, to target black cod now, not being able to target ling cod. Um, it's just, it's, it's really, really tough. And so this, this give back of the sliver of the non-trawl non RCA to 50 fathoms, I think it's going to help some of the boats that do have VMS that, that can, uh, they can fish in that area. Um, but they still, they won't be able to use the midwater gear in state waters and, the, the guys that have to wait for some opening for the state waters will need to wait till August. Uh, and I'm hopeful that this, if, if you all take action at this meeting to move forward with the GMT recommendation, that's going to pave the way for the state to consider uh, possibly moving their rules, changing their line. And, and that's really what we're looking for here in terms of relief. Um, so, uh, thank you for indulging the, my lengthy answer, and I, I hope that helps. It does. Thanks, Melissa. Okay, thanks, Bob. Further questions from Melissa? All right. Next up is Daniel Lee. Daniel? You're muted. There you go. Hi, my name is Daniel Lee. I'm a commercial fisherman out of Half Moon Bay, California. Uh, since salmon closed last year and into this year, I've mainly been focusing on troll caught rockfish. Um, and I've spent quite a bit of time fishing rockfish historically uh, in Eureka, Fort Bragg, would be a long line. Um, since I moved down here, we've really not encountered many quillback. I think it's pretty obvious the data that were to be looked at. I was talking with the observer. He was on my boat yesterday and he said that he's personally observed only five in this region. Um, furthermore, that sliver you guys are talking about is actually pretty important to me. I go down there quite a bit and troll with non-bottom contact gear uh, as last year, as since the closure. And I mean, even yesterday when I was trolling, we encountered a few link cod uh, that had to be release that would have been worth a few hundred dollars to me. Um, we encountered some blue rockfish that had to release and got fed to the seagulls because they were blown up. Uh, they were caught too deep. I have a deeper near shore permit. I would have legally been able to take that fish last year. And obviously there was no interactions with the back. And that was just yesterday. Um, I plan on fishing two to three times a week. Um, you can extrapolate that further and really understand the economic harms that it's causing me personally. Um, by moving that line forward and up to the 37.7, it would help alleviate some of that. And I understand there's an enforcement issue. I understand there's a couple hurdles. But if you want to look at the bigger picture, I mean, this is our livelihood. This is what we have to deal with. And right now we're actually doing a dock sale. We're currently dock sailing rockfish that were caught with non-bottom contact here. And it's it's hard. We have people asking us today, uh, when will you have Lincoln? Is Lincoln going to be available? No, sorry, it's closed. We'd have to go outside 75 fathoms, which isn't economically viable for us as we have to run twice the distance. Um, I would urge the council to consider the humanitarian costs of any action they take, as well as the economic costs. You're depriving people of their food. You're depriving me of opportunity. And there's fish there to catch with no interaction with pullback rockfish. And I, I would strongly recommend that the council follows the data. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, questions for Daniel on his testimony? Okay, see none. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, next up is Julia Baker. Julia? Uh, Julia's not there. Okay, David uh, Toriyumi, David? You're, there you go. David? 
you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. <clears throat> okay, let's uh, let's go to Joe uh, Little Real. See if he's available. I know he's on. Uh, he's at sea with the um, Starlink system, I think. So, um, is Joe there? Is it working now? We we got you. Welcome. Hey. Hey, good morning, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, to speak. I am uh, Joe Villarreal. I own a commercial passenger fishing vessel out of Channel Islands Harbor for the last 30 years. I'd like to support the gaps and the they support the gap statement and the in season changes south of 36. I'd like to thank the process in the state for yet again breathing life into the communities by making the best of a bad situation. But I'd also like to say that this, this Vermilion crisis that we're going through is very troubling to me. I've, er, I've owned the boat for 30 years. I lived the Calcod, Boccaccio, you know, Canary, Yellow Eye crisis. <clears throat> we gave a lot of blood <laughs> Our families endured a lot to, to make it through that. And I'm having a really hard time with a, finding such constraining management measures to my business on a species that we've had decades of conservation on, whether it be to geographical CCA, RCA, MPAs, season structures. We have a assessment that brings the that brings you know above the target, and we have a a twenty year time series of of with a, with a Southern California bite hook and line survey that suggests a sustainable abundance, but yet we're being restricted by such a low harvest limit. And I just like to say that you know that's after all we've given to be at this point. It's really hard to take. And, and lastly, I'd like to say, it, I would hope that the council would do everything in its power to promote more funding to the science centers so that they can do the prop, you know, so they, they can do robust assessments and collect data. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Joe, questions for Joe and his testimony? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Thank you, Joe. Uh, next, we have uh, David uh, Toriumi. Hope I got that name right. David, are you there now? You're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Now you're muted. Okay. <laughs> we still can't hear you. Okay. <clears throat> I can't. So is he gone? I'm trying to the hell out there. What's that? Okay. All right, we we can't get him, uh, David, on here, so uh, we'll have to. That'll be in the public comment. So, oh, oh, is Julia Banger back on. Oh, Julia. Hello. Can, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can, but you got an echo, so you might have two two uh, microphones open. All right. Is that better? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm also a commercial fisherman. Uh, I actually work for Danny Lee. I'm a deckhand on his boat. So um, I wanted to add my comment that I also support moving the line. Um, the same things that he said affect me as well. This would add value for me as a commercial fisherman fishing on his boat. Um, there are a lot of fish that we catch that we just can't sell. So that that affects us both economically. It affects the community. They ask us for the blue rockfish, for the lingcod. And um, 
we would be able to catch those fish without encountering any of the quillbacks that we're worried about. So um, that's that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you Julia. Questions for Julia on her, on her testimony? Okay, we'll sit in here, any hands? Okay, and then uh, is David still there? But I, I he has a he has a microphone issue. It seems like so. Okay, that's, that takes us to uh, public or council action, and uh, I think we're going to finish that up. We do have a salmon right after lunch, so I hear we have a motion of ready lease from California. So I'd like to maybe finish this up before we break for lunch. So I'll open the floor for council discussion. Or motion. Oh, Lynn Mattis. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's not a motion. I just wanted to call your call our attention to um, the appendix in the GMT report. They did provide scorecards. Uh, on where we ended 2023 for Chinook salmon, spiny dogfish, short belly, and three building species. And uh, we were in good shape on all of those. So uh, just as a little summary of last year, we ended up well within our limits on those species we've been tracking. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Hey, was it Caroline? Hey, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess just um, for the interest of time here, I, I will offer out a motion unless there's other comments to get us going. Seeing no hands, I would say it's yes. Okay. Thank you. I move the council adopt the in-season changes for the California recreational fishery under option two with a two fish per million sub bag limit from agenda item F8A, Supplemental Gap Report 1, March 2024, except for the months where the fishery operates shallower than 20 fathoms. During those times, federal waters will be closed. And from agenda item F8A, Supplemental GMT Report 1, March 2024, option one for the commercial non-trawl RC boundary change and revised trip limits as followed for LEFG, OA lean cod, LEFG OA other flatfish, LEFG OA minor shelf rockfish, and sub option as follows for LEFG OA minor deeper nearshore rockfish status quo, the LEFG and OA minor shallow nearshore rockfish status quo, and for LEFG and OA cabazon status quo. Okay, is the language on the screen accurate? It is. Looking for a second. Second by Mark Grelnick. Thank you, Mark. Please speak to your motion as appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just gonna address, I guess, upfront the, the the rationale for this motion. Obviously, is to keep our our most constraining species of rockfish, which would be quillback rockfish in the north, and vermilion and copper in the south, um, within their harvest limits. Um, and that sounds really easy, but this has been a major reconstruction of our entire statewide recreational fishery um, in order to provide opportunity everywhere and, and everywhere we can um, so that we can maintain operations on some level. So I just want to acknowledge that this has been a major feat um, starting since last fall when we started taking in-season action to address quillback. Um, and that it's re required um, a tremendous amount of lift from our GAP representatives and stakeholders and industry and public and public officials um, that we've all heard from over the last several meetings. Um, I want to just quickly address the comment in the motion relative to federal waters being closed during those nearshore um, times. That's simply to address the fact that the federal regulations are only um, um, operational in federal waters. Um, and just making that distinction that um, we will return to our respective state process and ensure that those shallower than 20 fathom opportunities will be in state regulations. Um, so I didn't want that to be um, make anybody uncomfortable. Um,
Specific to the recreational changes, I do want to just take a moment to acknowledge uh, Paul Chang who, and Dave Kashida, who have worked tirelessly to include, uh, I would say, a, a section of our recreational fishery that we don't hear from very often, which is our kayakers. It's very important to them that they had opportunity in shallow waters, and we hope that we've accomplished that by creating our 20 fathom boundary. Um, but specifically, all of our GAP members, Tim Clausen, Merritt, uh, Louis, um, all the input to find compromises uh, within both North and South uh, is very important and acknowledging that it's it's also not easy to split a management area and create um, differential um, opportunities North and South within one that's going to come with some trade offs, um, and we think that that it's still, um, as somebody put it, the, the best option that we have right now. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge just uh, the Southern California fleet. Um, copper rockfish is going to continue to be something that is limiting moving forward. Um, we see this as, a, as one step of a few maybe that we may need to take to, to stay within that limit. And so special thanks to our SAC folks and other Southern California input for, for helping us get there where we need to be. Um, I want to switch over to the commercial um, part of this motion for just a moment and um, acknowledge the public comment that while while it's not optimal to create differential opening and closures, um, I think this is a good compromise between the balance of the triplement opportunities and different um, RCAs that can maximize the opportunity where we can. Um, we've also heard that that it may not have accomplished everything that was needed or could be provided, but we recognize that there is some state opportunity that could be taken up in other venues. So this is. I'm going to be an iterative process. Um, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Questions for the motion maker? For discussion on the motion? I'm not seeing any hands, so if I don't see something, I'm going to call for the question. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Um, aye. Opposed, no. Abstentions? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Caroline? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, just a follow up. Um, uh, this is obviously representing a lot of changes, significant changes um, than we would typically do for an in season. Um, so I just want to highlight a couple of the outreach plans that we, we do have to, to help. Uh, convey this messaging to both the recreational and commercial sectors. Um, we are going to be updating our website content um, specifically to the rec regs, um, but we do have a new 20 fathom boundary website that includes an interactive map and the downloadable files for folks to use and in, in, electronically into their plotters. Um, and then we will um, continue to take phone calls and interact with our, our representatives and other members of the public to help clarify anything we can if needed. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. All right. Before we close out here, what else do we, anybody else have anything? Butch Smith. I, I would just like to say that, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry. I, I'd like to thank, um, you know, appreciate the uh, hard work and the professionalism um, that. You know, Jamie and Merrick and and I even got to say Wayne, unfortunately, um, and and uh, the others have done in this process. This is certainly a process you could lose your mind and uh, see that train coming and you just can't get off the track and, and, and you know there's a way that has to be. Um, and state of California and their reaction and and this council and, and hopefully when this is all said and done. Um, we can improve too on on some of the things that we have pointed out and seen in this, and uh, I, I really do. And I and uh, the principal from Noah that sits next to me here, um, I, I know he's he has stated that he is interested in looking to see where we can also improve the the process. And so, if anything, um, because of their hard work. Uh, hopefully this will make us work harder to make the process better for all. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to say that. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Butch. All right. <clears throat> Caroline. Apologies. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just as a follow-up too, I, I'm remiss to not make. Go ahead. 
sorry, I thought I lost my mic there for a minute. I'm just remiss in making sure that I didn't acknowledge all of the commercial input that we got as well in our, our commercial gap folks. It was um, triple duty for everybody. And so I didn't want to leave anybody off. Thank you. Okay. Phil Anderson. I was just um, reflecting on the uh, rep um, update that we got from our at sea cooperatives and their efforts to secure an intercooperative agreement uh, associated with um, how they're going to work together to ensure that they're minimizing bycatch. Um, and um, we had the council had asked them to come back or work on it over the over the winter and and we were interested in having them come back here and give us an update here, which I appreciate uh, appreciate their words and appreciate the work they've done up to this point in time. Uh, I continue to view it as a as a priority um, uh, in terms of um, well, certainly in part because um the the bycatch amounts are not specified to either sector and so they're um they are the the the, the there's a dependency on on each other as a result in terms of uh, the behavior and cooperation and ensuring that together um they stay within those amounts and and as importantly um don't get themselves into trouble in season where uh, one of those species is um, threatens to to close off the fishery or uh, have you know some sort of um, draconian measures taken to keep the fishery going, uh, but under certainly less than ideal conditions. So um, I know we're only what if I think somebody said three weeks and open it's four, but I know we're not very far away from the April meeting, but we're not very far away from the opening of the whiting fishery either. And uh, I would like to uh, request that we, uh, that they provide us another update in April. Um, and um, so that we can have a little bit um, and in, in, in part because I'm hoping they'll, they will make this a priority. Uh, and, and even if they don't get the kind of comprehensive uh, agreement they were looking for at the outset, if there are some, uh, some of those key elements, some of those key parameters, protocols, and in, in how they're going to work together, uh, get that on paper, get that as an understanding between the cooperatives, I think is an important step. Um, so, um, that's, that's what I would like to put out there as, as a, as a suggestion, uh, from the, from the council that we, we make that request. Thank you, Phil. I guess discussion, uh, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Phil, for that. I totally agree with you. I would hope that they come back with a nearly fully fleshed out plan that gives us the details of how they're going to uh, go back and, and, and assure the council that, that they've got this under control. I remem remember when we went, went to the set asides and, and it was the big component of that was that the cooperatives were doing such a good job and continue to do that. And I think they do overall do a really good job of managing bycatch and reacting to high bycatch events um, this is all in reaction to a, you know, a, an off season where something didn't go like we planned. And so continued, the council's continued confidence in their ability to do actually a better job than, than the council can do or the agency can do on their own is really important. And I think that's, uh, from my perspective, is what I'm looking for is to make sure that we, we continue that confidence. And I, I mentioned it earlier, in light of the dire straits that uh, other sectors are in, the, the light shines bright. So you, you, you need to, um, I know that in other, in other regions that, you know, they talk about avoiding bycatch in all, all uh, 
levels of abundance. And so there's a number we, we manage salmon to by the biop, but that's a, you know, that's a long ways away from what reality is in, in a lot of the other, in the perspective from other, re, other sectors. So the light shines bright. We need to continue the confidence that the council is given and the permissiveness the council is given in the co-op cooperative structure to do continue to do a good job. And I think we look for that reassurance in, in April. So I, I really support Phil's uh, words there. So thank you. Okay, so I guess most people most most everybody's for that. So we see anybody nodding or shaking their head. So all right, so we'll call the consensus. So anything else? All right, Todd. Yes, th thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Um, so, geez, uh, as the council is aware, or may have with all the numbers and things that have been presented here that the GMT presented some information that the trip limit tables will be corrected. Um, and that does not require a motion by the council, but I was just hoping that the council could at least acknowledge that those trip limits will be changed. Thank you. Okay. Well, you've given that notice. So everybody's shaking their head. Yes. So fantastic. Great. Okay. So how are we doing? So with that, uh, this council has adopted in-season adjustments um, from California mostly, uh, or actually all, uh, one related to the recreational fishery and one related to the commercial fishery by adjusting the line and therefore trip limits within them. You have uh, addressed, and you also heard from the Whiting co-ops about their progress to date and uh, are expecting you know, for future interactions with that particular um, organizations. So I would say that you have adequately addre addressed the action under this item. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Todd. Um, so let, thank everyone. And now we're going to come back at 12, what, 145, <laughs> 145 and uh, on salmon, C8. Okay. So. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. Okay, we're back in session on C8. Robin, are you ready? I'm ready. Wonderful. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. This is agenda item C8, just further direction for the 2024 management alternatives. Um, as you recall, we uh, the STT got direction uh, yesterday. They're back today to show you the results of that guidance. I will note that there are two STT reports under this agenda item. Supplemental one uh, contains all of the seasons in your tables one, two, and three as normal. Um, but I will point out that supplemental STT report two has a corrected versions of the table five and appendix A. So as you're going through and looking at your packet and wanting to know what the numbers are, Table five and appendix A, please refer to STT report two. Uh, we have Dr. Michael Farrell here. He'll walk you through all of that stuff. And then I note that we also have about eight people signed up for public comment on this agenda item. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Robin. Questions for Robin on her overview? All right, <clears throat> with that, we'll go to the STT report and uh, Dr. O'Farrell. Welcome, Mike. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, Council Members. I'll be referring to Agenda Item C8A Supplemental STT Report Two, uh, Revised Preliminary Salmon Management Alternatives. Turning to page two, give just a, a brief overview of the the results. Um, the um, we have some bolded numbers here. Um, 
in the Klamath River uh, for the age four harvest rate, um, 9% under alternative one and 6.1% under alternative two. Uh, for Sacramento River Fall Chinook, um, alternative two um, has an escapement below the 180,000 uh, minimum that was uh, provided by NIMS guidance earlier in the week. Um, for, uh, let's see here, turning to the next page to so the coho um, results, um, we still have some uh, bolded values uh, for um, Snohomish and Quileute Fall. Um, and uh, alternative one um, for Lower Com Columbia River Natural um, Coho. Um, moving down further to um, Southern Oregon, Northern California Coast Coho. Um, since the last time we um, came to see the council, we received uh, freshwater inputs from the Yurok tribe, the Hoopa Valley tribe, and the state of California. And so now the, uh, the total exploitation rates uh, are available. Previously, we had just been reporting ocean exploitation rates. And um, with that, um, in, for alternatives one and two, uh, for the Trinity Natural component of the Song Coho ESU, um, those, those alternatives one and two do, are above the 16% cap on total exploitation rate. And we do have um, <clears throat> our impact tables for South of Falcon stocks uh, for those who are interested in that. Otherwise, I think that's that concludes my um, overview. Okay. Uh, questions on the uh, SDT report? <clears throat> Kyle Eddix. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. O'Farrell. I had one question on Columbia River, Columbia, Columbia Lower River Natural Tulis. You didn't speak to that. It's not a bolded value, but my understanding was that there was there was a new harvest rate for in-river fisheries in the Columbia modeled. Um, it's not in the council fisheries and it's um, not associated yet with fisheries that might be developed in river, but uh, can you confirm there was a change in that rate due to some in-river changes? Yes, that's right, or Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Addix. Uh, my understanding is that the change was a, a change in fresh water. Um, that's about the limit of what I understand at this point. Um, Thank you. Okay, thanks, Scott. Anyone else? Give the good look here. <clears throat> okay, I'm not seeing it. Thanks, Mike. All right, it'll take us to public comment. We have. Ah. <clears throat> okay. And before we start off here, the people who are remote, uh, if you could today put your uh, put your hand up so we know you're there. Things will move a little smoothly here. So with that, we'll start off with James Stone, followed by John Richardson. James? Thank you, Chairman, Council members. Thank you, staff. Thank you very much. James Stone, President of NorCal Guides Sportsman's Association, also sitting on this Hammond Advisory Subpanel California Sport. Um, I was going to present a PowerPoint presentation that I spent many hours working on for you today, but I've uh, changed my mind on uh, what I was going to share. It was going to be in regards to what the inland fishery sector was working with, with the allocation amounts and how we were planning on using that as a conservation buffer in order to protect the stocks and the species moving into the inland season salmon setting process, which is outside the preview of this council, but I think that it is imperative that this council understands that process and how it works in order to make the proper management decisions. With that being said, um, I'd like to thank my state representative and uh, California State of coming in to the SAS today and giving very clear guidance and giving the opportunity to try to provide opportunity and access equitably for all throughout the state of California and to craft correct seasons that also meet within the conservation measures that will work, uh, I think, moving into the April season setting process. So thank you to the state of California for that clear 
uh, communication and guidance. And I just wanted to thank, thank you for that. And I'm looking forward to hopefully these changes that we make today will uh, meet the conservation objective moving forward, as well as provide an equitable uh, small allotment of harvest surplus to the sectors, although it's not much. And we'll see where that brings us into April. So thank you very much for the time. And I uh, appreciated the process of how it went down today. Thank you. All right. Thanks, James. Questions for James on his testimony? Okay. Thanks, James. All right. Next up is uh, John Richardson, followed by Glenn Chineris. John? Yep, I'm here. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, first of all, I'd like to um, second James's uh, praise on that um, in light of the, the new information that's come out today. Um, so that's good. I did have a couple of questions from yesterday uh, that kind of came up after uh, public comment um, with regards to um, uh, the comment that we should be uh, testifying to the State Water Resources Control Boards. And um, just a question um, asking how come all of the agencies aren't working together to make all of this happen. Um, you know, the idea that it's like, hey, that's not us. You guys ask them. Um, it, it seems kind of wild to me that this isn't like a communal effort between everybody. So um, I don't know if that's a question that can even be answered here. Um, but I just kind of wanted to follow up on that a little bit. Okay. Thanks, John. Thank um, you. Mark Rilding. Uh, thank you, Chair Pettinger, and uh, thanks for that comment. Yeah, the council has, uh, more, on more than one occasion, weighed in with the State Water Resources Control Board. And when we weigh in, it's it's a letter. That's, that's all we can do. I know that there are a number of other organizations associated with the salmon fishery that directly weigh in with the State Water Resources Control Board. I don't know if that's true with every fishing organization but it is certainly true for those on the coast. So, but I think it's important for uh, each of us who are in California who care about salmon to, to, make, um, to make our opinions known to the West State Water Resources Control Board because uh, without that pressure, you, they sort of have license to do what they want and, and uh, we don't have as much political power inherently as uh, others in the process. Understood. All right, thank you, I appreciate that. Right. Uh, that was it for today. Thank you, guys. Right. Thank you, Mark, and thank you. Thanks, John. Um, next up, uh, Glenn uh, Caderas, followed by John Ritchie. Glenn, are you there? Okay. He's not there, so uh, we'll go to John Ritchie. John, you're muted. Your mute's on, John. Yeah, we can't hear you because your mute's on. Okay, let's go to um, Larry Nevels. Larry, you, are you there? Yes, I'm here, thank you. Um, well, in light of the newest information, I'm kind of having to change up what I was going to originally say, um, but yesterday's comments, as it was mentioned, after the public comments kind of left me sitting back going, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be a little more transparent in the fact, um, you know, for it, it, this is all of, all of us working together and I appreciate everybody and their input working together to find a conservative effort to give us a substantial fishery in the future for our you know, our kids, our grandkids, and what's happening in the future. I understand it's a lot of work. And there's a lot of agencies involved. And, you know, if, if in my business, I can't make excuses of why things don't happen. And, I mean, I, I understand water is a different issue. But if we're managing fishery and we're not questioning water managers and putting the pressure on them, um, how are we managing a fishery that relies on water? I mean, we're not allowing an agency to basically 
turn around and sabotage everything we're doing in efforts to create a sustainable fishery, but not holding those accountable that hold us hostage. And I want to thank everybody again for um, working together today to bring out about some changes that are equal for everybody. And thank you all for your efforts. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Um, questions for Larry? Okay, seeing that. All right, let's uh, let's try John Ritchie one more time. John, John, you're muted. You need to unmute yourself. Okay, let's go to uh, Barry Day. Is Barry handy? Barry? Hello, have you got me there? We do, Barry. Welcome. Oh, good. Thank you. It's sounding like the room, which I'm not privy to, has sort of got some agreement there, which is good. But the point, something uh, sparked me yesterday, and I realise it's the whole room I'm talking to, not just Marcy, was the comment that commercial caught too much and that's why these new measures are in place and I thought geez it goes back to my testimony about knee-jerk reaction and us copping the, the brunt of it you know because not being privy to the rooms and the facts and figures which in all honesty when I get in does uh, get my mind a little boggled but 51% of the catch we got was from the colony hatchery. So if you discount that, we really met your escapement for the last two years. And also when I was looking at the, the bar graphs that show historical numbers there, over those two years where we caught a lot, there were there is no flattening of the curve. It's just doing its traditional up and down, down wave there. So I'm going back to last year with when it was established that there was a problem with the model. And, you know, from my layman's point of view, and the wife explained to me how you deal with uh, statistics here, big rises and curves are pushed down because there are anomalies but the amount of fish we're catching from the colony um, why why aren't we including this in the model a, a bit more subjectively because it's predominant in the ocean now uh, so i had some other points here but that's pretty much it i'll carry on with it Oh, yeah. Hey Barry. Questions for Barry on his testimony? All right. Thank you, Barry. Next up is Christopher Timones. Christopher, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, Welcome. Yeah, I just wanted to, yeah, thank you guys for kind of working together here today and, and really want to emphasize to ensure whatever um, different season dates you guys make and different options that it's almost a guarantee that we'll have a uh, good return next year because that's uh just to keep the fish you know keep spawning and doing their thing i know the water the water is a, is a huge issue and um i'm like a lot of the other people that just don't understand why the two different state agencies can't work together when it's uh it seems simple you know in my mind and a lot of other people's mind but i guess there's a lot of other political issues but anyways i just wanted to say thank you for all the hard work you guys have been doing that's it thank you all right thank you christopher um any questions for christopher his testimony which smith yeah thank you christopher for your testimony um you know i, I think sometimes can or won't 
is very close together. And I think you got to keep that in mind. There's, there's can't and there's won't. So um, just keep that in mind. And, and uh, you know, with uh, the efforts of what you California salmon guys put into this, um, some, sometimes a trip to the old water center might not be too bad of an idea um, because the, the real salmon harvester is not in this room. Every time you turn on a light switch or eat almond, you harvest the salmon. So just uh, remember that when you're next time you're asked for questions from the, the water districts and stuff. So anyway, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Bush. Um, next, up. next up is Tom Markey. Tom? I see you're unmuted, Tom. No, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? There, there we go. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. This a different computer. Well, <laughs> Mr. Uh, Chair Pettinger and the uh, council, thanks for giving me the opportunity uh, to comment. I, I'm just uh, more of a curiosity than anything. I know in the past on the KMZ, we, you know, we try to keep some parity between Oregon and California. And, you know, I'm not, looking at the harvest impacts, I, I noticed that uh, the KMZ on the north, you know, has like 190 fish and all, alternative one, 156 and two and three. California is like 80, 87 for alternative one, 42 for two, and of course, zero for, you know, for three. You know, and that's it's not a lot of fish, but, uh, you know, it's like 200% in the first and three over 300% difference in the second. And I would, you know, I would, I, in the past, they've tried to have more parity between us. And, you know, I understand that they have, you know, they have coho to fish for, and we don't, you know, we have to, we have non-retention for all our coho, even though we have, uh, you know, a hatchery right here on the Trinity River that puts out 300,000 fish, we have to turn them all loose. So, you know, we've got this peculiar situation now where, you know, we're severely impacted with quillback, even though our quillback up here is probably the same as Oregon. I mean, we're the same zone, basically. You know, our Pacific halibut, we're only getting like 30% of our, you know, <laughs> our harvest, our abundance out there. And now salmon, we have nothing. I mean, we're, we've got to be the most beat up ports in the, in the, on the coast right now. I mean, we're kind of the poster child for economic damage and loss of fishing opportunity. You know, I guess I would like to see maybe more parity, you know, uh, you know, between Oregon and us. If, you know, if they're allowed to catch 150 or 180 fish, then, you know, why can't we be structured where we can get more than just, you know, one third or one quarter of that amount? So, you know, I, you know, it's kind of frustrating to, to see these numbers. But anyway, you, you guys are in the situation that maybe you can do something about that. But, uh, you know, we're we're pretty being pretty beat up here. And we really we really need some assistance by I think the council level at this point. I would hope that the, uh, you know, the alternatives were a little more evenly structured, you know, between Oregon and us. Um, but, you know, if, if it can't be done, I understand, but uh, it'd be nice to see something a little more equitable. So anyway, th thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Questions for Tom on his testimony? All right, let's see. Great to hear your voice, Tom. Okay, and let's go back to uh, try John Ritchie one more time. And John, your 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 mic, you're you're still muted, so you need to figure that out. Okay, yeah, it's not coming through. Okay, and is Glenn uh, Kaderis? I don't see him up there, right? Okay, well, oh, John, you had you had it unmuted for a split second. We'll give you one last chance. Are you there? Nope. Okay. Well, that takes us to uh, to council action. So I'll open the floor for discussion if needed. Mark Grilding. Uh, thank you, Chair Penter. I wanted to follow up on Tom Marking's comment. I think he um, he has an excellent point. Um, we have the benefit of looking back and seeing what we've done in previous seasons and sort of to see what distributions have been, say, between states and between sectors. And um, I don't recall, and I'm looking back at past salmon seasons, seeing such a disproportionate uh, share of those Klamath fish between 
the Oregon and the California portions of the KMZ. So I um, just wanted to agree with Tom on that. Um, and I think that that uneven, there's a rather un, unusual distribution of fish here. I no, realize this is not final that, you know, we're gonna work on it between now and April and the April meeting, we'll get, in, we'll get input from folks at the hearing and um, have a chance to smooth off the rough edges in, in April. But I think that Tom makes a larger point about how these fish are being distributed. Um, we, we have a tough, we have a tough year um, and the burdens probably need to be shared uh, equally. Okay, thanks Mark. Anyone else? Okay. All right, I'll look to, look to the tribes, Joe. Any guidance for us? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so at, at this time, I do not have any guidance to offer to what is reflected uh, in Table 3 on the 2024 Treaty Indian Troll Management Alternatives uh, for Ocean Fisheries. And that's located on page 24 of the uh, DAA Supplement STT Report 1. So no, no guidance to offer to that. Um, but I do uh, have some guidance that I want to offer for the uh, Klamath River Falchonet. Okay. okay. So I am providing the following guidance for STT analysis on the following initial salmon management measures for Klamath River Falchonet for in-river travel fisheries. Uh, and the guidance is to maximize tribal harvest of adult Klamath River Falchnik per the buffered 2024 harvest control rule, uh, in parentheses, uh, as approved under agenda item C4, and 50-50 tribal non-tribal sharing. So the, the matter here is um, this is uh, guidance that was patterned off of guidance that we provided um, for the 2023 uh, season um, to try and help address uh, the harvest sharing of Klamath River Falchnik between tribal and non-tribal fisheries. Uh, the intent uh, is to align uh, align this with the uh, action that the council took earlier in this meeting to buffer the 2024 harvest control rule by setting a maximum allowable exploitation rate of 20%. Um, so for um, the tribes, um, this guidance attempts to strike a balance uh, between conservation and harvest. Uh, as co-managers, the uh, Hoopa Valley tribe and Yurok tribe desire to, uh, one, um, provide for uh, federally recognized tribal harvest and harvest share, uh, two, to contribute fish to the identified minimum uh, tribal subsistence and ceremonial needs, and three, uh, to address conservation issues associated with the uh, projected natural spawning statement per application of the 2024 forecast uh, and uh, the 2024 harvest control rule. So with that, I wanted to offer uh, that guidance uh, at this point. And I also um, uh, recognize that uh, CDF&W uh, will have some uh, similar information uh, to share uh, regarding uh, the non-travel side as well. Okay, thank you, Joe. Okay, look at the Washington, Kyle, Kyle Alex. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I too have some guidance, which we should see on the screen momentarily. Oh, I'm sorry, Susan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had one question for Joe, a, clar a clarification on something okay. on um, page 24 of um, the agenda item C8A supplemental STT report. Um, the uh, language there, July 1 through season end date of no later than September 3rd, uh, 30th with the uh, parenthesis TBD. Um, and I know this was is totally consistent with what was uh, proposed yesterday and adopted by the council, <clears throat> but I just wanted to clarify my understanding is that the um, season that the tribes are discussing is between basically September 15th and September 30th. 
And so the way that the model um, works, that's a that's basically a block of time in the way the model treats it. So it should be similar, but uh, between the three among the three alternatives. Yes, that that would be correct. Um, that um, they're considering at this point um, to have uh, the season end date um, be no later than September 30th for, for all three. Uh, do that address your question? Um, just one other point of clarification that the, um, so we, we aren't talking about an end date that would be, for example, in June, it's really sort of focused on that two week period between September 30th, September 15th and September 30th. I'm trying to see, I'm, I apologize, I'm trying to see if I'm tracking here. So for the alternatives um, for the TBD, so the issue that um, the tribes are working on is, is that period uh, September 15th to September 30th to try and come to some resolution on that at some point. Thank you, in Joe. This process. I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not being all that, that clear, but I'm just um, verifying that the model itself will be um, that would treat sort of those, the period, the impacts during that two week period similarly, um, as opposed to other time periods within the model, should the end date be in a different block of time? That would be my understanding is that's how it would be treated. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you to the council. Okay. This is it. All right. Now, Kyle, I believe we're ready for you. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. I'll be speaking to changes relative to agenda item C8A, Supplemental STT Report 1, dated March 10th, 2024. Implement the following changes in Table 1 for the North of Falcon Commercial Management Alternatives, beginning on page 1. In Alternative 1, change the overall non-Indian non coho TAC from 110,000 to 105,000 and adjust the commercial quotas consistent with the new TAC. For the U.S.-Canada border to Cape Falcon summer season on page three, for alternative three, change the dates to July 1 through the early, earlier of September 22nd or attainment of the quota. For table two, the North of Falcon recreational management alternatives beginning on page 14. Again, an alternative one, change the overall non-Indian TAC for coho from 110,000 to 105,000 and adjust the recreational quota and sub-area quotas consistent with that new TAC. Then area by area for the U.S.-Canada border to Cape Alava, Nia Bay sub-area, and alternative one, change the Chinook sub-area guideline to 9,780. 9, for alternative two, change the guideline to 8,970. For alternative three, change the guideline to 8,280 and change the dates to June 22nd through earlier of September 22nd or attainment of the quota. For the Lapush sub-area, alternative one, change the Chinook guideline to 1,700. Alternative two, change the guideline to 1,550. Alternative three, change the Chinook sub-area guideline to 1,440 and change the dates to June 22nd through earlier of September 22nd or attainment of the quota. For the Westport sub-area, alternative one, change the Chinook guideline to 18,060. Alternative two, change the guideline to 16,580. Alternative three, change the guideline to 15,300 and change the dates to June 30th through earlier of September 22nd or attainment of the quota. And finally, for the Columbia River sub area, change the Chinook sub area guideline to 12,960. Alternative two, change the guideline to 11,900. Alternative three, change the guideline to 10,980 and change dates to June 29th through earlier of September 22nd or attainment of the quota. So the, the, the first change there was to just bring the higher coho alternative quota down. Um, it just narrows the range a little bit for the alternatives we're considering. Um, all the alternatives, all the fisheries include an earlier closure date 
for the ocean fisheries north of Falcon in Alternative 3, a September 22nd date. And that's just to um, consider whether an earlier closure date would provide any extra protection to um, Washington coastal stocks as we move through fishery planning. And the changes to the sub area guidelines, those guidelines aren't defined in the FMP. They're calculated by the STT every year based on recent year averages. Sometimes we see a year drop out of the data set that makes those percentages swing quite a bit. And we saw that this year. So this is just bumping the guidelines back a little closer to what we saw last year between ports. I'm just trying to pr provide some still it's a bit stability there for our fisheries and coastal communities. And that's uh, uh, while I'm still talking, um, we did hear about a couple of um, bolded coho values in the current fisheries plans, one in Puget Sound, Snohomish, and one on the coast, Quill Ute. We recognize that we've got work to do with inside Puget Sound and coastal terminal fisheries to make sure we have a complete set of fisheries that meets our objectives by the end of the process. Ocean fisheries are a relatively small piece of the exploitation on both of those stocks. And we've been talking particularly with coastal co-managers this week about talking about our terminal fisheries and making sure we're um, somewhere by April that meets our objectives, um, not on the tables today, but we also have a lot of work to do with Puget Sound Chinook as we move through the next month. So thank you, Mr. Chair, that's all I had. Okay, thanks Kyle. Dr. O'Farrell, you good back there? Okay. Okay, I'll do, I'll do the bishop pause here before I go to Oregon. <laughs> okay, John North. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, Oregon does have some additional guidance today, both recreational and commercial. And uh, so regarding, I'll be speaking to agenda item C88, supplemental STT report one dated March 10th, 2024. Uh, we're looking for the following changes, which on table one for ODFW commercial management alternatives on page five for Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain under alternative one and two, remove March 15 through 31, and under alternative three, remove March 15. Oh, I'm sorry. Under all three alternatives, remove March 15 to 31. Wow. And for Humbug Mountain to Oregon, California border, the Oregon KMZ under alternative one and alternative two, replace March 15 through April 30 with April 16 through 30. And under alternative three, replace March 15 through 31 with closed and remove the next line, same as alternative one. And on table two, um, for Humbug Mountain to Oregon, California border, Oregon KMZ, page 19 of the recreational management alternatives underneath alternative three, replace the dates listed for Humbug Mountain, Oregon, California border, um, Oregon KMZ with May 16th through August 25th and replace the paragraph that begins with open seven days per week with the language open seven days per week, all salmon except coho, except as listed above for the mark selective coho fishery from Cape Falcon to the Oregon, California border. June 29th through August 25th, two salmon per day, all retained coho must be marked with a healed adipose fin clip, see minimum size limits, see gear restrictions and definitions. And today's guidance um, on the commercial alternatives primarily reflects the new model outputs, uh, which corrected an oversight, I believe, and added significant Sacramento Falls Nook impacts to the March Oregon troll fisheries. So we had to make uh, corresponding adjustments there, and then also the guidance um, on the recreational fishery corrects a previous oversight and uh, on one of the alternatives and hopefully clarifies the, the regulation better. Thanks, John. Okay. We turn to California and Marcy Rupko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do you have some guidance? Oop. There we go. All right. Um, speaking to agenda item C8A, Supplemental STT Report 1, dated March 10th, 2024, implement the following changes. Beginning on page six for the commercial management alternatives, uh, the California KMZ, alternative one, replace the 7,000 Chinook quota with a 1,000 Chinook quota. 
Alternative two, replace the 5,000 Chinook quota with a 5,500 Chinook quota. Moving to Fort Bragg, replace June 1 through 10 with June 1 through 5 and June 8 through 12. Alternative two, replace June 1 through 8 with June 1 through 7. San Francisco, replace June, alternative one, replace June 1 through 10 with June 1 through 5, June 8 through 12. Add for uh, the area from Point Reyes to Point San Pedro, which is the fall area target zone. September 1 through 30th. Add October 1 through 7, October 1 through 4, and October 7 through 11. And add the regulatory language that all salmon caught in this area must be landed between Point Arena and Pigeon Point, which is the San Francisco management area. Alternative 2, replace June 1 through 8 with June 1 through 7. For the Monterey area, alternative one, replace June 1 through 10 with June 1 through 5 and June 8 through 12. Alternative two, replace June 1 through 8 with June 1 through 7. Moving to uh, table two, the recreational management alternatives beginning on page 19, the California KMZ replace alternative and alternative one, replace June 6 through 9 with June 5 through 9, replace August 1 through 4 with August 1 through 6, remove August 29 through 31, add the regulatory language as follows, in-season action may be taken to close open days when total harvest is approaching a statewide harvest guideline of 10,000 Chinook. Remove September 1st through October 15th. Replace with September 1 through 3 and September 27 through 29. And replace with October 18 through 20. Add regulatory language. In-season action may be taken to close open days when total harvest is approaching a statewide harvest guideline of 5,000 Chinook. Then alternative two, add regulatory language. In-season action may be taken to close open days when total harvest is approaching a statewide harvest guideline of 6,500 Chinook. For the Fort Bragg area, implement the same changes as displayed for the California KMZ and Alternative 1. Alternative 2, implement the same changes as displayed for the California KMZ and Alternative 2. Moving to San Francisco, Alt 1, implement the same changes as displayed for the California KMZ and Alt 1. Alt 2, implement the same changes as displayed for the California KMZ and Alternative 2. Moving to Monterey, Alt-1, implement the same changes as displayed for the California KMZ in Alt-1, and Alt-2, implement the same changes as displayed for the California KMZ in Alt-2. Moving to Table 5, um, <clears throat> these are the uh, projected key stock escapements or management criteria uh, for the ocean fishery alternatives, um, looking at page 26, um, speaking to the California River Recreational Fishery Share, uh, a, an alternative one. Is it all alternatives? Okay. Uh, adjust the Klamath River recreational fishery share such that the maximum allowable exploitation rate of 20% is achieved and the projected natural area spawner escapement equals 36,511. And if I may pause a second, I need to clarify something. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. There's one correction needed to the language on the screen. Okay. Right now it says alternative one. Here in table five, I believe this should read, is it all three? Uh, this, this should read all alternatives. Thank you. Instead of alternative one. Okay, you good? Yes, thank you. All right. And I have some talking points if now is appropriate. It is. Okay, thank you. All right, a lot of changes here for California. We had quite a breakthrough day uh, this morning. Um, just like to give you a few highlights of what these changes reflect uh, and the discussions that were had. Um, First, I just like to, um, since it's on the screen right now, regarding um, the adjustment to the California River Recreational Fishery Share, um, this guidance is intended to work uh, in tandem with the um, guidance we heard earlier from um, the tribes to maximize the harvest in the non-tribal river fisheries, which will allow the Hoopa Valley Tribe in Yurok uh, the full access to their 50%. Um, the escapement uh, floor as a result of the um, <clears throat> allowable exploitation rate that the council um, guidance uh, was earlier this week to um, set that allowable uh, rate at 20% in 2024 down from 25% um, results in that um, new floor value of 36,511. So um, this guidance would just put that remaining um, non-tribal um, harvest in the uh, river recreational fishery to allow the tribes full access to their 50%. Um, moving to the recreational fishery, alternatives and the changes made today. Um, just want to compliment our SAS um, on the work this morning to develop a management strategy that will um, offer, um, as was uh, suggested by public comments heard um, throughout the week, as well as in the briefing book um, that would offer an alternative with um, some precautionary and de minimis uh, recreational fishery opportunities um, that could be accommodated within the allowable impacts. Um, a lot's come together over the past few days and I just wanna speak a bit to the features of what um, was put up on the screen here. If you might scroll up, please, just a little. Thank you. Sure. Um, a little further. Other way. Okay. So I'll use the California KMZ Alt One language uh, as um, the point for discussion. Um, what we what you see here now, um, th this is, of course, the amendments that are being made to existing language in the package. But what's being designed here is a strategy of having a series of three day openers that are spaced about three weeks apart in all California recreational fisheries from the KMZ southward. Um, these are these three day openers would work and these are um, prior to um, September one. These three, um, each of these uh, series of openers would um, operate uh, with a harvest guideline of 10,000 Chinook. 
such that we would prosecute uh, the first open period of three days, which would be uh, or three, four days now in <laughs> June. Um, it would give us time to stop and count uh, the accrued harvest in the recreational fishery. The next open period would then come in early July. Um, and then an open period in early August, as shown on the screen. And with each of those successive openers, we would be um, counting accrual of the harvest guideline and then utilizing um, an ability to take in-season management action to determine if there was uh, enough remaining uh, harvest guideline to prosecute the next open period. Um, we've heard loud, loudly from um, a number of uh, our constituencies that we need to ensure that any uh, recreational fishery is prosecuted with um, a large degree of precaution, and we certainly want to prevent uh, any sort of one runaway opportunity in a recreational fishery, just as we would for a commercial fishery. So. Um, that's the strategy here is to short openers, stop and count, determine if we can proceed with the next opener. Um, so this is the first time that we would be um, considering this um, approach and we feel like we've done quite a bit to um, evaluate appropriate harvest guideline uh, of 10,000 Chinook for the pre-September 1 fisheries. Looking to the fall, uh, same strategies employed in this alternative for post-September 1 fisheries, where we'd have uh, three very short openers, um, September 1 through 3, September 27 through 29, and October 18 through 20. And those would operate under against a uh, 5,000 Chinook quota. Um, Fall fisheries, of course, we are not attempting to model to impacts, but uh, again, we would want to employ quite a bit of precaution, um, even in a credit card fishery to um, prevent racking up um, a large credit card bill or a large accrual of impacts that would um, hit against us next season. Uh, the 10,000 Chinook quota, just a, a note on that, and again, this is the most um, Alternative one, the most um, generous of the alternatives for fishing. Um, that, of course, is a mixed stock um, or all stock um, limit um, that would include both adult fish, jackfish, um, all stocks. And um, looking at the all stock projection, which is um, what was utilized to give us um, an idea on how to set this harvest guideline. Um, certainly would ensure that we would um, maintain um, harvest within the projected impacts that are shown uh, in the in the table. First, and Sacramento Fall, of course, is the constraining stock. Um, so that's, that's how that would work. Um, one thing that I just want to emphasize, I've received this question um, a number of times is, <coughs> excuse me, well, what happens when you attain a harvest guideline of 10,000 Chinook. And I just wanna explain that the point of the measure is to ensure that we stay within our projected impacts for the fishery. Um, there wouldn't be an action taken immediately that says, okay, you've now caught 10,001 fish, so the fishery is closed. The strategy would be to prosecute these short openers, stop and count, and then determine if available fish were left against that harvest guideline uh, to prosecute the remaining um, short openers that would be scheduled. So hopefully that um, explains what um, the proposal is here. We appreciate, uh, again, all of the work of SAS, STT, co-managing agencies that have helped us work through um, this proposal in order to build in um, adequate safeguards that um, would be of interest if we were to prosecute recreational fishery. 
Um, moving to the commercial, if I may, if you can scroll up just a little bit. Couple things of note here. Um, I just want to highlight that the alternatives um, for Arena South um, highlight um, that, well, they all include only time in June. Um, what you see here in alternative one that replaces June 1 through 10 with June 1 through 5 and 8 through 12. Um, what we've heard from the SAS is priority for the dates in the month of June. And again, these dates carry down all the way uh, to the Monterey area. Um, they again would be um, employing the coastal Chinook framework that we've uh, discussed uh, in detail over the past several months that would involve um, a trip limit and that we would, um, that trip limit amount is going, you'll see the amount, um, you know, that amount is going to need to adjust um, with the alternatives and also through to final action based on the proposed season dates. Um, so one thing I'd add is that we will employ that same strategy with regard to the trip limit management. If you look at these June dates, where we would uh, fish the first period, June 1 through 5, within, and then um, evaluate the catch um, and then ascertain if in-season action would be necessary to reduce the trip limit that was proposed for that next open period in June. Um, just a flag, I think we will probably be looking to add some um, time between now and final action Right now, the, the, these two open periods are quite close together. We, we've discussed with the SAS the need for some um, time to stop and count and then proceed with an in-season action and the notice requirements. And we certainly want to give the fleet adequate notice in order to um, be able to comply with the next open period and the new trip limit. So we'll be working on that. Um, between now and final action so that we can um, make sure that we've given ourselves a much as a, enough administrative time so that we uh, take the appropriate steps as needed. Um, there's also an addition in the San Francisco area that I just want to talk a little bit about um, the fall area target zone. Um, this is not something that's been um, in any of the prior alternatives. Uh, that's coming at the request of the SAS um, to add um, time in September and October. Um, traditionally, the, the fall area target zone um, is an area that has been open only in the month of October. Uh, the proposal is to add uh, fishing opportunity in this area um, in September as well. And just to describe a little more uh, fully, the fall area target zone is a small sub area within the larger San Francisco management area. So the proposal is that fishing would be conducted in the fall area target zone, but that um, landing would be allowed throughout that, that entirety of the San Francisco area. So you see the, the regulatory language proposal here to specify that landings would be allowed um, throughout that area. Um, we'd like this alternative to be included among the range for consideration um, as we leave March, but acknowledge that some work needs to be done to determine if um, the Coastal Chinook framework um, applies here in the fall fisheries. This is the only fall fishery for commercial that um, would be proposed. Um, again, just a, this is more of a placeholder, just acknowledging that there's some things to explore here that um, we'd like to kind of keep within the range for now. 
Um, <clears throat> let's see. Give me just a second here, please. Oh, um, let's talk a bit about um, Table 5 and Sonk. Um, I think Dr. O'Farrell uh, described um, these additions to the packet this go round. I, I think I made a brief mention of this yesterday that um, we've now received new freshwater inputs. Um, and just want to acknowledge that uh, in two of the alternatives in table five, that um, they do not come below the 16% uh, allowable um, exploitation rate for the Trinity natural. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, stop. Um, again, we received the values late in the week and we have um, discussed with the co-managers, which include um, Hoopa Valley Tribe, Yurok, and Oregon, um, that we'll plan to have discussions um, once we leave this March meeting about how to best share this exploitation rate between the user groups. Um, so our plan is to um, leave the meeting showing that we will exceed or that we are projected to exceed um, the allowable exploitation rate of 16%, but we do intend to, um, like you say, make headway between now and April. Um, this is the first time that we've needed to work through this issue. Um, and again, getting the, the inputs kind of midway through the process um, just signals to us that we need to get together and meet up um, between now and April. And so that is, um, that's the plan. Anyway. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Marcy. Mark Grilzik. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Patton. I just have a, a couple of questions. I guess we have quotas both for the patrol and the sport fisheries, but I guess in the end, and that's an alternate quota. So I think in the analysis, we'll see how that translates into, into Klamath and Sacramento Fall. Is that right? Thank you, Mr. Grelnick. I'm going to give this a shot and then I may ask Candace to come up and fill in any holes in my explanation. But the season dates, you're talking recreational, I would assume, and that for the season dates that are shown are what was modeled for the impacts. The intent with the quotas um, do uh, to serve, are intended to serve the purpose that we've long identified we need to serve, which is to keep the catches within the projected impacts. Of course, with a mixed stock fishery, there's not clear certainty what that stock composition is likely to be. Um, we do know that um, there's a high um, component, especially more recently, of McCallamy origin fish. Um, but again, the stock composition can differ. We did use um, a model called the all stock model or the all stock harvest. harvest. Yes, thank you. Um, and maybe I will ask Candace to come up and say a few words about it and some of the um, assumptions that we made considering the output from this model. <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you, Ms. Yuremko. Thank you, Mr. Grelnick. Grel I think I would benefit from hearing the question one more time. So my, my question is, well, it's an observation first that both the troll and the sport fisheries are operating under an all Chinook quota. And I guess, especially given the tr large number of McCallum fish out, out there, up to half that have been caught recently, up to half the harvest has been McCallum fish, um, I'm wondering when we get the analysis of these seasons, are we going to see how this quota translates into Sacramento fall fish and translates into Klamath fall fish? So 
we're not, and we're not assuming these are all Sacramento fall fish that in that 10,000. Right. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Grelnick. Yes. Um, so what comes from the Klamath Ocean Harvest Model and the Sacramento Harvest Model is um, what's no, what we call an all stock forecast amount. So basically, although they're single stock models, it does um, make an attempt to forecast what the overall harvest will be of that mixed stock fishery, including McCallamy or other Central Valley Chinook as well. So it is included as part of that all stock forecast number, which we um, do our model runs, we get the all stock harvest projection, and then we'll evaluate that and base our harvest limit quota, harvest guideline, whichever term you prefer to um, use that to set our amount of fish that we intend to catch for the season. Great. I, th I think what I heard is that when the model gets run, including the output of the all stock model that we'll see how that translates into Sacramento fall and Klamath fall fish. It's not just going to be 10,000, for example, Sacramento fish in the Correct. output of the model. Correct. It's not projecting those, just those single stocks. It's projecting the mixed stock okay. harvest. That, that, right, that answers my question. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. I just wanted to to make sure that even though we have an all Chinook quota, we're, we're, we're going to see what it means with regard to the individual stocks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we do that post-season post analysis. Thank you. All right. And I have a further question. I just want to make sure I read this correctly. Um, in the, for fall fisheries, um, right now, I think with the guidance, um, the trawl fishery has 38 days in the fall fishery. And I'm not sure what the quota would be because I guess we have to see what the output of the model is. And the sport fishery has nine days in the fall fishery with a 5,000 fish quota. Is that right? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that, as I was uh, explaining earlier, we're putting that September fishery um, out acknowledging that we don't have other other ways to define that at this time, um, but the interest was in pursuing some opportunity in only the fall area target zone in the month of September in addition to the month of October. And Maybe if I may call George Bradshaw up to elaborate. George. Thank you, Chair um, and Mark. I the, the proposal that we're moving forward specifically first off for the commercial is to go review and see if the framework concept applies to the the fall fishery, right? And, you know, the 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 concept that we were to believe is that there was, you know, overperformances and, and there's a, a reason and a rationale to try to make sure that, you know, catch and catch rates and, and catch numbers match what the models forecasted. Um, you know, fall fisheries aren't forecasted. They're realized impacts later coming off the top of the next year's assumed abundance um, referred to as credit card fisheries. The reason why we put forward on the commercial side of that real small area, which is have been referred to as the fats target area, it's between Point Reyes and Point Pinos, is because it it has or Point Pedro, anyways, it limits the impact to the stocks of concern that this framework was for, right? It 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 takes away opportunity from where those stocks typically would be present. Um, you know, and, and I think that there should be some analysis looked at and potentially ran um, going into next process in April to see if there's any data that we could find that shows um, a safety net there or not. I would assume, you know, the commercial fleet's going to have to make decisions of if they want to use a credit card, um, mostly on Sacramento stocks, that's going to have to go. And I think the difference is, um, Mark, between the commercial what we have on paper and the recreational on paper recreational has a broader area where there is that concern of impacting the stock of concern um the coastal chinook that you know required the framework and 
at least in my vision and, and why I put forward what I did for the commercial side is to limit um, at all, all extent, right? That impact to that stock of concern, which is the coastals. All right, thank you. I just, to be clear, I don't object to that at all. I think yeah. we, sh we should get as much opportunity as possible uh, for everybody that we can do uh, conservatively. It just, I'll note that fall area fisheries also probably were 99% of the sport fishery is at that time of year as well. For sure. Yeah. And, and it might be something to consider. I don't know. You know I mean, on a broader scale for uh, recreational as well. I don't know if, the, you know, data. And, and like I said, or, or Mr. Rimko alluded to, you know, the proposal that I, I wanted to make sure was on the books for the commercial is so that it could be looked into, um, see if there's an application there that needed to be for the framework or, or not, um, you know, so that it could lead on to more discussion between the agencies and, and industry. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Anyone else? All right. Okay, Robin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, under this agenda item, you have provided guidance um, from all of the states as well as the tribes. And so the STT will uh, go and run that analysis. I will note that we, the salmon uh, agenda item is scheduled back first thing tomorrow morning. And there's uh, a good chance that we'll want to delay that just to uh, give the ST time time to produce their report and uh, everyone to develop their guidance as needed, uh, given that it is our, our final shot at the 2024 seasons coming out of March. Okay. Right, thank you. Very good. With that, um, that concludes uh, C8, and I will hand the uh, gavel to uh, Vice Chair Hasmer to uh, take over. Thank you, Chair Pettinger. We're going to move into our HMS topics. Before we do that, table changes, five minute break. Uh, let's be back here then to commence business. <laughs>
All right, one minute. Let's get everybody back to our seats. All right, one minute. Okay, we're ready to commence on our highly migratory species agenda items. I will turn it over to Dr. Dahl for the introduction on our first one. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. This is the NIMS report. Um, I did, uh, um, Mr. Uh, Hogan, uh, who is going to give us a briefing on the Pacific Albacore Treaty as a previous commitment and has to leave for that at 3.20 our time. So um, I prevailed on Mr. Wolf if it would be okay for uh, Dave to give that briefing now. So, because um, he'll be having to run off out the door in a few minutes. So if that's okay. And he's uh, indeed online, we could turn to him first. That sounds okay to me, uh, just so everyone knows that briefing was under agenda item I too, but because of time constraints, we'll take it up here. So, uh, Mr. Hogan, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Great. Uh, you're free to go ahead with your report. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to the chair and the vice chair and, and to the council for the flexibility and the timing. I'm reporting on the ongoing negotiations under the US-Canada North Pacific Albacore Treaty. Um, under that treaty, the previous bilateral fisheries and port access regime um, expired at the end of calendar 2022. And in the interim so far, the two sides have not found a consensus approach on the way forward, and no regime has been agreed, and thus no reciprocal fishing took place in 2023. U.S. and Canadian delegations have met several times over the past few years to conduct negotiations to try to reach agreement on a new reciprocal fishing and port access regime, most recently at the end of November in 2023. Uh, for the information of the Council, the Canadian delegation is proposing to expand the number of vessels that can access the U.S. exclusive economic zone, extend the fishing season for those vessels, and relieve the capacity limits for replacement of vessels on the authorized vessel list. The U.S. delegation is maintaining the position that we should continue to apply the status quo on the season and number of Canadian vessels that has been in place since 2013. Stakeholder consultations in the interim since the previous negotiating session in April 2023 and leading up to the November 2023 talks have yielded no movement on either side. I recently spoke with my counterpart on the Canadian side, and I have the sense that the Canadians may be considering an interim arrangement to reinstate fishing and port access for one year in 2024 while talks continue. I'll be advising the U.S. delegation, including the council representative on our delegation, if and when we receive a concrete proposal. Um, so that's the update on the U.S.-Canada Albacore Treaty. I'd be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I'll look around and see if there are any questions for Mr. Hogan on the Albacore Treaty negotiations. And I see no hands here, so thank you very much, Dave. Thank you, sir. 
All right, with that, I'm going to turn it back to Kit and uh, we'll get back to I1 and your or overview. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. My overview is always very easy on this one since it is simply to turn it over to Mr. Wolf to present the two um, NIM NIMPS reports, a one that was in the advanced briefing book and a supplemental report, so. All right, thank you. With that, Ryan Wolf, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I um, summarize and explain my reports, um, I do have some personnel announcements that I don't believe I've told this council yet. So um, I just wanted to let folks know on the HMS world, our former branch chief, Lyle Enriquez, has moved over to become our permits and monitoring branch chief. Uh, to, as Melissa Hooper was previously in that position, took another position. Uh, and so we have hired permanently Miss Rachel Wadsworth, who is behind me over my shoulder here, uh, as our new permanent highly migratory species branch chief. So just wanted to introduce uh, her to everyone here on the council, although I know a number of you um, have worked with Rachel. Okay, now we have two reports under this agenda item. I'm gonna briefly summarize them. <laughs> the first one's pretty short. Uh, it's regarding the newly authorized deep set buoy gear fishery. And we are planning to issue the second year's worth of limited entry permits to qualified fishermen next month. Uh, this should bring the number of issued deep set buoy gear permits to a maximum of 75. And just to, as a reminder, when we did our initial call, we had 77 total qualified applicants. So we will notify permit holders of requirements to make pre-trip notifications so that NIMS can place observers on trips in this newly authorized fishery. And we're also currently preparing to conduct a quality control check of uh, buoy gear observer, logbook, and landings data for calendar year 2023. Turning now to our little more lengthy supplemental report, we are pleased to announce on February 9th, a draft environmental impact statement was published to consider exempted fishing permits or EFPs for testing fishing practices to target swordfish and other HMS in federal waters off the West Coast. This proposed action includes several gear configurations that uh, have been already before this council and recommended that NIMS consider. Uh, the DEIS outlines required terms and conditions for the EFPs. It also has a range of additional possible terms and conditions. Uh, and again, as noted here, the purpose of this proposed action that's being analyzed is to collect information useful for assessing the type and extent of interactions with protected species and non-target non finfish, evaluate the economic viability of operations, and inform uh, future management decisions for HMH fisheries operating off of federal waters off the West Coast. I know we'll be touching on this in, in I3. Uh, public comment is open through April 9th, and of course, we'll be considering all the comments that we receive as part of our review of this action. Separately, we recently completed a NEPA analysis uh, and an ESA consultation on the proposed action to issue night set buoy gear EFPs uh, for up to five vessels. Um, the next steps, including finalizing the terms and conditions and then issuing the three night set EFPs for 24 and 25, and those three have already been um, discussed at this council. Also on February 28th, we published an in-season action uh, announcement that the Pacific Bluefin Tuna 2024 annual catch limit uh, for U.S. commercial fishing vessels in the EPO uh, will be 720 metric tons. Finally, we are in the process of completing two rulemakings to implement IATTC resolutions that were adopted uh, late last year. Um, for the first proposed rule, uh, we plan to implement provisions of IATTC resolutions on shark conservation, as well as a separate resolution on VMS. The proposed regulations on sharks would require owners and operators of US longline vessels to leave unwanted catch of shark in the water and use a specified line cutter to cut trailing gear so that less than one meter remains on the animal. And if that's not possible with how compromising the safety of anyone on board, then the vessel owner operator would be required to cut branch line as close to the hook as possible. 
The ITTC resolution on sharks also includes provisions prohibiting shark finning, requiring sharks be landed with fins naturally attached, but that's already required in the US by the Shark Convention Act of 2010. The VMS proposed regulation would require a manual reporting requirement in the event of a malfunctioning VMS at sea. So that's a those will both all be combined in that first proposed rule. And for the second proposed rule, we plan to implement provisions uh, in the IATTC resolution on fish aggregating devices or FADs. Uh, these would apply to US large per seine vessels that fish on FADs in the IATTC convention area. The, the proposed rule would require non-entangling materials on FADs beginning in 2025 and shifting to biodegradable materials beginning in 2026. Uh, it would also require vessels engaged in FAD recovery projects in the Eastern Pacific Ocean report data on those recovered FADs to the IATTC. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Wolf on the NIMS report. Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Ryan. Um, it just it just struck me when you uh, I did read read the briefing book and the AS report, but then when you spoke to it about it being an EIS for these EFPs, um, the choice of an EIS for this kind of again just hit me as being um, not unusual, I guess, but maybe unexpected just for for EFPs. Do you have any? Can you refresh my memory on why you all chose to do an EIS for these um, the EFPs? Instead of instead of a, an, an EA, yeah. To the vice chair, thank you, Mr. Niles, for the question. Yeah, I think kind of given the scope the scope on this, um, if you recall, we had a um, pair of modified longline EFP or EFPs that uh, did go out on the water that we issued. Um, we lost a litigation on that. It was mainly due to ESA consultations, although the court did note. Uh, that um, an EIS uh, may have been something that NIMS should have considered. Um, so we took that into consideration, along with the fact that uh, we had a suite of other EFPs that had been recommended for NIMS to consider and approve by the council that all uh, were kind of consistent with this type of modified gear. Uh, and so given that suite of bundle, we felt uh, a EIS was more appropriate. Further questions on the NIMS report? Don't see any. Thank you, Ryan. Next, we have a highly migratory species advisory subpanel report. Dave Rudy is online for do for that. Uh, Dave, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right. Thank you, council members. Uh, good afternoon. I'll try to make my statement brief instead of reading it. I'll try to summarize the points. I think this uh, draft EIS when completed will help the council's work in issuing future EFPs and developing new fishing practices and support the required transition program when drift nets are phased out in December of 2027. I believe also when this draft EIS is completed, it will support national oceanic and atmospheric administration's national seafood strategy goals of maintaining or increasing sustainable U.S. wild capture production and strengthening the, the entire seafood section. We're available for any questions. All right, thank you. Questions for Mr. Rudy on the subpanel report. Not seeing any questions. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. That completes our reports. I will confirm there is no public comment signed up. We are. There is no public comment. So that takes us to our council action, which I believe is discussion on this item. And I will look around to see if uh, <clears throat> there's any discussion that needs to be had. John Ugrens. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. And I just wanted to thank NIMS for the report and for their efforts in the deep set buoy gear 
authorization process as well as supporting the council EFP processes where we've made recommendations. We're looking forward to seeing those EFPs fished on the water to help inform our process in the future. Thank you, John. Further comments, discussion? Not seeing any. Uh, Dr. Dahl, does that complete our work here? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, it does. All right. Thank you. Then we'll close out I-1 and move directly into I-2. So uh, Dr. Dahl can keep the microphone turned on and give us an overview. Okay, thank you. Um, international management activities. Uh, the main focus here, the 20th regular session of the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission was held back in December. Um, myself and um, council member Ms. Fenson attended uh, her in her capacity as the U.S. Commissioner. Um, and so attachment one that was in the advanced briefing book is a um, outcomes document from that meeting provide, uh, provided or produced by the commission secretariat. And uh, attachment two simply flags items in that outcomes document that could, may be of particular interest to the council. So uh, it's a way of hon focusing in on um, the key items in what is a somewhat lengthy document. Uh, and uh, we've already heard from Mr. Hogan, so I don't really need to reiterate that. And he noted that bi bilateral meeting in November of last year and um, uh, the progress or lack thereof on um, negotiations for the fishing regime under the treaty. There is also a NIMS report uh, that describes U.S. priorities for upcoming regional fishery management organization meetings and provides a schedule for those meetings. And also some additional information on the U.S.-Canada Albacore Treaty negotiations. And um, I let me confirm, I think that is all of the materials uh, you have before you for this agenda item. Thank you. Any questions on the overview before we proceed? Not seeing any questions. I will look to Ms. Krista Spenson for a report on activities of the Western and Central Pacific Fish Commission. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to represent the council at WCPFC 20 in Rarotonga Cook Islands. It was a long but productive meeting. We unfortunately had a record-breaking late night and went until just after 3.30 a.m. on day last, which is something I certainly hope we never do here. However, we did achieve a three-year measure on tropical tunas, which will provide more room for negotiating other points this year. And we also adopted a harvest strategy for North Pacific albacore, which is something that our stakeholders across the board have been working on in the council process and beyond. Um, and that is noted in um, the agenda report item one, or I2, attachment two. Um, and now we'll be working on the harvest control rules. And I think it will be important for the council to provide room for our stakeholders to engage in that work leading up to uh, the July Northern Committee meeting. So that is something we may want to just think about when we're building space for our advisory panels. In terms of other future planning, um, I participate in several work groups within WCPFC, and I think that the two that are the most relevant to the council process are the EM and the ER work group and the labor working group. Beginning with EM and ER, if you're not familiar, that's electronic monitoring we all talk about, but electronic reporting is the other half of that. We're scheduled to have a meeting as part of the U.S. delegation on March 22nd. Um, and if you're interested in participating, you should contact Emily Reynolds at NOAA by March 13th, which is right around the corner. And the 
finer points of that are that we have a schedule of work that has been set out in Appendix 1 of the WCPFC report, and we you can find that under our agenda item I2, Attachment 1, if you're interested in more of the details of what that work group involves. The second piece of it is that we have been asked at, to develop a set of interim EM standards for adoption at WCPFC 21 at the end of this year, and that the commission noted there needed to be cooperation with IETTC in the development of those EM procedures. And I think that cooperation is something that is going to be vital for our Elbacor fleet, who is engaged in both of those RFMOs. Um, and that it will help them in terms of not having duplicate requirements potentially or redundancy in equipment or costs. Secondly, as the HMS subpanels don't meet in April, I think it will be beneficial in June to review PAC recommendations. Um, we will be, as part of the PAC, uh, making initial recommendations for the summer meetings. That would be Northern Committee, the Bluefin Work Group, the Scientific Committee, and uh, the Technical Committee. So um, it is probably worthwhile to think about those. And um, we will also be working on, although we have not set a date, developing crew labor standards. And the expectation is that we will have at least one proposal um, to go forward at WCPFC 21. Um, and finally, I will just mention again that the dates, if you're interested in going to Fiji and sitting in a conference room, uh, will be the 1st through 6th of December. I'm certainly looking forward to working with everyone in 2024 in this forum and on topics that are relevant to the council. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Benson on the report? Looks like they got it all. Thank you very much. Um, our next, next I will turn to Mr. Ryan Wolf for the NIMS reports. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, Krista, I did not envy your 3.30 a.m. session that beats our IATTC record, I think was 1.30 or 2. So um, hopefully we won't have to deal with that in our commission this year as well. Um, so our report one does provide a preliminary look at our priorities for that upcoming meeting it's scheduled August 26th through September 6th, 2024 in Panama. Although we just got an email today that that may be TBD, but as of right now, it's in Panama. Um, and we touch on the uh, US Canada North Pacific Albacore Treaty discussions that happened in Vancouver. Uh, but I won't speak further to that since you just got an update on uh, from Dave Hogan on the state of that. Uh, hopefully we'll have more information if we do see a concrete proposal coming forward. Um, and we'll bring that back to the Council at a future meeting. So this report does walk through at least some of our initial priorities and the potential proposals that we're considering. Uh, this is an early bite at the apple, if you will, for the council. Um, anticipate we'll have more refined report of where we are with potentially those proposals at the June meeting. But uh, we do know that tropical tuna measure is expiring, the bluefin measure is expiring. Uh, so we expect to be part uh, in potentially putting forward uh, US proposals on those. Uh, we also have a sea turtle resolution that was adopted uh, that the U.S. put forward a number of years ago um, that still needs to get a minimum circle hook size in. Um, the U.S. Uh, gave a little bit of a time for folks to consider it, given that the pandemic happened, um, but we plan to revisit uh, this and push that issue at the upcoming meeting. Uh, I just want to note, since Krista highlighted electronic monitoring, that is a priority for the U.S. the Commission. Uh, so just because it's not written here does not mean it isn't a, it isn't a priority for the U.S. We're just not expecting there to be any proposals on it at this year's meeting because the working group still has a little bit of time and scheduled upcoming meetings before it will make its recommendations, uh, hopefully potentially next year. <coughs> 
we will see at this meeting from the IATTC scientific staff updated stock assessments for yellowfin, big eye, and skipjack tuna. Um, we'll start to see those at the scientific advisory committee meeting in June of 2024. We also expect a draft executive summary of the Pacific Bluefin Tuna Stock Assessment to be presented at the SAC. Um, for that specific uh, assessment, uh, that needs to be endorsed by the International Scientific Committee for Tuna and Tuna-like Species in the North Pacific, or the ISC, and that plenary will be later in June. It'll be after our Scientific Advisory Committee. Uh, and we'll use the stock assessment information there to inform any U.S. proposals for the IATTC annual meeting. Uh, and we'll um, present the results of those assessments uh, back to the council at a future meeting. Um, I will highlight, though, uh, not in our report as it relates to the ISC and completed stock assessments and may be relevant for our next agenda item. Um, there was a completed stock assessment for North Pacific swordfish in summer of 2023. Um, uh, we'll go over this and the stock status criteria with the council in September, um, but that is available on the, on the ISC's website. It does indicate that spawning stock biomass of North Pacific swordfish is two and a half times the level estimated to produce maximum sustainable yield. Uh, and current fishing mortality is estimated to be only 49% of the level expected to produce ma maximum sustainable yield. Um, so definitely, I think the assessment says it is greater than 99% chance it is not overfished and no overfishing is occurring, which I guess is as certain as scientists can tell you they can be greater than 99%. Um, lastly, I do want to acknowledge uh, just a personnel thing on the IATTC delegation on one of our commissioners, as you're well aware, Bill Fox uh, retired last year. Uh, Dorothy Loma did step in to take his place at the last meeting, um, but we have... Uh, uh, formally appointed uh, Ms. Shana Miller uh, to take over uh, for Bill Fox. Uh, she has received her alternate commissionership from the State Department as of February 14th. Uh, Ms. Lohman, uh, can't thank Dorothy enough, of course, for everything she brought to our delegation at the last meeting. Um, she's also, of course, still involved with the commission and our delegation, and she remains and will remain uh, over the coming year in the important role as our co-chair of the joint working group between the IETTC and the WCPFC on Pacific Bluefin Tuna. And she'll be helping us steer through a very uh, challenging um, and I'm sure lively discussion in Kishiro, Japan um, uh, in mid-July. And that concludes my report. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Wolf on the NIMS report. Krista Svensson. Thank you. And thank you for the report. I did have a question around electronic monitoring and reporting. Uh, it's related to WCPFC and Conservation Measure 2022-06. Uh, for those of you that don't know it as well, this is the requirement that we begin having electronic reporting um, in terms of logs for troll vessels beginning January 1, 2025. So i um, wondering if you could provide an update or if there will be any impact in terms of what the council needs to do on, on that particular item. Yeah, to the vice chair, thank you, Ms. Vincent, for the question. Uh, yeah, we are aware of this. Um, we uh, are considering how best to implement these e-reporting requirements for the West Coast-based Albacore troll fleet, because I. Uh, it believe this up only applies to those fishing in the WCPC PFC convention area, but I think between 2017 and 21, we had about 10 or 19 vessels that did that. So we are going to have to figure out uh, how to do that. Um, we are working through a few things with our colleagues in the Pacific Islands region. And since there's no HMS scheduled for the April council meeting, we'll be able to provide more detailed update at the June meeting on this. Thank you. Further questions? Not seeing any. Thank you, Ryan. That completes all our reports, confirming that there is no public comment. I don't see any, that's correct. So on this agenda item, we can move into our council discussion. And There it is. <clears throat> Any recommendations on US positions? 
We'll look to see if there are any hands that want to initiate discussion or have comments. Not seeing it. Oh, Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I guess you don't want silence to um, come off as a lack of interest. It's, I think, as usual, we're, we're um, pleased and um, grateful for the the work of the of National Marine Fisheries Service and the U.S. delegation and Krista and, and Dorothy representing us in these in these various places and don't have much to add. I guess we did get the update under the the last agenda item from, from Dave Hogan. It's also brought up here in the NIPS report. So I think that was good news to hear that on the U.S. Albuquerque Treaty that there we didn't know if there was going to be any additional discussions in time possibly for this season. But it's encouraging to hear that that, that talks um, may 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 occur and there's definitely potential for benefits from both sides if if those happen and i think i heard uh, dave say that he would notify i believe chris is our rep for that as well that if if there are developments so that was i uh, just wanted to note we we heard that and it was encouraging thank you thank you corey further comments not seeing any i'm not going to push this to set a rec beat the 3 a.m. record. So, <laughs> Kit, how have we done? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, yeah, I think you've done fine, and there probably wasn't a lot of need for extensive discussion or the development of uh, recommendations since there aren't any imminent uh, significant international activities between now and June. Um, I think June will be a more significant uh, Opportunity for the council to make recommendations as suggested by Mr. Wolf and Ms. Svensson, given the over summer activities related to bluefin and other northern stocks. So um, we can close out this one. All right. Thank you, Dr. Dahl. I will close this out and pass the gavel back to our chair. Great work by Vice uh, Chair Hasmer. You, you caught us up. And then some. Um, well, you mentioned it earlier in the first part of the meeting. Um, we do have some people new in their seats. Um, Justin Ainsworth from ODFW. So, Justin, welcome. And there are Mary uh, Capdeville in the, uh, the GC seat. So, welcome. All right. So, uh, with that, I'm going to ask Kit to uh, head us or start us off on I3. Kit. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll read the summary for this item, which is uh, the HMS Roadmap Workshop Final Planning. Starting last year with input from the HMS MT and advisory subpanel, the council has been planning a workshop as part of its HMS Roadmap. In November 2020, of last year, 2023, the council reviewed proposed workshop goals, objectives, and a preliminary agenda and provided guidance on revisions to the goals. The HMSMT met by webinar in January to revise the goals and catalog related actions. Um, that is reflected in their report one, which was in the advanced briefing book. And they um, provide, it's, they intend to provide more it says a detailed agenda, but I think that's not quite true. Uh, but more information about uh, the um, ideas around the workshop, along with a glossary of terms to support workshop discussions in a supplemental report, which they indeed um, developed when they met last, well, now a week before last um, online. In consultation with the HMSMT and HMSAS, council staff has has proposed holding the meeting June 6th and 7th at the same location at, as the June 8th through 13 council meeting in San Diego. This would be a lower cost approach to supporting the workshop with travel support just for the two advisory bodies in conjunction with their travel to the council meeting. Um, and we managed to find meeting space that it's um, accommodated as part of our 
contract with the hotel for the council meeting. Council staff submitted a proposal to receive inflation and Inflation Reduction Act funding uh, allocated to fishery management councils. And uh, this workshop is included as part of the proposals that were submitted. Uh, this funding, you are already aware of this. I think that there was some discussion under yesterday under the ecosystem items about this, but uh, it's close. The funding is closely tied to sporting climate ready fisheries, which is one of the purposes of the workshop. The Council should review the recommendations in the HMSMT reports, uh, and there's also a supplemental HMSAOS report. Adopt the goals for the workshop and consider workshop logistics in terms of timing, location, and participation. Uh, the Council also recommended contracting with a meeting facilitator, and um, I believe uh, the executive director may speak to that. Um, so I've already referenced the available um, ma uh, materials, which are the two HMSMT reports, as well as a supplemental HMSAS report. And to conclude, the Council action list here is adopt final workshop goals and objectives, provide guidance on next stop, uh, provide guidance on next steps as appropriate. Okay, questions for Kit on the overview? All right, that will take us to the uh, HMS management team report and uh, Jessica Watson. Jessica. Yeah, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? We certainly can. Welcome. Really. Great. Uh, so good afternoon, uh, members of the council. For the record, my name is Jessica Watson, and I will be summarizing uh, the HMSMT report one and supplemental report two under this agenda item, and we have a presentation to help with that. Okay. Perfect. Um, so these reports both discuss both the HMS roadmap and the roadmap workshop. And the team has really viewed the purpose of the workshop uh, to be moving towards addressing the goals of the HMS roadmap. Um, so these topics are a bit intertwined. And so in attempt to try and keep these interrelated items separated, uh, in this presentation, um, we'll kind of go through the, what the team is requesting for council guidance in three parts. The first being the team's requests from the council with regards to the roadmap. The second, the team's requests uh, with regards to the workshop. And third, um, seeking some um, guidance on the appendix of terms intended to insist in the development of both the roadmap and the workshop. Next slide, slide please. So first off, let's just focus on the council guidance needed for the HMS roadmap, not the workshop. Next slide, slide please. So the swordfish management and monitoring um, plan had utility in providing a prioritization of management actions in a living document to which the council and its advisory bodies, the public and NIMPS could refer to as new actions were considered. As a living document in the same vein, uh, the HMS roadmap and its associated actions can benefit from a periodic review, revision, and discussion. Uh, in its November report uh, in 2023 under this agenda item, uh, F3, report one, the team created a table that you see here on this slide of action and sub-action items from the SMMP and designated them as either complete, relevant, or no longer relevant, or needs council discussion. Uh, those that you see on the slide are those that we were requesting council provide guidance on for this that last category of need um, additional discussion. And so we are asking council to provide clarity on these remaining items for the development of the HMS roadmap. The team recognizes that while the roadmap action items drafted um, in the team report are not an exhaustive list, uh, they're meant to be kind of the basis for further council discussion. And that being said, the team believes that any additional modifications or deletions to the action items that are currently included on, in our report one um, should take place potentially after the workshop to allow for consideration of workshop discussion and, and outcomes. So just to be clear, the ones highlighted here, we're looking for guidance now, the one in this table, the ones in, included in the body of our first 
report, if it was in the advanced briefing, briefing book, uh, HMS report one, um, we think that that could be deferred uh, as just kind of a starting place and revisited later. Next slide. So the team recommends the council discuss and provide guidance um, on how to incorporate the DriftNet Act in the HMS roadmap and workshop. And this is in our report one. Um, and kind of in addition to those SMMP sub action items that I just mentioned, um, the council has discussed the DGN transition program as required by the DriftNet Act during the September 2023 council meeting under agenda item I-4. Uh, to date, the team has not received any direction as whether this topic should be considered in the context of the roadmap. However, council input on the connection of this topic and the HMS roadmap document could further benefit workshop planning. Later in the presentation, I'll highlight the team's recommendations for workshop goals and agenda topics for consideration. Next slide, please. At the November council meeting, the council requested the team consider edits and comments from both the California Department of Fish and Wildlife report submitted under agenda item uh, F3, as well as public comment and bring the council proposed revisions to those HMS roadmap goals at this meeting here in March. Um, as you can see, our goals are now listed here from our report. Uh, there are now five proposed goals, A through E. The original goal C combined two distinct concepts. Thus, it was um, decided that splitting that into two separate goals better captured the intent of each component of the original goal and allowed for action items to better be developed to inform um, each aspect differently. In multiple meetings and webinar, the team and the advisory sub panel and the public have provided input, comments, and recommendations for the goals of the roadmap. And the exact phrasing and use of specific terms and words in the draft goals provided in this um, HMSMT report one were discussed extensively at all of our webinars and meetings. Um, so to provide some clarity, um, as to their use in the context of the roadmap, the team provided um, the following explanations for each goal that are included in our supplemental report too, um, which I'll walk through next. Next slide, please. So the first is with regards to the use of the term multi-species and the rationale for the inclusion of this term multi-species used in goal A, highlighted on the screen, was to convey an explicit intent to support innovation and development of fishing practices capable of harvesting a wide array of marketable species that are generally harvested by the drift gillnet fishery, rather than solely focus on highly selective fishing methods, um, i.e. those that are primarily targeting uh, target or catch a single species, such as harpoon or deep set buoy gear, which are considered and addressed under goal C um, in the discussion of a diverse range of HMS fishing methods. Next slide, please. So the next is the term West Coast based or West Coast HMS fisheries and the rationale for inclusion of these terms uh, is, is that they are the same, is that West Coast based and West Coast HMS fisheries are the same in that not all HMS fisheries, which make landings to the US mainland fish exclusively in the uh, EEZ. Since the team does not consider innovation and development to pertain only to new fishing methods, but also to existing fishing operations that can be improved through innovation, uh, the West Coast based and West Coast uh, HMS fisheries allows for consideration of all vessels, gears, and fisheries under the council's purview. Next slide, please. So the rationale for including um, the terms economically viable and economic viability is that while economic viability can be different for different individuals, is that it can be different for different individuals. Um, the council has spoke to the importance of this consideration in its management of HMS, including in the SMMP goals, as well as during council discussion. So goal B and C are each striving to achieve a balance between economic viability and a second objective, both of which must be achieved in order to meet that goal. So for goal B, the balance is economic viability and bycatch minimization um, at the scale of individual fishing practice or sector, while goal Goal C really balances economic viability and the diversity of fishing methods at the scale of kind of multi-sector fisheries. Next slide, thank you. 
Um, the use of the term traditional fishery participants centered around the HMS AS's voiced concern that once the DGN fishery has been phased out, individuals who participated in that fishery may no longer have the opportunity to provide their input to inform decisions on future development or management of swordfish or other HMS fisheries. And the intent is to ensure inclusion of their extensive experience and knowledge during future discussions and management actions. This includes development of alternative fishing practices that replace the opportunity lost by DGN fishery participants and facilitates their transition from DGN to other gear types. Next slide, please. So the team is asking the council to discuss these goals and provide input or guidance to incorporate them so that they may be adopted prior to the workshop as goals are a fundamental to having a focused and successful potential workshop. Next slide, please. So the SMMP had utility in providing, like I said, that prioritization of management actions in a living document, uh, which the council has used and referenced. Um, and the action items provided under the draft goals in the team's November report are now shown here. And these are what I was discussing um, previously. Since many of these action items could address multiple goals, the team um, decided um, not to, that combined them to a single list and attempted to group the similar actions together while ensuring that each one supported at least one of the HMS roadmap goals as indicated at the end of each action and summarized in table one of our report one. The team recognizes that while action items drafted with the AS are not an exhaustive list and are meant to be the basis for further council discussions, some of those items may not be needed. And so we had some discussion mainly around 1A through C as they kind of represent work that's already being completed by the team or maybe unnecessarily in the future for management of the DGN fishery. So those discussions did happen, um, but we chose to leave them in here for now. And the team is requesting that the council provide input or guidance on these draft action item organization. However, we suggest that, again, any modifications or deletions of these action items should take place after the workshop to allow for consideration of workshop discussion and outcomes. Next slide. Okay, so now let's focus on the council guidance needed for the HMS roadmap workshop. So I'm gonna use hopefully just workshop here. Next slide. Uh, at the November Council meeting, the team presented goals for the HMS uh, workshop, and that was in agenda item F3A, uh, Supplemental Report 2. And the team still recommends that the workshop focus on the topics expressed in kind of the first two bullets listed uh, on this slide, with the third one being a component of the workshop, of the workshop um, and roadmap, and that's kind of that appendix of terms. Next slide, please. So developing an exempted fishing permit uh, or strategy is the first step in supporting innovation in fishery under the council's HMS roadmap goals and should be taken into consideration um, the timeline for the transition away from DGN required um, by the Drift Gill Net Act. And so some potential specific agenda items concerning EFPs and the council's broader outlook of HMS fisheries under the roadmap workshop then could include um, some of these uh, agenda topics listed above, which include discussing and identifying the aspects of EFPs that may be limiting participation, develop guidance or reporting forms for EFPs that convey information useful for council and NIMS review, uh, discuss criteria by which the council might recommend NIMS prioritize consideration of EFPs and consider performance standards that the council would like to see EFPs make as relevant to authorization of new gear types. Next slide, please. The team requests uh, to continue working with the council uh, staff and the meeting facilitator in crafting a final agenda to meet the workshop goals and take into consideration not only those that I just previously mentioned as topics, but also those from our um, previous supplemental report from November as we think that those are still relevant to meet those goals that we have previously proposed. Next slide, please. Finally, let's focus on the council guidance ne needed for both like the roadmap and the workshop. Next slide. Um, so we are very cognizant that um, the value laden terms listed in the appendix section of our supplemental report are compiled from um, the draft HMS roadmap goals and action items, as well as from a joint discussion with the HMS AS during their development. So we created this appendix of terms. Um, and the goal 
of the team in developing a list of terms with the AS was to provide clear understanding of how these terms are used within joint discussions of the roadmap during development and when discussing certain topics. And the team seeks guidance from the council on reconciling shared terms in both our report and the HMS AS report under this agenda item. And the team is supportive of the inclusion of additional terms proposed by the AS, like underutilized resource and trade leakage slash transfer effect, and the associated definitions proposed by the AS, in addition to the list of terms and definitions proposed by the team, which are listed um, in our report too. Next slide. With that, we'd be happy to take any questions. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Jessica. Uh, questions on the HMS management team report. Corey Writings. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Ms. Watson, for your presentation and really appreciate the PowerPoint. That really helps get through the material. Um, my question is when you were uh, looking at, and I apologize, I don't think the slides have numbers, or at least not on my screen, but looking at the slide that says uh, workshop objectives and agenda on the page, the HMS request the council clarify the goals. And <clears throat> it says um, the first bullet says a streamlined and flexible EFP strategy. Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean there? I'm thinking that we already have a pretty streamlined and flexible EFP strategy now, which may even be part of the problem. Um, and as I'm reading the rest of the reports, I'm wondering, you know, is maybe innovative or transparent or defined or just trying to get a better understanding of how those words come together, just recognizing that these three bullets are really the core of what we might be doing as part of a workshop. And so would like to hear a little bit more from you if that's possible. It sounds like the group talked about these in quite depth, which is fantastic. So thanks. Yeah, through the chair. Thanks, Ms. Writings, for the question. Um, yeah, so to your point, that first uh, bullet is really kind of focused on developing developing an exempted fishing permit strategy that is kind of the first step in supporting innovation in the fishery under the council's roadmap goals and should be taken in, into kind of consideration in kind of that timeline and thinking about the transition of the DGN um, required under the DriftNet Act. So really you can think of this as bullet number two is kind of the stage in which bullet number one is being considered and bullet number three on this slide are the terms that everyone can use to have a conversation about developing uh, bullet number one. And when talking about what an, uh, developing what we meant by EFP strategy to support, um, I think if you go to the next slide, we kind of talk about that a little bit more in detail of what that might look like. And really it's thinking about that council EFP strategy and like discussing the aspects of EFPs that may be limiting that participation. Um, we've heard a lot of our conversations with the AS about ways in which EFPs are potentially not economically viable. So trying to come up you know, with under, an understanding at the council level of what, what could be limiting that participation. Um, also developing kind of guidance or reporting forms for EFPs that could convey information that's useful for the council and NIMS review in the applications and EFP reports. Um, so kind of thinking about that component is also a way to think about how to, you know, develop the strategy. And then when discussing the criteria by which the council might recommend NIMS prioritize consideration of EFPs. So really it's really focused on this council level. What does the council want to see from the EFP program and where does the council's priorities lie um, and what um, potential performance standards does the council, um, would the council like to see out of EFPs to meet, rel like that they would want met to uh, make uh, recommendations for authorization of new gear types in the future. So trying to have everyone have a clear understanding of where the council's would like to see um, some of this innovation move forward. Hopefully that answers your question. It does, thank you. I, I appreciate that clarity. Thank you, Corey. Anyone else? Chris Stinson. Thank you, and it's actually on the same slide. Um, just curious around the clarifying definitions um, 
why you chose to go the route of providing definitions um, rather than going with maybe other more standardized definitions. So just kind of the advisory management team's thoughts on that one would be helpful. Yeah, through the chair. Thanks, Ms. Svensson, for the question. We find that when we have a lot of discussions, um, uh, broader discussions, it's really important to know what definition we're using, if we're using an MSA definition or if we're using uh, a different, uh, more broad version of a term. And so that's why we really thought it's important through when thinking about trying to have open dialogues and discussions and have clear communication with different groups to kind of have these this terms appendix with specified terms and definitions so everyone understands what is meant when a certain term is used or at least can reference that. Um, so it was just really to promote more effective communication so that we don't spend a lot of time in the development discussions or in a workshop scenario um, trying to come up with what is meant when someone uses a specific term, because we do acknowledge that a lot of the terms in the term appendix can be very value laden, depending on who you're talking to. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Krista. Anyone else? Vice Chair Asper. Thank you, Chair Penninger, and glad that slide is still up there. Uh, my question probably relates to that. Hi, Jessica. Um, the, the workshop goals focus on the process, the EFPs and just an EFP process to streamline that. Did the group also talk about um, other ideas that might be explored? Uh, what comes to mind is achieving optimum yield or economic viability. Um, I think maybe some of the context for it in the, one of the last agenda items we heard that the North Pacific swordfish uh, um, spawning biomass is two and a half times MSY. Um, I don't know about other marketable species, but um, moving uh, methods to get us towards optimum yield, sustainable fisheries, economic viability, uh, along with the process here. This just seems more focused on a process we go through that may limit exploration of a wide range of uh, opportunities to increase yield in the fisheries. Thank you. Through the chair. Thanks, Vice Chair. Hasmer for that question. Um, we've had a, a lot of discussion around that. I think to your point, um, there are a lot of actions that have been developed and could be further refined and developed under the roadmap for goals um, to kind of address the optimum yield question you're talking about there. Um, the reason why uh, both the MT and the AS kind of came together on this focus on EFPs is kind of that first step. And the first step we can kind of take in kind of promoting innovation and thinking about what gears need to be innovated to help have methods that could meet those optimum yield objectives. And so though there are other actions, I would say in the action item list that you know could also do that, this was kind of the first step we thought that could be taken to try and move forward with addressing a lot of different components there and, and trying to start those, those discussions early and often of what the council's looking for in addition um, to not only wanting to obtain maximum yield, but or optimum yield, but also what types of gear types the council's looking for in authorized fisheries to do that. Thank you. AP, Corey Writings. Thanks, Chair Pettinger. Um, thanks again, Jessica. Um, my question is echoing Ms. Fenson's in terms of the definitions, and I'm looking at the list of definitions that are in the report and sort of some are cited, some are not. Um, I appreciated your answer earlier about why these might be important for the process. Um, but I'm, I'm questioning the need for some of them and sort of where they came from. So I'm wondering if you, I'm looking at, for example, uh, the term climate ready fishery 
and wondering where that definition came from, um, especially in light of uh, how Mr. Dahl opened this up for us and knowing that part of this project will be funded and with the intention of working under the IRA funds. To the chair, thanks for the question, Ms. Ridings. Yeah, so there is a lot of, um, we had a lot of questions around climate ready fisheries, um, specifically when we were in a joint session with the AS developing the goals as one of those goals does address climate ready uh, fisheries. And so this definition, if my memory serves me correctly, was um, kind of a bit of a combination of some of the accepted definitions that are currently out there through um, NIMPS, as well as I want to say the Environmental Defense Fund, but please don't quote me on that one. Um, but we did go through several definitions to come up with these definitions um, on what seemed most pertinent and relevant uh, for this council and thinking about um, HMS fisheries and how we were going to be framing this um, with considerations of the IRA funding, because we had previously said that um, that climate ready uh, focus of that goal would potentially be fit under those funds. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay. What else? Corey Lyles. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Uh, Chair, and thank you, Jessica. Um, I guess, you know, I've, I've been around for a while and um, gone from the swordfish plans now to the HMS roadmap. And um, your, your mention of the climate ready goals got me thinking, well, geez, are we, you know, if you look at a if you plot revenues the last 10 years using a bar chart, for example, um, albacore tuna will, will be so high that you'll barely see any of the other species revenues. Um, Albacore is also, you know, probably very widely, you know, in the Northwest in a particular important part of uh, the revenue portfolio of a lot of boats. So we spend a lot, we don't spend a lot of time talking about Albacore, but I was just wondering if the, um, if you had, if you had all thought about um, how Albacore might eventually fit into this roadmap and in, in that, in that goal D, the climate ready fisheries or other pieces of the roadmap. Through the chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Niles, for the question. Um, we didn't have very much in-depth discussions about albacore, um, but I will say as two of our HMS, <laughs> our team members also sit on the ecosystem work group, I think albacore is there from a um, shifting distribution perspective, as you mentioned. So I think that is why incorporation of that climate ready goal kind of encompasses a lot of uh, broader context for HMS and how things may be changing in future climate conditions. Okay. <clears throat> Executive Director Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you, Ms. Watson. This presentation is uh, really helpful for organizing several thoughts that have been rattling around in my head. Um, the slide that is up now is the focus of, I think, a lot of questions and um, probably a good focus for mine too. Uh, the team is focusing a lot on EFPs and I, I think rightly so, you know, as I think about um, what we're trying to do here, it's clear to me that EFPs should, should play a, a key role. What I'm thinking about here is in the agenda, there's been some thought taken to um, how we would go about redesigning our EFP process. And um, I think that's the right question. When I've gone through exercises like this before, there are usually two parts. When I think of it as the first part being the diagnosis and the second part being the design. And so that first part of diagnosis is what's the problem and why doesn't this work for us now? And that really shines a bright light on what we need to do, which helps you with the design. Um, so I'm wondering if you're following my, my thought process, has that has the team thought of it in terms that are similar? And if so, where would I where would I look for that sort of problem identification, diagnosis, thought process before we get to the the redesign of our EFP EFP system? 
Thanks. Thank you for the question, Director Burden. Um, I don't think what we're proposing here is a full redesign of the EFP program. I think what we're proposing here is for council to consider what they're looking for out of EFPs when thinking about potential new fisheries to authorize. Um, so to your first question, I think um, on the next slide after this one, we have one of the potential specific agenda topics could be discuss and identify the aspects of EFPs that may be limiting participation. And that could have a much broader discussion, which I think you're kind of um, summarizing a bit, or hopefully I'm interpreting that, that correctly, of what currently are the roadblocks in this um, roadmap to reaching some of these goals. Um, so I think that's kind of where our team discussion has been focusing in on not that this is trying to redo or take over the EFP process, but more this is what does the council want to see um, out of EFP so that it can move forward um, with uh, kind of broadening those gear types and you know different fishing, fishing sectors. Hopefully that answers your question. If not, feel free to follow up. <laughs> Okay. All right. Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to let you off the hook. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, and uh, thank you, by the way, for the great presentation. It was really good. It's really good. So I just got. Uh, next is uh, Dave Rudy and the HMS AS report. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Pettinger and uh, Council members. Um, the interest of saving time, I will not read my whole report. I'll just kind of hit the highlights on it and our recommendations. First, uh, we recommend the council adopt the HMS roadmap goals listed by the HSMMT in their advanced briefing book report number one. Number two, deferring the consideration of HMS roadmap action items listed in the HMSMT report, we think it's premature for the council to begin prioritizing action items, especially until after the workshop. Provide necessary guidance to allow finalizing of the list of definitions provided in the HMSMT supplemental report to facilitate workshop discussion. Proposed revisions to the definitions provided by the HMSMT are included in our attachment to this report. Fourth, focus on the proposed HMS roadmap workshop on development and testing of alternative gear types for catching HMS, recognizing the imminent need for DriftNet DGN fishery participants to transition to other economically viable gear types. Five, maximize industry stakeholder participation through significant outreach and minimizing of out-of-pocket costs to participate in the workshop. Holding the workshop in conjunction with the June council meeting would be appropriate. And we also are, would recommend the council have a steering committee that includes stakeholders in the development of the workshop details. And that's my summary of our, our report. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Questions for Dave on the AP report? Oh, I'm sorry. Vice Chair Hasselberg. Thank you, Chair Benninger. Uh, Dave, you didn't read it, but uh, thanks for the report. I'm going down to the question on page two. Under the HMS workshop, the first paragraph there, and, and I'll just have to read it here. We expect the workshop focus on alternative gear types would be furthered by developing recommended parameters the council wants to see for activities undertaken through EFPs. Um, can you expand a little bit on what those parameters are? And if some of those parameters are something that could come out of a workshop to advise the council, um, I'm just wondering about the thinking there. Yeah, thank you for the question through the chair. Um, yes, primarily since the fishermen will not be allowed to use nets anymore, they need to use hooks. I don't think harpoons are gonna bring in any volume of swordfish that will be close to optimum yield. So it's really the question of how many hooks can they use and where can they put the hooks? So if they're limited to right now 10 hooks and deep set buoy gear, it's really not gonna produce that many fish. Whereas if the fishermen 
um, would like to use probably something closer to a long line, but it's unlikely the council will approve that. So we need to be somewhere between the deep set buoy gear and the long line. So can they use 300 hooks? Can they use 500 hooks? Can they be five miles offshore? Can they be three miles offshore? Do they have to be 20 miles offshore? These are the important factors that the fishermen are looking at to see if they can make a living fishing with hooks. And the fishermen, I believe in the workshop will, will tell us more about what, what they need to catch HMS species without nets. And hopefully that workshop will then inform the council process to support uh, EFPs that are appropriate using higher numbers of hooks at the same time, you know, finding ways to reduce bycatch. That, that was sort of what we were getting at as far as um, feedback from the council as far as what, what, what's allowable and what, what is possible. And hopefully we can innovate and, and come up with some new, new fishing practices that achieve the goals of the council of increasing the catch of HMS species at the same time uh, having not uh, large amounts of bycatch and at the same time, you know, not having to import so much fish and support our local fishermen. Thank you. Okay. Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Dave. I guess um, someone asked a similar question of the team about these definitions, and I have not crosswalked them, but it seems to your report suggests they're different. And I just, this is a genuine question of the purpose, but like I'm, um, what, for example, where, where do you guys see the value in defining terms like fish um, and minimize in this way? Like, how, how is this, are you expecting this to, um, to, to help discussions at this, at this workshop and further along? And again, really curious, I mean, not seeing it and wanting to know um, where, where you all are seeing the value of having these definitions would be. Uh, thank you, Mr. Niles, through the chair. Yes, our definition is very similar to uh, the management team. There's some few minor differences, but the main reason we wanted to have uh, these things defined is in the public arena when sometimes these fisheries are discussed, uh, it seems that different definitions are used for things like bycatch. And we wanted to make sure that the terms were uniform in the discussion so we can have a transparent discussion of of what, what uh, the council expects and from a fisherman viewpoint also to what's, what they believe is achievable in terms of uh, successful fisheries. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Corey. Anyone else? All right, I'm not seeing any hands. David, thank you. Thank you. That takes the public comment. I know we have one. I believe so. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Pettinger. I was just about ready to announce you, Latrice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, well, welcome. Thank you, Chair Pettinger and members of the council. Um, I submitted a letter on behalf of Wild Oceans, and I first I really want to thank the management team for their um, advanced briefing book report. Um, by having a, a really detailed report and asking the council some pointed questions, it allowed, it allowed us to um, think about those questions and provide written comments to the council ahead of the meeting. And I really appreciated um, all of their effort ahead of time. And it's always hardest to actually put in the draft work and then let somebody else um, make comments on it. So I want to thank the management team for that. Um, and just briefly here, since you already have, um, have our letter, um, I did uh, provide input on the uh, management team's questions. Um, including some clarifications for the goals. And I thank the team for their responses to some of my questions. I look forward, or some of my comments, I look forward to the council's discussion. Um, and I think some of these are, are, are really important discussions. Um, you know, having a goal that, that, that includes like the development of multi-species HMS. I just always have concern that 
uh, reverse from the, the team that we are excluding single species fishing methods. And I just want to make that explicit. Um, many of our HMS fisheries are actually single species fisheries and very, very uh, sustainable and well-managed and, and um, high yielding fisheries for things like albacore and, and bluefin tuna. So I, I, on the flip side, you know, want to make sure that our goals are um, specific enough and um, uh, to the council's, you know, to the council process. Um, the uh, input, they also ask for input on action items, and I hear their comments to like hold off on, on further clarification of action items until after um, their workshop. Uh, overall, I think there are a lot of action items in that work in the, in the roadmap. There are, I think, 27, and it would behoove us to eventually pare that down to what are the action items that really get at these goals in the next five, 10 years um, so that we can focus our efforts. Um, they also asked for um, uh, feedback on whether to include some uh, outstanding SMMP sub actions around long lines in uh, the new roadmap. And uh, we would recommend the council not include the four outstanding swordfish management and monitoring plan sub actions in the roadmap. And I've, I've laid out our rationale for that in our letter. And, you know, mostly just I'm really appreciative of the process and, and hearing the team and the AS sort of coalesce around this workshop should focus on exempted fishing permits. Um, I like uh, Director Burden's idea of like, what is the problem? And for us, the problem has been um, there, there's sort of this very wide, um, broad call for EFPs without a, a discussion amongst the council and members of the community of what are we really looking for here? So if the advisory sub panel says, you know, well, tell us how many hooks uh, are good in the water. I also say, well, let's identify other, you know, gear characteristics at this workshop that are, are sustainable gear characteristics that uh, the council wants to see incorporated into EFP. So I think there's a lot of potential to um, give a lot of guidance at, at a workshop of um, what types of gear uh, we want people to be, be testing and what outcomes, you know, what we're looking for in terms of um, target species catch and bycatch reduction. So uh, I'm glad to hear this workshop is focusing and I um, uh, look forward to attending when it's scheduled. So I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Questions for Teresa on her testimony? Oh, Corey Ridings. Thanks, Chair Pettinger. I actually don't have any questions. I just, Teresa, just wanted to thank you for giving testimony and for the report. Um, it is useful to have these things in advance and you have obviously been working on this for a long time and appreciate your engagement and the thoroughness of your letter. So thanks very much. <clears throat> Thanks, Corey. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, Teresa. Okay, that takes care of public comment, I believe, and uh, takes the council action, which is <laughs> which is before you. So, open the floor for discussion. John Ugritz, but I want to see Marcy Rumko, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <We're> thank <laughs> you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, you know, I really appreciate all the work our advisory bodies and others, the public, um, have put into considering this issue. We've been talking about it a long time. And I think the goals that the team has provided for moving us forward are really close. I, I do actually have some ideas for some final edits that I want to present today. Um, for consideration. Um, but looking first at the, uh, the workshop and roadmap, um, I, I do want to say, because it comes up in, in the team report and a variety of other places, that I do not see this roadmap as specifically tied to the DriftNet Act. Um, and I really don't think it should focus on 
a transition program. We've discussed that on the floor in the past. Um, there is no funding federally for a transition program. Um, if that does happen, I absolutely want this council to be a part of it, but not at this time. Um, I really think that the overarching purpose has been to focus on how we develop new gears. And one major way to do that is through the EFP process. I also think that um, looking at past swordfish monitoring management plan actions that are either unnecessary due to the sunsetting of the DGN fishery or have already been discussed at great length in this council process is ill-advised. Um, and I would not recommend doing that at this workshop or you know, in, in the roadmap. Um, I think that specific discussions on ranking the action items that the team has put forward or adopting definitions right now is not the right time. I think that's something that could be discussed either at the road, at the workshop or at follow on discussions from it um, and be adopted when we adopt a final roadmap. Um, we have, however, talked a lot about EFPs and the need for a framework for this council to better achieve that goal of, of increasing supply of HMS. Um, off our coast. And um, I think as as was noted in the management team's response to Execu Executive Director Burden's question, it's not about changing the process in its in itself. It's about focusing that process in. And as we've heard um, from Teresa and others in the past about developing some metrics that we can use when considering EFPs. And so if I if I look at the workshop in my mind, um, it really does come down to a series of questions that could be asked about EFPs. Things like, you know, what should the council consider when reviewing HMF, HMS EFP requests and what sorts of EFPs might we want to see specifically? Um, what should the council consider when examining EFP performance? And, including things like defining what is acceptable levels of bycatch or defining what is a successful EFP in terms of economic performance, marketability of the catch, uh, social constraints, gear conflicts, and a host of other things. Um, and then are there ways to, to streamline the EFP process? Uh, if there's things that we're doing now that are cumbersome, I'd, I'd like to know. Um, and I think others could weigh in on that. Um, I think in order to do that, we need time off the council floor. We've said this before. Um, I think we're moving towards that, and I think we've made some strides. I do think the participation and who discusses that needs to be broad. Um, and, and I think with that, I'll let others talk. Thanks, John. Chris Fitzgerald. Yeah, thank you. Um, I am also supportive of decoupling the DGN transition from the workshop. I th think I've certainly been advocating for how do we get swordfish and other HMS species in terms of opportunity um, for reaching OY out in the public in terms of, of testimony and, and advocacy for that, for more than just the DGN fishery. And I think the testimony that we've heard over time um, supports that. And I, I do wanna reflect just for a moment on the testimony we heard a moment ago um, around moving, moving forward. Um, when I'm thinking about multiple HMS species, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm thinking about them all at one time, um, but there are a whole host of species out there that we have historically targeted um, or that have been marketable species. Um, so OPA comes to mind as an easy one to talk about. Um, that we don't particularly have a game plan or path forward with. And so do I expect us to talk about OPA or any of those in the workshop? Not necessarily, but I, I don't want to leave the impression that, hey, when I'm talking about multiple species, 
that it's a, a fixed idea. Um, and I would encourage others to, when they're thinking about how do we capitalize on this opportunity um, that is available. And we've heard throughout the week from a number of fishermen, um, commercial, recreational, charter, about the lack of opportunity. How do we create that? And I, I see this workshop as a path for moving forward with that. Um, and I do think that the EFP process is important to think about. Um, we have EFPs that are taking years to get through the process, um, having to come back to us multiple times because we were not maybe as clear as we could have been uh, in what we were looking for. I think that's discouraging to fishermen. Um, I think it's discouraging in some cases to the public. I think it's confusing for everybody. And in, in some ways it makes more work for ourselves. So I'm, I'm excited um, about the concept. And I do think uh, EFPs at the end of the day, if we wanna get more fish out of the water are the way we're going to get more fish out of the water. So I, um, in listening to our, management team in terms of why they chose that as kind of that first step and am feeling very supportive of that. Okay, thanks, Krista. Bob Dooley, then uh, Vice Chair Asper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess the, the thing that troubles me in this whole discussion that keeps circling around is, um, the prescriptive nature of what we object to being used. I get, I get the DGN part of it, but from my point of view, I don't care if they use a butterfly net. I want the performance. I want the limitation of, you know, the uh, of bycatch. I want, I want, I want performance goals. And I, I think if you know, we're asking for innovation in the absence of our ability to get swordfish out of the water in this particular case and other, other HMS uh, species as well. And yes, we need to be selective and we need to do that. But, you know, having personally been through a lot of development and have different fishing gears and, and trying to reinvent the wheel a lot of times, it's trial and error. I mean, you know, you don't get it right the first time. And I think that we need to not judge the tool so much as judge the performance. And of course, it has to go in some type of an orderly timeline that, to get those results and to be able to say whether it's successful or not. But it also, you have to understand that, you know, it's not going to be perfect to begin with. So to put a, a really hard line on what it needs to do, needs to improve over time, needs to achieve its goals, but it's, it's development. So I would hope we would focus more on what we want it to look like, what we expect, rather than which tool. Don't say, use this 9 16 wrench and go out and prosper. We're not going to let you use anything else. I don't, I, I think that's the wrong approach. We would, if we, if we took that approach on, on bottom nets and, you know, and, and, and judging them what they were 50 years ago compared to what they are now, and how selective they are and how light touch they are. We'd have never thought that. We still judge it on that. So, you know, let's, we're, we're venturing on building a car and, but we're worried about scaring the horses. So when they, you know, when they developed the automobile, there's a lot of outrage that you're going to scare the horses. And I think that we need to, we need to not do that. We need to, if we want to, if we want to go forward, we didn't get to the moon doing this, you know. We need to we need to allow it to allow it to go forward, understanding if it's limited, particularly in eight, um, in EFPs, that uh, and we have the right direction, the right understanding of goals, but it's an experiment, and and I I I trust that my my motto all along has been if you want. If, if you want something done, tell a fisherman he can't do it, and he'll show you how it's done. And I've seen that time and time again. So, if we want to get this successfully launched, we need to we need to go about it in a not so um, 
you know, we need to be open-minded. So, and, and encourage our industry to innovate because they do it the best. So thank you. Thanks, Bob. Vice Chair Hasmer. Thank you, Chair Pettinger. Uh, I think this is going to sound a lot familiar to what Mr. Dooley just said. Uh, some of my thoughts also, but I'm going to repeat it. I guess as I went, as I go through this and thinking about the workshop and the roadmap and what we want, I still have in my mind this idea about optimum yield and getting those fish out of the water. Um, it, I believe I've heard from NIMS. Um, the NIMS and general counsel can correct me if I'm wrong, but a national standard one trumps everything else. Um, prevent overfishing while achieving optimum yield. And I feel strongly that we need to build a system where we can take a broad look at ways to increase the harvest of HMS species, uh, create that, build that viable fishery that supports strong fishing communities. Um, some of this pathway to get there will help, but I, I take a different view that the EFP is just the mechanism we're going to use to explore how to get there. Uh, my question to Mr. Rudy about parameters they might put on, what I heard in his response is they already sense limitations to what they can do, maximum number of hooks and that. Now, I, you know, I, I know we have to avoid tearing this wide open, but there needs to be some thinking in the sense of what would an economically viable fishery look like before we put on bycatch constraints and other things. I guess out of a workshop, I wouldn't want uh, somebody to come and tell me what acceptable levels of bycatch are. I want would want to look at opportunities for creating a viable fishery and bycatch levels associated with that and let this council determine uh, what's an acceptable level to create an economically viable fishery for the swordfish species. So, um, you know, parts of that are in there. Um, I'm just, I'm worried that focusing solely on streamlining the EFP process um, is going to give us what we really need. The overarching piece is uh, economically viable fisheries achieving optimum yield and sustainable fisheries. So what's going to get us there? So as we go through that, that's what I'm looking at. I've I've spent time over the last week or two looking at our COP20 and the protocols for uh, EFPs in the HMS fisheries. I mean, I can point out a couple of things pretty quickly to simplify that, but I don't know if it takes a two-day workshop just to focus on that, but there may be a way in the workshop and looking at the construct of the EFPs and what we're trying to get out of that that would help us. So um, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Okay. John Ugris. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And thanks, Pete, for those words. I actually um, agree with you quite a bit. I, I do think that the goals that the team has provided get exactly to what you're asking and focus quite specifically on those national standards and desires to have a sustainable fishery that meets economic performance values. Um, I said, and uh, I have some changes to their goals that are modest, but um, I definitely hope that whatever metrics for review we come up with through the workshop or further discussions do not constrain gear configuration. I, I haven't suggested that. I don't think I've heard others suggest that. Uh, what I've heard rather is the, the opposite, that we're 
hoping to get as much gear innovation as possible, but have ways to measure performance that we can look back once they're done and say, did this perform? And that's economically, that's yield, and that's bycatch, and that's other things. So I'm hoping that's what happens. Okay. Corey Niles. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I'll just speak briefly, and I'm looking forward to seeing John's um, possible revisions. And I think Bob said this a couple of times where he thinks, you know, the, the most effective way to achieve some of the things is to tell a, a fisherman that they can't do it. So I'm wondering if we just need a motion that says to have this workshop or get a facilitator just to tell people they can't achieve these goals. But I, I, <laughs> I, I agree with you, Bob. But um, Pete, I guess I just, we've been doing this a long time and I think everyone shares this goal of um, increasing the domestic shortfish harvest. But I, I think there's just realities out there that, for example, you said nothing trumps national standard one, but um, the ESA trumps national standard one. Congress um, trumps national standard one. State legislatures can trump national standard one. So we, we exist in a, you know, in a society where the people have other goals and are gonna work towards them, whether we agree with them or not. And that, that's been the challenge all along with this. So um, yeah, we're very supportive of, of this. Um, I know the council went all the way to final action, I don't know, over 10 years ago, trying to create a, um, a, a shallow set long line fishery, which, you know, participation in that was pretty, um, wasn't clear exactly who was gonna participate. Uh, so that it's been a long, struggle. I just don't think it's, if it was an easy thing, it would have happened. Deep set buoy gear didn't turn out to be, um, yet hasn't turned out to be as successful as hoped. We'll see. But yeah, I, I think everyone's on that same page. It's just, um, it, it hasn't been easy. And, and for factors beyond this council's control in many regards. And I think we heard about this EIS that NIMS is doing, draft EIS for uh for efps and, and i think part of it is because of those all those those complicated factors that are that are involved here but again really very supportive of this very, and i meant to say thanks again to the hms management team for um uh, distilling all their thoughts into a presentation that was easy to follow um but yeah again i'll that i'll keep it there and look forward to to john moving the discussion on thanks Corey. and no hands so oh. Sure, Kiefer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, sort of new to this, and I do recognize this topic has been briefed multiple times with the council, seeking recommendations. What I'm going to speak to, and while I appreciate um, a proposed effort to kind of combine the location of the workshop with a council meeting, um, to, for because many of the participants would probably already be coming to the council meeting and that reduces cost and how many extra trips you need to make. Given the extensive interest that the team working on the workshop has expressed regarding outreach and so forth, I see a, pro, a, a, a semi proposal or suggestion to align with the June council meeting. <laughs> and it just strikes me that that would be a huge, huge lift uh, relative to outreach. I don't believe they have a facilitator yet. Um, so I like the idea. I'm just throwing out there that certainly when I see that timeline and the fact that there's still some work in progress, uh, that that seems like a big lift. Executive Director Burton. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, since November, uh, we have been working on um, working on this workshop, and uh, we've gone ahead and secured space at the June meeting hotel. So that's been squared away. Uh, I've been in touch with three people who I think would make excellent facilitator. Uh, candidates. None of them have committed. I haven't offered yet, but um, I feel like we can execute. Uh, if I, I, I would let you know if I felt like we can't. Um, but a lot of this also hinges on getting clarity here today. So the more clarity we can get, the better. And then we can uh, begin 
building our way forward in earnest. Um, you also raised a question of just scale of the workshop. And uh, if we are aiming very high for a lot of participants, that does make me nervous. I, I don't think that's what we're doing. Yeah. Um, but if we are, I would appreciate that clarity. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mark. John Lewis. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I've kind of struggled with how best to lay out revisions to text in goals. And the best thing I could do was come up with a motion that everybody could see um, that I could speak to and we can discuss rather than me trying to describe them. Uh, I wish I had had the foresight to put this into a report, um, though admittedly, I was talking to a lot of people at this meeting um, and honestly don't think I could have done the right job in a report. Um, so if people are ready, I do have a motion. I, I think we're ready. All right, there it is. <laughs> I move the council adopt the following goals for the HMS roadmap as edited from agenda item I3A HMS T report one, A, support innovation and development of multi-species HMS, HMS fishing methods to increase the domestic supply and meet the demand for swordfish and other marketable species. Support and test fishing practices that have potential to be economically viable while minimizing unmarketable, prohibited, and protected species bycatch. Support the economic viability of West Coast, excuse me, West Coast commercial fisheries for swordfish and associated marketable species through a diverse range of HMS fishing methods. Promote climate ready fisheries and fisheries resilience by developing flexibility and management and other tools to account for changes in HMS distributions, ecosystem structure and function, and the communities depending on HMS fisheries. Engage fishery participants to preserve knowledge and help bolster resilience in future fisheries and support recreational HMS fishing opportunities. Okay, the language on that screen accurate? It is, and you will note that I did not read struck out words. I was trying to give the actual meanings. Yep, appreciate that. Seconded by Corey Writings. Thank you, Corey. Please speak to your motion, John. Thanks. Um, as we heard from Mr. Wolf and was reiterated in discussion of the MT report, swordfish populations may be as much as 2.5 times greater than MSY and that we're fishing at a level about 45% um, to achieve MSY. And the council has long agreed to a need to increase domestic production of swordfish as well as other species that are coming primarily from imports or which were previously taken in larger numbers in other fisheries in the state. Uh, and, and the West Coast. I believe the team has done an excellent job of distilling a variety of interests into a set of goals that can help guide this fishery through the roadmap. And in my opinion, I, um, in, in my motion, excuse me, I've also recognized some of the other input received and some changes I feel are needed to both focus and clarify the goals. So the rationale for the changes you see, and if we scroll up to A, um, I don't think West Coast based vessels is appropriate in this goal. Um, the goal is develop, to develop methods. And if we focus on domestic supply for a Pacific Fishery Management Council FMP, then we should achieve that. Also, there are vessels based on the West Coast that do not participate in fisheries permitted through the council's FMP. Um, I, I agree with the term West Coast fisheries in goal C, but not vessels here. I added uh, increasing supply in addition to meeting the demand. Um, the two things I think go hand in hand and we're trying to do them both. In B, uh, just the phrase while also um, is unnecessary, while also implies a contrasting viewpoint and while means to do things at the same time, which I think is the goal here. In goal C, um, HMS is redundant to swordfish and other species and I focused on commercial which I think is, is what this goal is geared towards. Um, I added associated um, as the intent, as I understand it, is to account for things like OPA that are not technically highly migratory species um, in our plan, uh, but are caught in conjunction with HMS species. I'll note that goal C is broad enough to encompass a range of gear types that would include both single species and multi-species gears. In goal D, 
uh, developing flexibility, I feel, is more active than promoting. Um, I think the intent is to find new ways to make things flexible. I also see the potential for other methods and did not want to constrain the goal to only management flexibility. I found the term ecosystems didn't have necessary conduct context. So um, based on some public comment, I, I feel the addition of structure and function makes sense. In goal E, the term traditional may have other un unintended connotations as people have been fishing highly migratory species off our coast for centuries. <clears throat> I don't think it's necessary here as we want to include all voices, including past, present, and future fishery participants. And finally, I added goal F as suggested in public comment. I did, however, change the suggestion from preserve to support um, from the public comment. And this was both for consistency with the other goals and to avoid an incorrect interpretation that we could not reduce recreational catch in the future if needed. Uh, preserving something in my mind means keeping it static for a long time. Um, so I, I think my, my given change uh, from HMS to commercial in C above makes this a necessary goal so that we have a goal specific to recreational. I appreciated that in the public comment. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Very good. Uh, questions for the motion maker? Sharon Kiefer, and then Pete, and then, so Sharon? I'm supportive of this. I just point out that, um, the use of the word climate ready, I noticed you use that. I, I went back to how they were defining it and it was really, it was incorporating available and climate and ecosystem environmental data, which to me means it's a, it's a climate informed fishery. I have a problem, I, I have challenge, a challenge in my brain when somebody says it's climate ready, what exactly that means. Um, so that's just something for us maybe to kind of chew on a little bit, but to me, it's a it, they're recommending climate informed fisheries. And I do appreciate you added the recreational because uh, that went through my head as well. John? Yeah, thanks. And I, I didn't change climate ready from the team's version. Um, I understand your concern actually, and that's probably another good term to define in a workshop. Uh, there are somewhat common use definitions of that, but I think they vary. Um, so I appreciate that the comment. Yeah. Okay. Um, Vice Chair Hasmer. Uh, thank you, Chair Penninger. Yeah, not, when we get to discussion, I might have something on climate ready. But uh, my question is on goal C. Sorry, goal B. Um, the supporting test fishing while minimizing unmarketable prohibited and protected species. I'm just wondering if you thought about that being more in line with national standard nine, which uh, says to the extent practi practicable minimizing um, impacts to those species. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair and Mr. Vice Chair. Um, it, I think it's a great comment. Again, I'm, I'm going off of the, the team's recommendations, and I think the advisory subpanel um, supported these as, as the team had them written. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be opposed to, you know, minimize to the extent practical. Um, but uh, it's just, yeah, I wasn't adding that in. Pete? Thank you, I'd like, I'd like to offer an amendment to the motion. Okay. Under goal B, strike, now I can't see it. <laughs> uh, strike the piece that says after um, the word while, minimizing marketable, in fact, strike the word while also. So I'm going to strike that. And then after economically viable, I know this is difficult to work through these here. 
we're going to add the text consistent with National Standard 9 guidelines. Okay. okay, thank you. And as you're doing that, I'm going to add a word, but I think we're getting there. Okay. Yeah, you need to strike the word while. And I think I need one more word. Try a and there. And consistent. Well, I think it's okay. I'm going to say you got it. Okay. <clears throat> so the top yellow is struck and the bottom yellow is added. <clears throat> okay. You know, and it, it, it's not clear there. I don't know if you can put the uh, upper yellow piece and strike out. <clears throat> strike out, strike through, whatever it's called. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chair, is that the language on the screen is accurate and complete. Okay, I'm looking for a second. Second by Krista Stinson. Thank you, Krista. Please speak to your uh, uh, amendment. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I've read National Standard 9 quite a bit. That lays it out. That's the place where bycatch is addressed. Um, the process of evaluating that and looking at it is, is uh, goes through everything we do and NIMS reviews that. And just to keep it simple, I think that's better that those fisheries are, are just created consistent with the guidelines for bycatch. Okay, very good. Uh, question for the motion maker or discussion about it? John Ugertz. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I will not be supporting this amendment. Uh, the team actually developed this after discussions by the council. This is not about um, National Standard 9. I, I, I don't mind making it consistent uh, with National Standard 9, but to replace it with that, I believe, changes the intent of the goal. This is something we have struggled with in our swordfish fisheries. Uh, the issues of bycatch led to legislated changes to remove drift gillnet off our coast. Um, and I feel that the discussions to date have been about minimizing this type of bycatch. Um, and that was specifically intended by the team's goal that the advisory sub panel agreed to. Thank you, John. What else? Phil Anderson? I just, I, I don't intend to support the amendment either for the, primarily the same reasons as Mr. Uger, it's just stated. I think the, um, the the RAP spent a lot of time thinking about this. I think minimizing unmarketable and prohibited and protected species bycatch has been uh, one of the cornerstones that uh, we have used over time in in this uh, in looking at years for this fishery, and I uh, so I won't be supporting it. Thank you, Phil. Anyone else? Corey Niles? Yeah, um, thanks. Just uh, agreeing with the spirit that Pete's after here, but, um, you know, and, and I try to, I, thinking about the definitions discussion that the AP and the team had, and I, I don't think you're going to ever get rid of um, 
matters of people interpreting words differently. And if we did, you would probably have a tenth of the number of lawyers you have now out there in the world. But I think even Pete, you're, if you want to get super precise here, like Nationalist Internet 9 doesn't doesn't apply um, to the to Endangered Species Act species. So there's all kinds of pitfalls that we could be here all night, probably trying to break the record of Chris just said, you know, on daylight savings time change, but um, no, really appreciate the spirit, but I think I will also vote no just just because of those considerations, but agreeing that no matter what the goals are here, most of it will have to apply with the Magnuson-Stevens Act and, and other consistent laws. So that's the lens I'm, I'm, I would take towards these goals. Okay, thanks, Corey. Anybody else? Ryan Wolf. Thank you. Um, appreciate that last comment by Corey. And I understand the intent as well. Um, just to say, I, I also understand the intent of the original text. And, and from NIMS perspective, we can support either. Obviously, I won't be voting no against national standard guidelines. So thanks. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Anybody else? Not all call for the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 Okay. Uh, abstentions. I think it failed. <laughs> yeah. Two yes votes. <coughs> Who are the yes votes? Three. One, two, three, three. Okay, all right. Okay, we're back to the original one and get rid of all that ink off there so we can. <laughs> okay, we're back to the original motion and further discussion or, oh, Ryan Wolf. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for understanding <laughs> my last vote. If you scroll up, I do want to see the full motion for a sec. No, sorry, the other way so I can see A. Thank you. Yep, a little bit further down. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I, I did want to intervene and I'm going to have more uh, comments because I just wanted to note here, I, I do think we're, we're talking about the goals for the roadmap here. Um, and I think this will be relevant to our next discussion as it gets to the workshop, but but I can support all these. I, I appreciate the, the suggested additions. Um, uh, especially the addition of the in increased domestic supply. I think that's going to be very relevant to some of our next discussion. I also appreciate the rationale from John regarding, you know, separating out the commercial and the recreational side. I think that I, I think you could have read it the other way is including both, but I think it's worth given the interest on both sides, calling that out separately. Um, I guess since then we're in discussion now, I probably could have asked this as a clarifying question, but maybe I'll just say it as a comment. Um, Given my earlier remarks under international, you know, I do think when we're talking about the roadmap itself, while I know swordfish is in, is one of those uh, top species to discuss, um, it's clear from our discussions also, not just on the commercial, but on the recreational side, have an interest in tuna as well. Um, and so I imagine that's incorporated as an other or associated species here when you're talking about uh, increasing domestic supply. Um, so with all those points, I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you. Okay. Executive Director uh, Burton. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Mr. Ugaritz, for the motion. There's a lot of good material in here. Um, since we will be uh, eagerly trying to execute on this after this meeting, I, I have a couple of clarifying questions just in the, just in the sense of uh, essentially what does this look like? So if we were to have a... Uh, a roadmap, um, and maybe I'm about to answer my own question, but if we were to have a roadmap that it, that does all of this, what does that look like to you? And and maybe we're not ready to answer that, but that's what's on my mind. John? Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Executive Director Burden. Um, I think a roadmap stems from the old monitoring and management plan, which had some goals and actions. Um, I see a roadmap as having goals and actions. Um, I see it as having um, associated activities 
all of which are guiding the council to achieve the goals. Um, so, you know, I would see it as having a, a similar look and feel to the old swordfish monitoring and management plan with a lot of different content. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Ugaretz. And, and uh, I, I also got my wires a little bit crossed here when asking my question. I'm thinking ahead to the workshop. So I'll ask the same question when we start thinking about what the workshop should look like. What, is the, what does success look like at the end of the day? That'll really help me and others to execute on that. So just put that marker down. Okay. All right. Sharon Keever. And just for my edification, I heard you mention a monitoring report. I, I'm wondering where's the aspect of evaluation, and I'm assuming that comes later with development of some actual proposals. You're kind of getting back to uh, Bob's performance um, goals. To me, that's more granular than what we're trying to achieve here, but did not know if there's a already you since you mentioned a monitoring plan already something that's kind of developed to address those issues john thanks and through the chair um so the history of this is that we had what was known as the swordfish management and monitoring plan um that plan was developed in a time where the the significant focus was on reducing bycatch and increasing monitoring in the drift gill net fishery and consider consideration of establishing a, a long line fishery off the US West Coast. Um, gosh, I don't know how many years ago now, the team came back with some proposed edits to that based on recent times. My feeling at the time was I was ready to round file that plan and be done. Um, however, NIMPS actually brought up a very good point that they were had been using that plan as a guidance document when looking at approving uh, EFPs. And that led to the series of discussions that got us to where we are today to create this, what is now known as a roadmap um, that will help guide that. And, and it, it does lean back towards the second part of your question regarding performance and evaluation. And I think a large part of the workshop is, as I see it, and as I mentioned in my floor comments, would focus on looking at those metrics. Uh, I, sorry, I shouldn't say metrics. Looking at those um, considerations that the council would take when looking at EFPs. OK. Further discussion? Have we voted this yet? Okay. It's been a long day. <laughs> All right. <laughs> With that, uh, I'm going to call for the question. How's that sound? All right. All, the... All those in favor, say if I must say aye. 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 Opposed, no. <laughs> Abstentions. Uh, motion passes unanimously, thankfully. <laughs> okay. My sure has some. Thank you. Just a quick comment before that leaves the screen. Um, it, it's in support of what's there on the climate ready fisheries. I'm glad the team came up with the statement and the goal. Uh, when I read it last week, I spent a lot of time thinking about it a lot. And um, and not a disgrace to them. Uh, I'm glad it was there, but I came to the realization that's not needed there. That's a, a much higher, loftier thing that, that goes through everything we discuss here, every topic we come to worth thinking about climate-ready fisheries. And we have these IRA funds that, if they come, are focused on climate-ready fisheries and adaptation. So as I read it, I thought if you take out HMS, uh, there's two occurrences of it in there and just put in fisheries or something like that. That covers 
all of our FMEPs, all of the things we do. And I thought it was interesting when we had the presentation from the International Pacific Halibut Commission yesterday, they, um, the, the Halibut Commission passed, a, adopted a climate change paragraph that they use as kind of a banner in their things. Uh, it was in the slide that was presented, but um, I can't find that anywhere now, so I don't know exactly what it was. But I did go through our council website and, and look through where would we put something that identifies how we respond to climate change and those types of things. So I'm just throwing it out there as a marker that somewhere down the road as we go through there, um, you know, it's, it shouldn't be necessary to put it in as a goal in this roadmap. It, it should be broader over our council activities and apply to everything. So I just wanted to highlight that for people's thinking and sorry that took us off the uh, workshop topics. John. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. And, and thanks again, Pete, for, for your thoughts. Um, I don't disagree with that. Uh, I, it, there is something, and I think it kind of pushes us towards the next step of this, which is what do we do with the workshop? Um, and that's, the council has spent the last, I guess, five days talking primarily about constraints on fisheries due to stocks that are at extremely low abundance and they are constraining our ability to even have fisheries. The difference here is we have a fishery that is at very high abundance and underutilized and we're doing everything we can to come up with new ways to get out there and fish it. Um, and, and so again, I don't disagree with you. I think it's in here for a reason. I think there's concerns about what might change in this fishery and we want to be ready for it. Okay. Anybody else? Krista. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a motion about a workshop. Um, I think it may behoove us if we take a few minute break just to make sure our ducks are in order if that's acceptable for everybody but uh, happy to launch it now but i i think we may be happier with the results if we give everyone a couple minutes okay to break you want to break two minutes two minutes okay all right back here in two minutes
Okay, let's let's get our seats. All right, back in session on I-3. And um, Krista, I believe you have a motion. That is correct. Uh -huh. Thank you for making it a little bigger. All right, I move the council host an HMS workshop June 6th and 7th at the same location as the June 8th through 13th council meeting in San Diego with the workshop goal of developing a streamlined and flexible, in parentheses, council EFP strategy to support innovative, innovation, sorry. Uh, I need a little bigger here, guys. Uh, <laughs> in fishing practices for HMS fisheries. Sorry, the screen is a little tilted as well, which isn't helping. With the following guidance. In developing this program, consider the goals of the roadmap and the action items and definitions proposed by the HMS MT. Not consider outstanding swordfish management and monitoring plan action items uh, A3 and E1 through 3 for the roadmap and remove HMS MT action items 1A through C found in agenda item. I3A HMS MT Report 1 from the HMS Roadmap Draft List of Action Items. Use the HMS MT Definitions 1 through 12 as drafted in Agenda Item I3A Supplemental HMS MT Report 2, March 2024, and Definitions 13 and 14 from Agenda Item I3A Supplemental HMSAS Report 1, March 2024, to facilitate discussion at the Roadmap Workshop. Include in the notification of workshop, the Council is encouraging all interested stakeholders to participate. Okay. Language on the screen accurate, Chris? It is. Okay, look for a second. Second by Corey Writings. Thank you, Corey. Please speak to your motion. Thank you. The need for future planning around fisheries opportunities and EFPs in general continues to be real. We've heard repeatedly this week across FMPs that our coastal communities are struggling. My heart goes out to everyone. HMS currently is in a similar situation, and I see the HMS roadmap as a critical step in helping move all of us forward on a path to provide more sustainable fishing opportunity. I looked this morning at the current PACFIN numbers regarding swordfish price as a metric to support the urgency of why the council should spend time and resources doing this work. Workshops, after all, aren't free, even with IRA funding. The current price of swordfish is $6.96 per pound. And I realized that that's a market price. It, it could fluctuate. It could go to $3 or some other number, but we'll take it for what it is today. And using the approximately 5,000 current established, or excuse me, estimate of a volume for swordfish we could take in terms of harvesting without overfishing or harming the biomass. Today's current market value of swordfish, if caught commercially, is just over $76.7 .7 million. That's almost as large as the $80.7 million in landings for 2023 of the West Coast trawl fisheries, including Pacific whiting. Even if we work towards targeting half that volume for commercial fisheries, we'd still have over 30 times the dollar value of just point just over 1.2 million in swordfish landings for 2023. I chose half that number, not because I think we can only achieve half the opportunity, but to leave room for recreational and charter opportunities that may become available through the EFP process that could increase the value significantly, not just 
in terms of dollars, but also in terms of communities up and down our coasts. These numbers also don't include other market species that have historically been caught in HMS fisheries and that should be considered within the scope of the workshop, which will all add further value. I agree with the recommendation from our advisory bodies to place the workshop in San Diego at the June meeting, both for the cost saving benefits, but also because the location is close for many of the people who have historically caught swordfish and other HMS species. Clearly defined terms provide shared common language for diverse stakeholders to engage in. And I think we heard that from our management team. <clears throat> in the spirit of defining terms, I chose to put the word council in parentheses in this motion because my intent is not to infringe on the, on the NIMS EFB process outside of the council but just to keep awareness there that, that that is what we are talking about. I also think that all interested stakeholders, including more than commercial folks, commercial and NGO folks should be involved. Um, this workshop should be viewed as an opportunity for rec fishermen to also provide input on EFPs and to help us all envision what we want HMS fisheries to look like. And I, I just want to think for a minute on why it's important. And I, I mentioned this earlier on EFPs. Um, I, I think in not addressing it, we're creating risk <coughs> around unnecessary and lengthy, lengthy dis delays in issuing our EFPs. I think it reduces the number of participants we're likely to have. And I think it puts a lot of extra burden on council members um, you know, the, there are a lot of successes with buoy gear, but that did come at a cost for council members. I mean, we were looking at 18 EFPs at a time, um, and they are all different. Um, there are a lot of similarities, but it still is a tremendous amount of workload. So we're finding that is important. That being said, um, the decision to not include Items like DGN or other gear types in this motion, it wasn't easy. Um, but I think we need to think about how we're going to approach this process as a whole. And sometimes when we start thinking about hooks or longline or DGN transitions or buoy gear, we, we get fixated on a concept or an idea as opposed to that bigger question about how are we going to deliver for fishermen and for the public that does want uh, a more sustainable option when it comes to swordfish and other HMS species. And I think that I will stop there in terms of my rationale um, but I will say in conclusion that should this motion pass, I'm looking forward to working with everyone uh, who's interested in um, developing an HMS roadmap beginning in June. Okay. Thank you, Krista. Uh, questions to the motion maker? Justin Ainsworth. Thank you, Chair Pettinger. And thank you, Ms. Svensson, for the motion. Um, could we scroll so I can see the upper part? Thank you. Um, just in the third paragraph, in developing this program, consider the goals of the roadmap. Can you describe what developing this program is referring to? Correct. So that, at least initially, would be specific to the workshop. Um, if the workshop is successful and we have action items that come out of it, that would further turn into what I am calling a program here. Um, but it certainly, if, if we say, wow, that was a worthwhile exercise and we are stopping now, I'm not going to demand that we do more. Um, but that is the reason why I chose program rather than just say, hey, in developing this workshop, I also decided, um, and this was the reason I called for the pause, this was not a, originally in my motion, 
Um, I, I did want to include this component because I think that this moves us away from this conversation around, is this only EFPs um, or are we really looking at those wider goals um, and, and how we achieve moving towards a why? Thank you, Justin. Anyone else? Discussion on the motion? John Ugritz. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Krista, for the motion. Um, I think it's well thought and timely. Um, I appreciate, in particular, the response you just gave regarding what a program is, because I, I understand that. Um, the workshop is a way to get to something broader. Um, and I like that there's latitude in here to go beyond just EFPs in the workshop. I'm, I'm hoping that through the development of a workshop agenda and the inclusion of a facilitator that, um, you know, a, a good scope of what can be done is developed. And if there are additional tasks after the workshop, then we figure out when, when we tackle those. Thank you, John. Right. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Christopher, for the motion, and I echo John's points there. I, I appreciate the way that you explained that. Um, that's my understanding, too, and I appreciate the addition of this uh, first sentence there in the guidance, right, because uh, it's one thing to develop a streamlined and flexible EFP strategy, but you cannot do that in a vacuum without talking about some of these broader concepts and issues or even just getting some of the information that is highlighted that could facilitate some of those um how you would develop a strategy that are laid out in the action items and even to some extent the definition. So I appreciate that um, because, and I didn't get to weigh in as much earlier, but tying back to the goals uh, that we just adopted, right? I mean, to have a streamlined and flexible EFP strategy uh, and I echo some of the discussion we had earlier in this agenda item, mean, you, you really have to talk about what is an economically viable fishery. You have to talk about what you are looking for and the data that you'll get back from those EFPs. You have to address um, the 80 to 85% of, of foreign imports that are coming in. What are the measures that yet they're using and how does that impact the conservation of our living marine resources? And you have to talk about the cost to develop uh, for a fisherman to develop these innovative gears, not knowing if they're gonna be able to be used to scale up. I mean, those are all important questions. Those are all very relevant to the goals and they're in the action items. And so I really appreciate the incorporation of this uh, because I think it's crucial to having a successful workshop. So thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Anyone else? Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I really appreciate the motion, Krista. It's, uh, it's, I think it's very well, well, well written. I, I like the word flexible in the third line there, but when it's limited to EFP, I hope there's flexibility. That I'm, what I, what I heard from the NIMS report too, in the the third line, actually this the, um, the second sentence, fourth line, the. It talks about EFPs as proposed action covers a range of fishing practices that would otherwise be prohibited by existing regulations and goes on from there. So I can't, I don't know everything. Obviously, I don't think we all, any of us do, but there may be um, methods proposed that don't require an EFP, maybe require a research project. So we limit ourselves to an EFP that are, or, you know, and I'm hoping this, your motion has the flexibility in it, and I believe it does. I just wanted to make sure that uh, I put that comment in there so that we can go back to it at the time when we ever run into a, a roadblock on something because not everything requires an EFP. It's a, it, but research project, absolutely. So thank you. Thank you, Bob. Corey Writings. Thank you, Chair Pettinger. Um, this is actually kind of a, a parliamentary question for the maker or for a parliamentarian. Um, I'm noticing it seems to be a motion, but it also has with the following guidance in it. And I have to admit that I'm ignorant about sort of what the difference is in terms of written guidance that's part of a motion versus typically how this council talks about guidance, which is 
usually general head nodding agreement or something verbal. So I'm just looking for some clarification in terms of um, if there was something in the guidance part, would I need to offer an amendment or could I just talk to it? Chris? Uh, so I do not have an answer off the top of my head on the parliamentarian component. Um, I, I certainly could probably look that up in Robert's rules and did not do homework on that. Uh, I did choose to put guidance in on this rather than just make a motion and then speak to guidance afterwards. For the same reason um, that actually I was going to speak to uh, with response to the, the previous speaker, Mr. Dooley. Um, when I thought about how to structure this topic, uh, I wanted to leave as much flexibility as I possibly could. Um, and at the same time, have some side rails. Uh, my concern with this whole conversation is there's a tremendous amount of opportunity here. Um, and it is a little bit like seeing one of those money booths with the cash machine in it. And everybody is really excited when they get in there and they kind of go crazy. Um, and obviously, I'm cracking myself up here. Uh, and I just want to make sure that when we go through this process, we don't end up walking out of this with a few dollars when we could be uh, creating a lot more opportunity than that. And um, they're also, so, so that was the rationale in terms of choosing EFPs um, and, and really structuring flexibility around that. Um, and then speaking to the guidance piece, um, continuing to have a few pieces on there um, that are, are really written in is more of a, let's make sure we're very clear on what guidance that we are providing um, so that we don't take up some pieces of guidance um, and, and we have a whole bunch of other guidance that, that may be lost in the fold. I think all of these have been vetted um, through conversations with a number of people. If this is not the full list, then by all means, I welcome a friendly amendment. Um, but I um, wanted to make sure that these components were encompassed and incorporated um, and not left somehow accidentally off the table. Gord? Thanks for that, Ms. Fenson. Um, I agree with everything you just said. I'm not sure it answered my question, though. Um, does perhaps Mr. Oliver? Chris? Well, I'm, I'm not certain it's a parliamentary question. I, the, the language below the, uh, the word guidance is, is fairly specific. Uh, and I think it's meant to frame the parameters of the workshop. So you may have used a different word with the following, um, prescriptions or the following um, instructions or the following parameters. So I, the, the effect may be the same, I guess. If, if, if everyone understands that and agrees with the three phrases that are below the, uh, the four phrases that are below the word guidance, I'm not sure, I'm not sure it matters, but we could have used a more Executive Director, specific uh, word. Bird. I yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I would say um, I, I agree with Mr. Oliver. I'm not sure if it's a parliamentary issue, but I would say this is all part of the motion, and what you're essentially doing is directing me to go execute on a workshop. I would like this to be as clear as possible, and this is all part of a motion. So uh, if you want to change it, I would suggest making an amendment rather than new guidance. like to make an motion to amend okay uh after the word at the top there that i can't see anymore sorry <laughs> after the word fisheries before the period use okay um <clears throat> Uh, 
So fisheries using the following council direction, colon. And then strike uh, with the following guidance. Thank you, and everything else is the same. Okay, looks good to you. It does. Okay, second by Bob Dooley. Thank you. Please speak to it as appropriate. Uh, given that the question was raised and my experience with council guidance being misinterpreted when it is not clear, I feel that the motion should be very clear that this is direction that is being provided for how to conduct this workshop. Okay. All right, discussion? <laughs> okay, I will call for the uh, question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 There's no extensions. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Corey Writing. Uh, I would like to offer an amendment. Okay. One second. I move to add the definition of the following definition of climate ready fishery. <clears throat> uh, Tower of Power, you're have to gonna indulge me. Can you go back up to the rest of the motion? After the second to last, last paragraph. Yeah, right there. After the word workshop. between workshop and the period, say, as amended by this new definition. I think we want to put a period after it and give separation maybe so you can people, it all runs together. Yeah, it's a little bit clunky and I apologize. It's, I'm sorry, it's not great doing it at two parts on the page there. And then, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. Okay. If you're good, let me know. Okay. All right. You want to read that into? Yeah. Thank you. I move to add the definition of climate ready fishery colon a fishery that incorporates available climate and ecosystem environmental data to support management decisions and the resilience of communities and ecosystems that depend on it. This definition is to be added after quote, use the HMSMT definitions one through 12 as drafted in agenda item 
I3A Supplemental HMSMT Report 2, March 2024, and Definitions 13 and 14 from Agenda Item I3A Supplemental HMSAS Report 1, March 2024, to facilitate discussion at the Roadmap Workshop as amended by this new definition. Okay, language accurate? Yes. Looking for a second. Second by Mark Grolick. Thank you, Mark. Okay, please speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, given that there is a tight tie with what we're doing here around the workshop um, and development of this roadmap with the IRA funding um, and the comment that Ms. Kiefer made earlier on the floor um, regarding the proposed definition for climate ready fisheries, um, she pointed out it was really more climate informed fisheries and um, I would agree with that interpretation. Thus, in the spirit of encouraging the use of this common vocabulary for the workshop, even if it's just used to facilitate discussion at the workshop, um, I wanted to offer a slightly different wording for that concept. And you'll see I underlined it here because that's the part that's different. Um, and the I think that this captures that the management is climate informed and that the resilience we want to achieve isn't just community resilience, but the larger ecosystem and our fisheries and the communities that are, are dependent on that ecosystem and part of it. So that was my intention with this was just to add a little bit of clarity uh, around that. Um, hope that that captures it. Okay, uh, questions for the motion maker? Sharon Kiefer. I guess when I read that and we're talking about a fishery incorporates available climate and ecosystem environmental data, got that. And the resilient, but it's the resilience of communities and ecosystems. I'm not quite sure. Are we suggesting that the fishery contributes to the resilience of the ecosystem and when I'm thinking about the ecosystem I'm thinking about the ocean or I'm a little I'm, I'm just not really clear how I would explain that to someone so a little more clarity thank you for the question Ms. Kiefer I can definitely keep talking um <laughs> uh in my mind the way this was written I was reading it you know a fishery that incorporates available climate change and ecosystem environmental data to support management decisions and the resilience of communities that depend on it. And as we manage fisheries, which are part of ecosystems that feed into communities, I didn't want it to say just communities, you know, as the focus of what we do is really fisheries and the ecosystems surround it. So I wanted the action part of this definition to be more about then, as you pointed out, just making them climate informed, but actually having the outcome of a climate ready fishery is an ecosystem, a fishery and communities all together that are climate ready, as opposed to just communities, which stepping back is actually potentially the thing we have the least control over as we're a fishery management group. Okay. Hey, sir. Uh, John Ugritz. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Ridings, it appears from your amendment that you're suggesting adding a definition to the management team's definition list, but there is already a definition. Did you intend to modify the management team's definition? Thank you, Mr. Ugaritz. I did intend to modify the existing definition. Okay. Krista? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, normally, when it comes to fisheries, ecosystem, et cetera, I'm supportive. Uh, I will say I'm not supporting this amendment simply because the definitions initially came from our management teams and i feel that they've had time to work on all of this um, come together i'm not 
saying that when it comes down to a workshop, they may not revise and, and take up the ecosystem component. Um, but I do think that it is appropriate if we're going to pick up their definitions that we stick with the definitions that they provided. But I do appreciate the amendment and I am appreciative of the thought that has gone into it and our willingness to discuss it on the floor today. Uh, Bush Smith and then John Ritz. Yeah. Well, I'm just a little confused here. Um, and maybe it's the general practice of this council, but cities and ports and other forms of government, usually the executive director has a list of the way he or she thinks the workshop is going to be laid out and then we can vote or not on it, but this is kind of a backwards foreign to me. And it's really turning into a exercise of wordsmithing and definitions and, and uh, I, I, uh, I'm for the, I'm for the, the, you know, this is clearly our executive director has in his mind how this wants to go and what should be in there. And it seems like to me that he could bring it back a <laughs> definition. It's probably too far down the road, but I, I just, to me, this is a little bit backwards. And I, I think maybe in the future, um, it might be better if, you know, he had some ideas on paper the way he thought it should be run and then we can tear it down or accept it or add to it. And might, might, might make the process a little better. But anyway, I know that didn't speak to this <clears throat> thing, but I, I, I'm sorry, but this is, in a little long in the tooth, so thank you. Okay, Butch. Uh, John? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I will also not be supporting this amendment. Um, I, I find it odd to start wordsmithing the definitions prior to the workshop. Um, my understanding from the original motion to use the definitions to facilitate discussions at the workshop made sense to me um, that those discussions would occur. If there were edits needed to the definitions, they could be discussed in that group setting. Um, certainly not on the floor here today. Uh, if we had intended to modify the management team's list of lengthy list of definitions, I would have hoped we'd do that with floor discussion. So, um, yeah, not not liking that. Okay. All right, Corey, Niles. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I guess I guess I'm pretty um, ambivalent about this. I, I don't think I've seen this approach before by putting these definitions out there. And I, when I spoke, I I, I um, not sure how that's going to go, and it's not going to. They're almost trying to be a different way of of setting forth goals and getting everyone to agree with you on them and i don't think that's how dialogues work so i'm just not a fan of the definitions at all but you know go ahead and try it it's kind of i'll in i'll see how it goes but yeah so i i guess Corey, i would on uh, along those lines um don't think it's the way to 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 reach um you know better understanding within people who have different goals um that and to show you that I can also get wordsmithy if I don't, but it seems to me that I think you would want, it usually a fishery depends on the ecosystem, but I kind of think I'm reading this to be the other way around. And I guess that that could, that works too. But yeah, I just don't think that, I think the discussion should focus on the goals and the practical ideas of how they're achieved more than trying to keep people to use words in a um, uniform way, which is just, I just don't think it's gonna be possible. So I, I would either probably vote no or abstain from this. Thanks, Corey. Anybody else? Oh, Bob Dooley. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have similar thoughts. Agree with many of the comments here. I won't be voting for this. I, and my reason is, this is, if it's in, we're adopting what the committee said in the in the in the body, and that's okay. Or that we we've, we've got that. But when we add a definition thoughtfully as a council, we're, we're setting the definition of climate-ready fisheries for the council. And I think it's more than just doing it on the fly. 
I think we need to really thoughtfully think. I've never seen a definition that satisfies me anyhow of climate ready fisheries. And I, I've, I've heard others say the same thing. And I don't, I think it needs a little more, a little more thought if we're going to go on the record and that's going to haunt us for a long, long time, that that's our definition. So that's my, my biggest complaint about it is, is that I think we're good enough with what's there. I trust our executive director to, to handle this. And I think I'm, I'm fine with that, but I won't be voting for the motion. Thank you. Okay. Corey writings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to withdraw the amendment. Okay. I need a second. All right. Okay. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it's withdrawn. Takes us back to the modified motion, I believe, um, or the previously amended motion. So with that, um, Corey, yes. Do you have a motion? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chair Pettinger. No, I do not, actually. Um, actually, I was just going to uh, wrap that up a little bit very quickly and just note that I actually agree with a lot that was just said. Um, I just wanted to point out this was definitely not intended to create a definition for this Council of Climate Ready Fisheries, it was in the spirit of which it was provided in the motion, which was that it is to be aiding in the discussion during the workshop. Um, which, because I agree with Mr. Dooley, I don't think we're here to create definitions and that's not how this is happening. Um, why I thought to do this and mucked up my English on the screen in front of y'all is that I do think it's important and about, you know, words do matter and they were part of the motion. So Ms. Benson thought that they mattered as well. And I want to make sure that we actually have some of the flexibility and latitude that has already been talked about. And I felt like that definition was perhaps too short. So I just wanted to share some thinking for everybody, um, lest they think I'm a total bumbling idiot and just trying to incorporate some of the good thinking that's gone on this week into that. Uh, you're good, you're good. Okay, uh, Executive Director Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I'll ask the question now, I promise I was going to ask, um, which is, First, thank you for the motion. Looks looks quite good. Uh, what does it look like when we get through this? What does success look like on the back end of this workshop? Which is a great question. Um, I appreciate it. I, in my mind, we would come out with um, some clear metrics in terms of what it is that we are trying to accomplish um, when we are putting out requests for EFPs, um, when we are engaging um, in conversations around what a successful future looks like. So that would be that wider scope than just the EF EFP piece. Uh, based upon the conversation that we've just had, we may want to um, have some further discussion around what terms we want to be using. And uh, I didn't find you bumbling around here. Um, and I think it is important to have that conversation and discussion about, hey, it probably is more than just communities. So um, if we are going to continue using those terms moving forward within the roadmap, I think it would be beneficial to um, get consensus from the workshop participants and longer term get consensus from council members that those are in fact the terms that we wish to be using within H at least HMS. Um, one of the possible longer term, and this is something I'm just gonna put out there, this is my opinion, um, not necessarily other people I've spoken with. Uh, at one point we had the conversation about could this process be used for EFPs in other FMPs. It's a mouthful. Um, and uh, so if there is the ability to have this work for ground fish or some other um, FMPs that have at times also said, hey, we've got a lot going on and, and how do we streamline that process? Uh, that could be a possible outcome. But I, I do like Butch's comment of, hey, um, if, if there are ideas that uh, the executive director would like to incorporate, I, I would certainly be open to that. I don't want to tie your hands too completely. 
Um, but I did try and put some guide rails in here so that we didn't have 20,000 topics morphing into 50,000 ideas that you could not capitalize on. Uh, thank you, Director Burton. Yeah, and thank you for uh, those comments. I, I, um, I, I sort of hesitantly asked my question because it risks getting into another debate of uh, what this motion does, but uh, did want just to hear from you a little bit. And so just for everyone's benefit, um, what I would intend to do is uh, move forward quickly with identifying a facilitator. And I've always viewed the role of a facilitator as helping to scope things out. That facilitator has to do their homework and figure out what the issue is, um, how to go about executing the workshop. They have to spend some time thinking about the success. But having a couple of thoughts from you, I think is helpful in that. So. I don't want to go too far down the road of unraveling this workshop or this motion with those questions, but I think just having a couple of your thoughts on the floor is helpful. So that would be my intention uh, if this passes and just for everyone's benefit, I'm just putting that out there. Okay, uh, we probably should get it passed first, but John, before we do that. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and just bringing back an answer to a question that was asked at the last meeting about the workshop and what it would and wouldn't do. And I recall hearing that the intent of the council was that this workshop would help inform the development of a roadmap, but would not result in a roadmap itself, that that would require additional work. And I just want to reiterate that, make sure it's clear on the floor. Thank you, John. Okay. I'll see more hands. Um, let's call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those no. Abstentions. All right. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Okay. Um, anybody else? What, what discussion here? We're good. Okay. Kit. I'm going to ask how we did, but. Be gentle on us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I think you did a lot. <laughs> um, and I think we... Um, I guess I would... Uh, well, hearing from uh, my boss, the executive director, it, it, and I would agree, I think we have enough here to, you know, um, the proximate need to really get down to brass tacks on planning this workshops in terms of content and participation and so on. And I, I think we have enough to go on. I think there's some indication that there is some flexibility for the executive director and others to, you know, plan the workshop and take, take this under consideration in that process. Um, and I think that the final revised goals uh, for the broader roadmap, um, so-called roadmap, um, will help inform that effort and um, and our thinking about um, what what this workshop will do. So I th I think we it's going to be a a sprint. I think, but I think we can get something put together to conduct a workshop and early June. Okay, fantastic. Well, uh, before I close out the meeting here, and turn to Executive Director Byrne to see if he has any announcements or thoughts for tomorrow. Oh uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good work, everyone. Sorry to keep you a bit late again. Um, a lot of meaty issues here at this meeting. A um, couple thoughts, a uh, couple remarks. One is uh, we do have some supplemental uh, revised year to glance summaries and the quick reference agenda ahead of tomorrow. So. Uh, Patricia has some printouts in the back if you have not already received them. Otherwise, they're online on our briefing book. Uh, take a few moments to look those over in anticipation of our uh, workload planning item tomorrow. Um, let's see. I have been in touch with our salmon people. We're going to aim to take up salmon at 9. I know people are going to start sprinting for the airport pretty soon, but I expect salmon uh, at about 9. So we're going to try to uh, pick up um, some of the easier things first thing in the morning, and then you go right to salmon after that. So hopefully tomorrow doesn't go too long, but uh, that's the current plan. 
Uh, so I believe that's it, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Barry. Um, I do have one announcement that Bob Dooley did uh, self-report on a cell phone violation today. So, uh, so really, well, we, there's an honor system. Oh, there's two. So, so we have donuts for the first two days of the uh, April April Council meeting. So let's uh, we start off with the in the, the day at a, a bright spot. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, um, have a good evening, and we'll see you tomorrow, bright and early, 8 o'clock.